what's up everybody um how are you i'm just fine um you know i'm i'm chilling i'm over here living it up i hope there's not a whole lot of background noise um got a lot going on this morning uh as far as dogs and uh fans and things making noise Oh, there, you can kind of see Winston right there. Um, and you can almost see Charlie's head. Just right there. If, I'm, if I change this, I'm no longer on TV. You can see, I have a puppy couch here in my office. I'm going to go back on TV. I have a puppy couch here in my office. And, uh, yeah, I'm probably going to move the camera. So you can either not see the dog at all. Or you can see all of the dogs um, because the like the halfway thing is it is distracting. Um, and uh, and yeah, I don't know. Maybe some people would like little included nuggets of good, cute puppiness. Um, and maybe it would annoy some people. I don't know. I haven't decided. Just realized yesterday, actually, that it was a uh, it was a problem, a potential problem. Where you can see part of my dogs, but not all of them. And Winston is being crazy right now. The big one is Winston, one you can see. And the little one is Charlie. And their real names are Winston Leonard Spencer, Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill. That's Winston Churchill's name. Look it up. Uh, I wonder if Spencer Leonard's parents did that intentionally. Um, they probably did. And then the little one is Charlize Theron. Uh, I couldn't find Charlize Theron's middle name. I looked it up. Um, she either doesn't have one or, she, you know, for whatever reason, she has managed to keep that personal information off of the internet. And I commend her for that if that is the case. But either way, those are my dog's names, Winston and Charlie. Um, Anyway, so yeah, uh, what's up, dude? It's, uh, it's Thursday, September 19th, I believe, day after the uh, Epic Marathon stream at Theory Underground uh, that took place on September 18th. That was yesterday, and it was fucking cool. It was great. It was awesome. I love doing the Epic Marathon streams. They're great. They're innovative. Um, and they're fun. And yesterday we tried something new that we have talked about multiple times and haven't implemented yet. Yesterday was the first time it went live. Uh, and there were some, uh, some lessons we learned. But overall, I think it was a fantastic, smashing success. Um, so Dave had the live stream all day. Um, and that is currently on the VOD at, at Theory Underground, um, on YouTube. If you're here, then you should definitely be aware of Theory Underground. I don't think anyone watches, uh, or, or has, you know, is exposed to the videos I put up that isn't from Theory Underground or isn't at least aware of Theory Underground. I think there are a few people that didn't come from Theory Underground. Um, but for the most part, everyone should know theory underground youtube channel just hit 12 12k 12, 12,000 subscribers which is pretty cool because it was you know not that long ago it barely passed 10k so anyway blah 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 right dave had <clears throat> the live stream all day yesterday the vod is over at theory underground if uh if you were there for part of it um you can go back and watch all of it, uh, except for the part that got cut off because YouTube does not save content. Uh, once you pass the 12 hour mark, it doesn't save anything over that to the VOD. Um, luckily, everything was recorded. So the, you know, all the segments, all the pieces, all the parts will go up uh, eventually at some part, but there wasn't very much that got cut off anyway. We cut it off pretty close to 12 hours. Um, which is, believe it or not, short for an air epic marathon stream. 
um, at Theory Underground. We've done, I think the longest one we did was like a 17 hour live stream, which was fucking intense. But um, over here on, uh, on this side of the aisle or, or this side of the curtain, I guess, if you will, we had the green room. Um, and I was, I was debating whether or not I should stream it because to be honest with you, I hate editing and uploading videos. I hate it. Live streaming is the way to go when you're doing stuff like this. If you want to like editing, editing video can be fun. I do enjoy editing photos. Um, I also enjoy developing photos. I enjoy the process of creating static images um, and manipulating and, and editing and producing images. I enjoy all of photography from the gear, you know, researching the gear, buying the gear, using the gear, and then developing the photos or editing processing and exporting the photos it, it is all enjoyable um and editing video can be fun but the these videos um it's more fun to have these conversations um interact with the people and move on to the next conversation you know move on to the next thing that we have going on it, it it's so much dead time when we get stuck editing and and uploading video um so i was really considering live streaming the green room i might that might be the way it goes down in the future um just because it saves so much time and it makes it so much easier for everyone to have access to it um and you know now i have to spend time editing and exporting and uploading, that's just, that, that's such a waste of time. There's so many other things I should be doing with my time. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to get on that. Um, there was one video, the audio got roasted on it. Um, I had the YouTube audio coming through like a separate channel, like a virtual channel. Um, so I had the live stream going on on YouTube, but I couldn't hear it because it was on a, a virtual channel. Um, and then I looked and I noticed that OBS was picking up that audio and the, the green room audio. Um, so one of the videos, and it sucks because that was a fucking phenomenal conversation. And actually like the first hour and a half is roasted. Um, and we only have like the last like 20, 25 minutes of that conversation. Um, so that, that sucks. That was a lesson learned, um, pay more attention. And there were also a few, a, a couple other moments where, um, you know, it just didn't go, uh, smoothly because it's, it's, I forgot. It's like, oh, I'm over here running OBS also. Um, and I'm like switching and like, it's kind of like, it's, I, I don't know. It's complex. Uh, if you haven't done it before. There's really no good way to explain it. And if you have done it before, then you know that while it's not super duper difficult, uh, it is, it's something you need to be paying attention to. And it's easy to forget about it when, uh, when normally, you know, it's, it's not one of the normal things that you're doing. So anyway, so there were a few other moments, a few other lessons learned throughout the day. But overall, you know, there's several hours of, of excellent content, excellent conversation, follow-up conversations, um, threads from some of the different guests that were on the live stream came back into the green room and, and got to like cross the streams. Um, and, and we had some crossovers and it was just, it was fucking great. It was outstanding. Everyone involved, um, that had the time to stick around and, and participate in the, in the backside of it, uh, had great feedback. I had a fucking fantastic experience. Um, one of the people, Mandy, said it's the closest the internet has felt to a coffee shop. Uh, and that is, that's fucking awesome. Like that coffee shop vibe is a large part of the intentional design that goes into 
events, you know, that Theory Underground does. Um, and so, so that was really cool. We, we are trying to simulate a space where there's a living conversation. There's a persistent something going on that people can participate in. Um, and it's not just like this immediate on demand, um, you know, right now, right now, right now, right now, and then on to the next. But, but it really is like there's a persistent world that uh, we are all kind of participating in and co co-creating, co-constructing, co-developing. Um, and so that's really cool. Uh, had a blast, had a great time. Everyone involved um, had, had great feedback. And I am now going to process the video and, and upload it. Um, and since I have to, I have to export and upload anyway, I actually am going to take the time and it's not going to be a whole lot of time, but I'm going to take a little bit of time this morning, um, to go through and just kind of, you know, probably cut a few things out. Um, may, maybe do a little bit of correction here and there, and I will probably um put in cuts and kind of introduce the the segments um just because i'm already here i'm already doing it and i think it might make it easier for people to consume that way because i could just upload you know take all the video files put them into one project export it and upload it um and that would be cool but you know i figured i might as well in you know include some cuts some signposts to kind of guide the viewers through it. And this will, this will be the extended cut. Um, Dave is going to take the files and, and actually edit it into something and, and make it dope. Um, I'm excited to see that. I'm also excited to go back and watch the VOD um, for the conversations that I missed out on. Because when I was in the green room having conversations, I wasn't able to watch the live stream. Um, so there's definitely things I missed out on as well. So yeah, all that said, um, I'm going to just post the, the extended cut. Um, and Dave is going to do more of like a director's cut with the footage. It's going to be incorporated. Um, and it's actually going to be more of a finished product. This, this is going to be like a kind of cutting room floor type. You know, almost the whole shebang will be everything. Um, there are a few things that, I already know I want to go back and, and, uh, and correct just cause it's, it's like, yeah, that, that wasn't right. But, uh, so I'm going to do that. I got to export upload. I'm going to go ahead and do like introductions, just pop, pop in, show my little face and say like, okay. And now this is, you know, myself and Ben Burgess talking for a few minutes. Uh, oh, and, and this is Tony and J reg. Um, in the background or in the, in the back green room. And this is Cadell and Benjamin, um, stuff like that. Introduce you guys to the clip. So it's not just like a nonstop one video, um, just for a little bit of a uh, little bit of a roadmap to make it a little bit easier to consume, to be, to participate in that way. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and get to that before I do that. I'm probably going to go make some tea. I had a lot of tea yesterday. Um, but not as much as I wanted because I actually wound up getting, you know, caught in great conversations where I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to get up from my chair, go to the kitchen and, and make tea, even though, you know, my kitchen's right there. My kitchen's 20 feet behind me, but I have to open that door. I have to walk down the hallway. I have to get water. You know, I have to do all that. And it is, it's just a thing that, uh, I didn't want to do. Uh, so I'm going to make some tea, then I'm going to go through these video files, you know, correct a few mistakes here and there, um, record, a, you know, introductions to, to each segment, and then I'm going to export it, and then I'm going to upload it um, for your viewing pleasure, dear reader. Um, but wait for Dave to do whatever Dave does. And, and upload the stuff too, because that's actually going to be, like I said, that's going to be like the finished product. This, all of these really are just going to be like, yeah, this is the, 
raw recording for the most part. Um, so if you do wind up watching any of the segments here, um, that doesn't mean you've already seen it and you don't need to watch it when it comes out. Uh, cause it will be transformed. And also, um, I think some of the conversations that we had bear repeating, um, specifically, I, th I am excited for the Cadell last Benjamin Studebaker, uh, extravaganza, because I think that the live stream conversation, I missed out on it. I didn't see the live stream, but we were in the green room and we went for, um, close to two hours and seeing that that that's going to be kind of the biggest transformation because that is actually going to incorporate live stream and green room talks um it's going to be cool and that's going to be on the theory underground channel um dave is going to do all that work because dave is um better at doing that type of shit like i don't i i don't love uh video i do love photos um, but I don't love video and I, I don't want to say Dave loves video, but Dave likes video more than I do. Um, so yeah, like if we lived in a world where we were all just photographers instead of philosophy, people, theory, people, um, you know, if, if we lived in a photography nerd world, like, I mean, we could, but we choose not to. We choose to come over here to the theory world, right? But if this were just the photography world, then I would be the one editing all the photos and creating the finished product. Um, but you can't, you can't contain a conversation in a single image or even in a, in a single series of images. Although I have tried to do that. Photo essays are a thing. Um, some are better than others. Um, I would say the vast majority are garbage. I, I do think there are some photo essays that manage to convey uh, a hell of a lot more meaning than, than you would assume just uh, a series of still images would be able to convey. But anyway, that's not what we're doing here. We're not photo essayists. <laughs> we're not video essayists either. Um, but the way that these conversations get transmitted to you, internet person, is via the, the medium of video and because dave is better at video dave enjoys doing video more than i do he is the one he's actually gonna like put in real effort and make it look good uh and be a final product although if if you watch um the conversation with jreg you will hear why we don't try too hard um or you'll hear at least part of the reason why we don't we don't try too hard and we don't overproduce things so it's not going to be overproduced, but it's definitely going to have a higher production value than what I come up with. Because what I come up with, again, it's going to be the extended cut. It's going to be, you know, the cutting room floor type thing. All I really am going to do is chop it up, add some signposts so you have uh, the ability to navigate the video a little bit easier. Um... And then I'm going to export it and upload that motherfucker. And then I'm going to go back to doing other things. I have a shitload of photos that I need to edit right now uh, and deliver that I've been putting off for a while. Um, moving and, and all this stuff and just being super duper busy, but also always having some something that I need to be doing. Um, and that's not to mention all the things I need to be writing because the TUCon is coming up in about a month in Boise, Idaho. Um, and I, I need to have some writing done for that. Um, not just for a standalone presentation, but also because I want to have a, my own roadmap that I can use to kind of navigate the entire event because it will be uh, dope and it will unfold over several days and so i i need to create a little roadmap for myself as well but anyway i am gonna go make tea uh i'm and then i, I might i might shower it's only it's only 7 30 so it's not like it's super early i got up at four o'clock this morning and uh just been hanging out i had some coffee i sat out front and listened to the birds for a while uh i watched a video about phones being or beep beepers and pagers being used as weapons 
Uh, that was interesting. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, so I'm just chilling. But yeah, I'm going to go do shit. I'm going to stop rambling. It's procrastination. Like, that's what I'm doing. I'm procrastinating at this point. Because um, I am tired. Didn't sleep well. Haven't been sleeping well. <sighs> but I got shit to do. I am going to go do that. So I'm going to, like, go right now. But I'm actually, like, from your perspective, I'm not going anywhere. Like, from your perspective, I don't know, maybe I'll put in a little music and, like, a little transition. But then I will be... I will remain here from your perspective. So, okie dokie, artichokies. See you soon. Say Dave! You say fuck yeah, Dave! Fuck yeah! Dave! Fuck yeah! When I say fuck yeah! And um, he took um, G uh, for go, so uh, L for left in English. And he just totally misunderstood it. And uh, um, some other guy uh, chimed in and said, oh, yes, Deleuze is a, 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 a charlatan. And I listened to it, and it was totally um, uh, uh, Lacanian. Uh, Deleuze uh, talked about May 68, and he said it wasn't this imaginary uh, thing that people imagine. It wasn't what people know, the symbolic. Uh, he didn't use the word symbolic, but he did use the imaginary. And he said it was an eruption of the real. Hmm. So he was turning in, talking in totally Lacanian terms. And um, uh, his argument for um, jurisprudence was totally misunderstood. Uh, so, in fact, the, um, the relation between Deleuze and, and uh, Lacan um, or Deleuze and Guattari and Lacan, is much closer than the ordinary images um, uh, show. And I think that um, relation holds right up to the end in um, what is philosophy. Did... Uh... Did Deleuze write something on Lucretius or am I imagining that? Yes. Um, okay. He mentions him constantly in terms of the, the uh, thought without image. Yeah. But there's um, the appendix to logic of sense where he talks about um, uh, the simulacra in the, uh, Lucretius. And that's where he says that the um, clinaman is more fundamental than the, the atom. So, um, which is something that uh, Thomas Nail builds yep. on. Yep. He seems to think that Deleuze doesn't quite say that, but in fact he does, because I, I, I read Thomas Nail and I went back and I examined uh, that appendix by Deleuze on, on Lucretius uh, th through a, a, a conceptual microscope, and he, he does say it quite clearly. So... <laughs> um, that doesn't mean, uh, I mean, Thomas Nail has read, written incredible um, developments in his philosophy of, of movement. Yeah. So, I, um, I, I'm enthusiastic. I like the school of materialist research that um, actually started here at Arizona State University. Um, they, do, they do stuff all over. Um, they do everything virtually, but yeah, his... It's not his, but the School of Materialist Research, he's a part of that. Um, and um, yeah, kinetic, kinetic Marxism uh, is very, very interesting. But uh, yeah, I just think, okay, with Deleuze and Guattari, it's, they do kind of get weird. And, and the way they use words is, um, I don't know, at times silly, I think. And I think they they invite a lot of the criticism on themselves. Um, but I also do, I, I do like that there are other prominent French thinkers who um, are kind of demonstrating this, like, uh, you know, the postmodernists as such uh, are not just a bunch of wishy-washy relativists. There are people who are, like, earnestly engaging and really trying to figure this out. And... Um, 
uh, take, you know, the physical world just as seriously as, as the kind of soft and squishy human cultural world that we've constructed. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I, I, I find it serendipitous that recently I've been really trying to, to read, um, like serious math and, and sciences. Um, because it, it like we we need to bring that we can't just all be a bunch of like blue-haired weirdos where you know it's all relative baby um and uh yeah that's well, that's I not don't a know new... why you, why you don't read um bad you then i There's read the i read the idea of communism event. I mean, yeah, no, you can't read his yeah. political ideas. That turned Everybody me off. Has... That turned me off. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> but no. You have to read the conceptual stuff. I And, and I will. not even bother uh, with the rest or read it through the conceptual stuff. Yeah. I can uh, be bothered. But, um, yeah, being an event. Yeah. That's an amazing book with um, based around set theory and... You don't even need to have read it. You read a short summary to read Logics of Worlds, which is built around category theory. So, um, which is his materialist, his book of materialist phenomenology. And then uh, Imminence of Truth, it goes back to um, set theory, but um, uh, it's all about um, different sized infinities of sets. Um, uh, I think I went through, I worked through it all um, when I hadn't done any um, set theory. Um, well, I read uh, Being an Event when it came out. So it must have been in 87 or 88. And I didn't follow up, but it didn't sort of become a, a research project um, skeleton frame for me. And I read uh, Logics of Worlds in 2001. I hadn't really thought about maths um, between times. So that was a, a, a gap of whatever, um, 15 years. And then um, uh, that didn't, I liked it, but it didn't sort of um, inspire me. And then I read, um, 20 years later, I read Eminence of Truths, and that really did inspire me. And I sort of picked up the set theory again mm. and um, worked through his proofs and everything. It's um, it's something that, that uh, well, I can't remember. I read it over one summer when I was working, so it was a summer holiday. I read it over two months, uh, um, trying to really understand all the maths and everything. So, um, and that wasn't even full time because I had lots of other stuff to do. So it's it's something uh, quite um, accessible if you're willing, if you're interested and you're willing to put in the work. But because you talk about category theory, yeah, uh, maybe Logics of Worlds will be a good book for you. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that um as homework and i'm going to add that to the the <laughs> list of good. books i'm i'm working my way through but no i i i i think it matters um and i think you know being in this post marxist world or or whatever and and um we read a lot of critical theory we you know we're trying to develop a critical media theory and and working on all these things um, but I think a big kind of lacuna in the content we all discuss is mathematics and stuff like that. So I'm actually going to add that to my list and I'm going to bump it up to the top so I can read that. And, um, uh, there's an article, I, I don't remember the details by Rocco Gangle and his argument was, uh, V equals C, V the virtual equals C category theory. And I just thought that was a, a, a brilliant idea. Yeah. 
and a brilliant tunnel, a bridge concept between Deleuze and um, Badiou. So uh, I think work on the mathematics is not wasted in that it's generalizable elsewhere. Yeah. I I wonder, do you like Byung Chul Han? I read it. It's nice. Nice, yeah. It's not it's not uh world shattering or anything, but it's right. nice. Yeah. It doesn't bother me. I it's fun to read. I it's not the level of Slotter Dyke or, or somebody like that, but it's Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I I think uh yeah, Byung Chul Han is like uh, a watered down version of I think Sloterdijk for Silicon Valley artists and tech bros who are not horrible people. <laughs> well, yes, it's it's nice you can relate to it. Yeah, but um, I also feel like there are people who read Byung Chul Han specifically, um, and then like lord that over other kind of critical theory enthusiasts because they're like well i read byung chul han so i take you know the hard sciences seriously i don't know it just seems seems a bit silly i i now i want to use badu to bitch slap bunk byung chul han but i do <laughs> like i do like byung chul han it's um, nice i've read several books i've got uh, more than I uh, on my reading list as well. So. Yeah, it's short and and punchy, and it it's like a nice, well packaged, punchy polemic, um, which that has it's you know there's a time and place for that, um, but I feel like he's taking a lot for granted, and I also feel like he's missing out on a lot, um, and maybe even falling into pataphysics while pretending like he's not doing a pataphysics maybe i don't know um yeah i don't know maybe we, we should do a reading of a text or something yeah um it's difficult to talk about him in general yeah well, we, we did, uh, I think Dave and I have done at least one of, uh, one of his short works. We did a exegetical reading on it and it was really good, but there, I mean, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of holes to be filled, which is, again, it's fine. Like, like what he's doing is these kind of short, punchy, argumentative essays almost, um, but uh, the way he, I can't remember which one we did, but he was talking about data and information. Um, and he was almost using data and information interchangeably. And I, I think that is a mistake. I think, I think information should be synonymous with like um, full communication with like content, meaningful content. And then data is the kind of like, deworlded atomized um you know singular point of data and then like if if you have a bunch of data you can then collect it and collate it into information but data as such it's all meaningless it's just a collection of of deworlded points of of information but I think that's probably getting a little too far into the weeds overall. Yeah. I think I do like Pyong Chulhan, but like I, I, I want to, I guess I'm learning that I do, I should take bad news seriously because I haven't taken bad news seriously. Uh, no, everybody just talks about his political takes. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, his, uh, chunky philosophical works are quite amazing. And, Unfortunately, I was looking, what have I, after being an event, he produced Manifesto for Philosophy. I think it's uh, really great. It's only um, uh, 90 pages. 
I didn't like it. I think there's something uh, brilliant about the style in French, and I didn't like the English translation. After Logics of Worlds, he produced Second Man Manifesto for Philosophy. That's only about 100 pages too. It has the major ideas. And um, uh, that can give you an idea whether you find him interesting or not. Unfortunately, this is my criticism, um, after Imminence of Truths, I was hoping for a, a third manifesto for mm. philosophy, which he never produced. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think he, he did a couple of interviews um, that are published in in uh, books. Um, but you shouldn't read the political interviews. Uh, for, uh, well, you should, but not first. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's In Praise of Mathematics, I think that's been translated. It's only 60 pages. In Praise of Love, um, oh, a bit fuddy-duddy. Um, it's easy to get an idea of his concepts in abstraction from his particular political takes because he's very strange. All these people in France, have, um, because everything was so political, um, they took particular different political lines and developed them um, in a really f uh, extreme way. And um, it was it, sometimes... I, I've seen an interview where um, Badu and uh, Lyotard are talking about um, they're talk, talking about time and mathematics, but they had digs um, at each other about their politics from long <laughs> ago as well. So um, there's something uh, uh, there's nothing to do with us. Yeah. In their political takes. Yes. Yeah. If you've, if you've just got that, you're uh, you're not getting um, uh, the uh, the conceptual um, uh, substance of what they're on about. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like like uh, like right now, today, the most important thing is having like a bold political stance um, and. And it kind of completely destroys any potential for having a discourse, for having um, robust conversations, because all everyone cares about is saying, oh, yes, I stand for this or I stand against this. And it's like, no, that none of that shit matters. Um, yeah, these these guys had these commitments because of the scene that they were in and and kind of the way that that scene developed and they may have had personal affinities or personal grudges um and that got turned into the you know the main event or whatever when it comes especially people like Badu um but even you know even Deleuze and Guattari and it's like I don't care about your politics I care about the theories you're you're working with and developing um, but then all, again, oh, that's so long ago, uh, was determined so long ago. doesn't have anything to do with today. Yeah. Who, who among these people could, um, understand American politics? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, it's... and then, you know, I, th I think, uh, you know, much like the Gulf war, um, not existing or, or not taking place. I think American politics, like, like the, the distinguishing feature with American politics is that they don't take place. Um, none of it is real. It, it is all just this kind of like stage production. Um, it doesn't mean that something else is not real. Right. Right. You're saying the Gulf War didn't take place. Something else did take place. Exactly. It wasn't that. Exactly. Exactly. <sighs> well, I. So I am going to read some Badu, um, for sure. Other than that, thank you for coming on and, and kind of breaking these guys down. Leotard, um, and Latour have been people that I know I, I need to like deeply read. Um, Sarah 
has become one thanks to you coming on and advocating for him. Like previously it was just like, oh yeah, that's a name. I'm aware of that name, but uh, it almost means nothing to me. But th these have been thinkers that I know I need to read. I know I need to, to work my way through, but I haven't found the time. I haven't made the time. Um, but you're... Well, that's, that's the thing because... Um, I, I think we have a photo of French thought that is outdated. Mm. We constantly have to uh, update our images. Mm -hmm. So when I when I came to France, um, every year there were books published by um, a new book by Lyotard, by Foucault, by Deleuze, by Derrida, by Costa Saxolos, by uh, other people, and every year it was an intellectual delight. And I waited uh, by Michel Serra as well. I waited impatiently for each of these books to, to come out. And then that all sort of went away. Mm. And that is sort of enshrined in my memory because it was an intense time. And it's enshrined in how it's been taken up in the English speaking world. But there was a second wave for me um, uh, in the 2000s when Badiou was good going strong yeah um and his seminar was online and uh, bernard stiegler was going strong and his seminar um was online i've watched years and years um of um his seminar and bought each book as soon as it came out and um bruno latour the seminars were were not online but he was producing at least one book uh, every year and um, for me, that's the second wave of the um, magical uh, French um, intellectual um, ferment. Yeah. And um, I feel that has not been um, uh, taken up as much. Uh, Leo, uh, Lyotard was out, um, but um, Michel Serre was in a new phase. Stiegler was going strong, Badiou was going strong, and Latour was uh, going strong. So uh, there's that phase that needs to be assimilated now. So yeah. but it's building on all the other stuff that um, uh, we read from before. Yeah. So um, uh, you can't sort of... It's like trying... I keep f finding that... It's keep... Uh, even with just uh, Lacan reading all the late seminars, it's like trying to swallow an ocean. Yeah. I, I, I just, I mean, uh, talk about uh, the burnout uh, society. Mm. This is just burnout uh, self-culture. Yeah. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's here, um, an impossible task, but if you try to do all of it at once, or even all of it in your life, but it's... Um, still for me, uh, quite a living um, mm. set of um, projects. I like that. Living projects, um, not this kind of ossified, uh, fetishized kind of image of, you know, French thought. Just a bunch of postmodern weirdos who who ridicule the Lord's Supper for their opening ceremony at the uh, at the Olympics. <laughs> I never actually found out um, if that was like I thought they were doing like a feast of Jupiter or something, but like my conservative yeah, family they were the, yeah, my conservative the family gods members reference as well. Yeah, my, my, my family members were like, no, it was about Jesus. And I was like, it wasn't about Jesus. It was about like Greek mythology. And I never found out what, what was true. Um, but I, well, I, I enjoyed we will, it. We will never know. <laughs> um, because it's, it's, it's a political um, um, bomb. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, now everyone's emphasizing that it's based on this um, painting um, uh, to do with um, uh, well, Greek mythology. So um, uh, there's Bacchus and uh, yeah, 
whatever. So um, that line is going to be pushed all the time now. Yeah. So why can't it be a, a mashup of, of both? Well, I, I, I took it as like a, a, a Greek play when I saw it happen because I watched it, um, which is something that this, this year I've always, I've always been fascinated with human excellence. And so I always try to watch the Olympics. Um, but this year it was an even bigger event. Um, and we, I made a point to sit around with my family and we watched as much of it as we could manage. So I, I watched that opening ceremony live. Um, it was horribly long, but I, I watched all of it when usually I don't care. Yeah, I thought it was great. They, they had uh, Gojira, which is a French uh, metal band. They did that, uh, that song. Um, I thought that was great with that opera singer. It was wonderful. But when I watched it happen, I thought, oh, this is Greek mythology. And then like the next day, people were like, they were making fun of Jesus. And I was like, oh, I didn't think, <laughs> I didn't think they were doing that. But even if they were, don't Christians talk shit about Muslims because they're like, you can't make fun of Muhammad. Well, it, if, if that's a problem, then I, shouldn't I be able to make fun of Jesus? If that's, I don't know. Anyway, that's just, it doesn't fucking matter. It, it shouldn't matter, but it does matter to people. Um, so I should be empathetic rather than just like, you know, taking the piss and laughing at their expense. So I, I can empathize with people who are offended, um, as long as they're not taking it too far. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, it's entertainment. You know, don't take yourself too seriously. Have a sense of humor. Um, whatever. But I do remember when I was a kid, we used to make fun of the French. Um, and, and I remember after September 11th, people were, uh, like there was like an anti French movement here in America where we were, we had freedom, freedom fries. fries instead of French yes. fries. <laughs> uh, little do little does the average American know, uh, America wouldn't have happened with, were it not for France. You know, I, th I think, um, American patriots who who really care about liberty egality and fraternity uh they should learn some french history as well well they don't even learn american history in america but uh <laughs> all that said um again i really appreciate it i have uh a list of books that i'm going to move up the long ever-evolving list of books to read um and I appreciate it. And this, yeah, this was great. Uh, anything you want to like add or, or any point you want to reiterate or anything that before I let you go? No, I think we talked about a lot. We did. It was yeah. great. Uh, nice. Um, in the, what's the opposite of the, we're in the green room. What was the other um, thing before the red room? That's the red room. If you've seen, uh, what is it? Twin Peaks? Oh, yes. Or was it the Red Room or the Red Lodge? The Red, the Red Lodge. Lodge. Yeah. So the, the that's the Red Lodge and this is the green room. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um I am I'm gonna let you go and, and get back to it, but thank you, Terrence, and we will speak soon. Okay. And also, yes, uh I I would love to do some uh to read some Bedou with you. Uh yes. So that's something we should we should talk about it in the future because I would love to do that. Yes, great. So, awesome. Thanks, Terrence. I'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. Thanks. All right. What's happening? Um, I look like a scumbag. Like, <laughs> uh, it's funny. Um, my hair's all gross and my fucking facial hair's all gross. And, uh, yeah, I feel like a scumbag too. I had beef with dudes when I was a kid. Um, and they all, like their crew was like, they were all scumbags and they had fucking scumbag tattoos and, um, and they were in fact scummy fucking dudes. Um, yeah, fuck those guys. <laughs> anyway, um, no, they were the homies. Anyway, what's up? That was Terrence. Uh, and that was the end of our conversation. Um, and unfortunately like i like i said the uh, the audio issue 
Um, but yeah, that was it. It was still a great conversation. That was the tail end of it. Um, now we're going to go ahead and, and move forward. Um, I think we'll go into the, the short little convo Ben Burgess and I had in the green room um, next. So this next guest was Ben Burgess. It was a short little convo. You guys will get an opportunity to check that one out, and then we'll move on to the, the next one after that. So stay tuned. Same bat time, same bat channel, all that stuff. Yeah. Yep. So we're rolling now. So, um, so just in the interest of time, Ben's got to run, but, uh, to give him the, the stage, give him the opportunity, go for it, Ben. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think I, I think, uh, the, the, my answer to Dave's last question, I think I more or less said what I wanted to say. So let's, let's spend these five, 10 minutes. We got to answer your questions. So, <laughs> so you brought up labor yeah. chits. Um, yes. <laughs> and that, uh, for, for me, I mean, I, that's been the punchline of many, many jokes that I've made kind of like okay. taking a shit on yeah. labor chits, but, sure, um, yeah. but you know, it's, it's always been like tongue in cheek, kind of making fun of it. I have never, uh, I've never like deeply read the Grand Risa. Um, yeah. I've, I've never deeply read capital. I, I, I've read capital, uh, but I've only started seriously reading it in the past year and a half. Um, so, so why, yeah. why are labor chits not a joke? <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know that I think that. I don't okay. That I, okay. Don't, I don't think they're a joke, right? Like, okay. In other words, let, let me, let me, let me just kind of say, I think that, um, I think that there may be interesting to think about just for what they can reveal about like what Marx was thinking in these passages where it says it, like, I think that can be interesting. Yeah. But, uh, I think that as like a serious proposal for, for, for how to, uh, organize distribution under socialism, uh, I am pretty unsold <laughs> on, on, on this, on this idea, right. Just, just cause it, it seems, uh, that, um, you know, it, it's, it's very hard for me to see exactly how this would work. Um, and especially because um, if you think about like, okay, even when Marx is putting forward his view about value in chapter one, like, look, every like barstool libertarian who's never actually read Capital, their big objection is going to be, uh, Oh, what you know, you think that like products are more valuable because of how much time it took you to do it. So, I guess if you're really bad at your job, then it's more valuable. And of course, you know, that's a straw man as far as Marx's view about value goes, uh, because, uh, because it's, uh, you know, because again, it's average, socially necessary labor time, right? Whatever you guys know, all this, but the uh, but. But then, like, it sort of suddenly becomes a decent objection when we start thinking about how labor chits could work, right? Because it's yep. like, well, 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 wait a second, right? Like, if it if it takes me longer to to do something, then I'm therefore entitled to more stuff from the the common store. That seems weird. And of course, there are various, you know, ways that you could adjust this to try to get around that worry, right? Uh, but it it just kind of seems like before you know it. Uh, like once you've done all of your adjustments, it's like, I don't know, how, is this even still a labor chit, right? Like, like, like if, if it's that, you know, cause if you know, you could have some kind of like, you know, mutual evaluation going on, right. Of like, you know, of, of, of how, how efficient people are being, which, which by the way, the deeper you go into this, this is also one of my problems with like the Michael Albert Paracon stuff that, um, that like, man, the more the deeper you go into this, the the more up in each other's business it all sounds like we're going to be, and and the the less pleasant that sounds to me, right? Uh, that uh, uh, so um, and the more you sort of take it being like, okay, well, it's not necessarily an hour for an hour, and we're a little hands off about it, so we're not like constantly doing evaluations of how hard you're working or whatever. Then it's like. I don't know. Before we know it, it's like this is, you know what this sounds suspiciously like to me is money. Mm -hmm. So <sighs> money. And yeah, I think Marx sets up 
to knock down uh, as, as if yeah. he's setting up bowling pins, this kind of like small brained version of, oh, it takes longer, therefore. Uh, right. yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, think, I, I guess thinking about money and value, I think I never think about money. I do think a lot about value and, and I think a lot about the value form and the commodity form. Um, but then dealing with like the money commodity, um, I guess it probably is something that we can't escape. Yeah. So this is, uh, right. I mean, I think that at the very least right now, it's, it's, it's really hard to see, mm -hmm. uh, how you would do without that. Right. Uh, and, and this is something that. I I kind of I don't know. I always want socialists to to to, to think more about because like I know it's kind of boring, but like I think in a certain <laughs> sense, like these kind of logistical questions are also it's like look if you know you want to have some you know uh, bad word for Marxist, but like you know trust I'm not using it in that way, right? You know if you want to have some like utopian imagination here, yeah, right? you know that, that, that you want to say like no. I'm I'm serious about the idea that the world we're living in doesn't have to be, you know, isn't the world that we have to be living in. Uh, that it's like, look, I, I I want you to think about the boring, nitty gritty details of like of like how you could actually organize things, and uh, and and it's 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 really really difficult, right, to see how you could do without either money or something that looks a lot like money, because um, if you you know, for one thing, um, and, and in, a, in a certain way, this is like even kind of Marx's own point in, uh, you know, in, in chapter, you know, two and, and set it up in like 1.3 in Capital, uh, you know, where, you know, it says, look, there's, there's sort of nothing special about money that, because, uh, uh, you know, in some ways in that context, right, he wants to push back against the people who think that it's like, oh, the problem with capitalist exploitation is that like the magic of money is like tricking <laughs> workers into like not exchanging equivalent for equivalent. Yeah. And I uh, said, no, 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 that has nothing to do with anything. Right. And, uh, and, and so in a sense, it really seems like a lot of his analysis of money in those sections is just like, look, this is just, you know, it's just another commodity, right. You know, that you're exchanging for other commodities. It's sort of a, it's a incredibly convenient commodity to have. Right. You know, cause, cause it, it, uh, you know, it, it, it makes all these exchanges easier, but it's, you know, it's essentially, uh, you're not doing anything essentially different, right? You know, when you trade things for gold rather than trading them for yards of women or herd of, you know, herds of cattle. And, um, and so the problem is if you, if you start thinking about like, okay, we're, we're imagining some really, really robustly marketless setup, uh, where you're just like, you know, we, we don't, you know, we don't have exchange. We just have a system for withdrawing things from the common store. And then, but then you start thinking about how that works. Like, okay, either you've got labor time chits or you've got some sort of Paracon-ish like system for like, you know, pooling together everybody's preferences and tabulating them. And, and part of the problem is we're really bad at predicting our preferences in advance, uh, as, you know, especially when you have like weird complex trade-offs. Uh, so I, I don't, you know, I, I think like, it, I think if somebody wants to say, oh, okay, we can do, you know, I mean at this, and I'm not, I'm not saying any of this to foreclose anybody's imagination about like what we could figure out in the 23rd century or whatever. I did just the opposite actually. Right. Like I want to, I want to get people to, think more seriously about alternative forms of social organization and and if we can you know if whatever is like the the furthest we could advance right now isn't the first you know I, I wouldn't assume is the furthest we'll ever figure out how to advance right but um but if, if people want to say oh okay right now at this stage of history we know how to do a form of socialism that doesn't have money or anything that like basically works like money my response would basically just be like okay i'm listening Mm -hmm. Right. But like, I, I, I want you to give me a bunch of those boring nitty gritty details about exactly, you know, exactly how it would work. Yeah. The, the boring nitty gritty details. I, I almost feel like sometimes the boring nitty gritty gets juxtaposed with the, and I defend utopian imagination. 
but but it does feel like there's a tension between this this really functional uh rigorous systematic accounting of how is this going to work and then this like pie in the sky utopian i want my fully automated luxury gay space communism um but yeah i i I think we do need both i I do too but like you know i i just uh you know it's like look if we ever if we ever get to uh if we ever get to it right it's 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 going to be by a bunch of like really boring engineering nerds like having mm. specific breakthroughs about these you know these yeah. ideas right so it's like i, I want to I, I you know it's like yeah, I, I want i want the i want falk if we could figure out you know if we could figure out how to falk but if we uh until such time as we could figure out how to falk right like i at least want to uh you know i i at least i at least don't want a capitalism yeah right? you know so uh so so i, w- I want to at least like figure out how to get beyond capitalist class relations and and if we have to have money for a while um then you know i i don't i don't see that as as a um like you know well hell never mind you shouldn't have bothered right you know right so, yeah yeah um i wonder you said we're we're uh historically poor at at, at predicting trends and yeah. preferences and i agree with that but i wonder if Things like Walmart, things like Amazon are effective at, at predicting sufficient, uh, like, like sufficient demand or sufficient supply uh-huh. to, and, and I think there's something there with like commodities buying their consumers. So it's like, we kind of get lulled into a pacification. Um, they're, they're very good at, at predicting what will pacify us. Maybe not what will yeah. satisfy us. Maybe. Yeah, so this is this is the Lee Phillips and Mikhail Rosworski argument from the People's Republic of Walmart, more or less. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think that it you know it is true that sort of algorithmic prediction does play a bigger role under actually existing capitalism right now than you know God knows could have been imaginable you know when I was you know ten or whatever right, but. Uh, but I would also point out uh, that, um, you know, Walmart uh, is is not an economic island, right? You know, that <laughs> yeah. they, they, they do still uh, they do still operate, you know, with with within a whole, you know, system of of exchange where you know they're 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 still disciplined by price signals and all mm-hmm. that stuff, uh, and so. Um, and and so yeah, I, I don't know how far that point can can get us, um, you know. And and I, I I guess I would just maybe say one last thing because because I do. I mean, this has been so interesting that I've been like I've I've stayed on for longer than I was planning yeah. to already. But like uh, the, but um, I, I guess I just say like one one thing about this uh, maybe as like a closing thought, which is just that I don't. You know the the point of you know the point of trying to be like okay here's 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 the um, here's the sort of world furthest from the capitalist status quo that you know we uh, that we can figure out how to you know how to design right now right you know like like is definitely not to shut down anybody's imagination about what we could achieve in the, the the 23rd century right the point is just the opposite that you know that that i think that to the extent that we just kind of black box the whole issue and and there are all sorts of like there are all sorts of venerable marxist tricks for black boxing it right yep. you, know, you, you say you know um that uh that actually it's it's you know it's like idealist to think that you know that you know we, we just have to wait to see how the historical process plays out you know that that maybe it's undemocratic because you know the workers themselves will figure this out in the moment and you know they'll be facing problems that we can't etc uh that it's 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 uh you know look if you're a couple of medieval monks you know you wouldn't be able to you know you wouldn't be able to predict how capitalism would work etc and it's like I, I think all of this stuff all of these sort of rhetorical tricks are pretty good at reassuring people who are already convinced of the things that we're convinced of Ooh. but i i think they're really bad at convincing anybody new because uh i i think that the 
I think that these are sort of obvious concerns to have uh, and that lots of people who don't love capitalism uh, are, are are going to have them. And, uh, and, and I have to say that, I mean, all of this stuff basically strikes me as variations on, you know, have some faith and, you know, mm. the historical dialectic or whatever, which works just about as well on people who aren't yet convinced as, you know, I don't know, tell an atheist to have faith, have faith yeah. that God works in serious ways. Yeah. I like that. Uh, black boxes. We, we do tend to fall back on, on a lot of black boxes. Um, Ben, thank you for sticking around. You got to run. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next time we, we meet. And, uh, Absolutely. That sounds, yeah. Awesome. Thank sounds you, man. Good. Have a good one. Sounds good, Ben. All right. I'm back. Um, or wait a minute. I didn't go anywhere. You're back. Or we're, I don't know. We're back. Anyway. <laughs> Hi, that was uh that was the short little green room session with Ben Burgess. Uh it was it was it was cool, man. Uh I I enjoyed uh meeting Ben in person in Pomona when we met him in person. Uh it was a it was a cool event, cool night. Uh and it was nice to see Ben again. It was it's always nice to talk to uh talk to Ben. And that was it. And it was short, he had to run. It is what it is. Um we we ran into that several times. Yesterday, people um, having other things to do. Oh, what I wouldn't give to have a world where everybody could just sit around and talk all day, every day, until the end of time. Uh, but no, it was cool. It was a, a short little talk with Ben. It was great. This next uh, short green room session is, you know him. He's a great man. He's bigly great. No, he's uh, one of my favorite people, um, Daniel Garner of OG Rose. He's a great guy. He's a fantastic guy. He's got an energy that kind of pumps up um, the entire room whenever he enters it. Uh, so this is going to be a short little conversation that we had afterwards. He came back later on in the day. Um, we talked a little bit offline. He came back into the green room. He came back into stream, blah, blah, blah. So this is the first green room session with Daniel Garner, and he will make a return. But for now, you get Darn uh, uh, Daniel Garner. And, and there is uh, an appearance from some guests, and I, was, I didn't know if I should you know, remove them or not. Uh, you'll see in the video. Um, and I'm deciding not to because, again, Probably almost no one's watching this anyway. Um, and it's not like I'm out here like trying to crank out monetized content or whatever. Like I like we are just kind of playing with the medium and uh and uh shared spaces and kind of creating persistent um spaces and, and uh his kids make an appearance in the video and they are real people, they do in fact exist. And so, you know, getting to know the Garners, Daniel and, and Michelle, she's another friend. Uh, of Theory Underground and of myself. And she's, she's another person who can like amp up the energy in the room and also keep conversations going. Um, but knowing them, you know, they have a family and they have, it, that's real. So part of like playing with space and playing with the medium in, in this way that we're playing with, like we're trying to create persistent, uh, if not relationships, then something similar to relationships. Um, and we can't edit out, you know, kids from, from real life. And so if you want to actually build something more than just a rapport, some, something more than just a familiarity, but actually a working relationship, but even deeper than that, because uh, as you'll see later on, um, Cadell brings up this, uh, the notion of friendship, right? And uh, maybe even camaraderie um, and, and, and love, right? And, and how we need to get that back. A lot of what we do is talking about building community, rebuilding community. Daniel's talking about rebuilding a polis, and, and that does include uh, people's families. We're not just disembodied uh, upper torsos and heads on the internet. We are all real people, and we all have our own unique singular circumstances. Uh, and so I made the choice to not edit them out. Uh, I do think it's gross when people like monetize their families, but this is not monetized. Like this, <laughs> this is the uh, persistent living conversation that we're trying to develop. So uh, if it is a problem, um, I would be more than happy to take them out. I don't imagine it would be a problem. Try not to do anything gross. 
Uh, but I just want to get that out of the way because it's definitely something I thought about. I don't know if anyone whoever watches this will 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 think about it. Um, but yeah, and that is also like that's another like that's a part of this like conversation and the meta conversation kind of surrounding uh, all of it. What's what's going on and stuff. So. Um, yeah, I think it's a gray area. And I think in every given situation, I think it comes down to individual discernment. Um, and we're humans and we have that human discernment, right? We have the ability to, to kind of think for ourselves and make decisions, if you will. And with, with the ability to make decisions comes along the risk of making mistakes, but that's part of being human. Uh, so without further ado, here's Daniel Garner's first trip to the theory underground green room so i am doing well sir it is good to, i hope life is good we um i didn't show this this is what happens when you put a tomato in the back of the fridge and forget about it mainly when what? i put a tomato in the back yeah i know right this one doesn't look too bad uh so hopefully i can get a sandwich out of this um we will see uh we have a lot um but no i am well i enjoyed the conversation i definitely think we are dealing with a new so social coordination mechanism that has not historically been possible to uh democratize network effects per se whereas for most of history they've not been democratized which means we've not had power because really power is found in that middle space between the state and the individual, which of course requires both. But if you don't have that middle, you really are not going to have the power you need to be an influence on the individual and the state. Instead, you're ultimately going to over index the individual and end up in some transhumanism, if you will, like a Nick Land, or it's all going to be about taking back the state, taking back the state. Well, Studebaker is exactly right. Boy, that's not going to work. It's not going to freaking work. So, you know, I, I enjoyed that conversation. Yeah, I uh so I I uh I was talking to Terrence for far longer than I thought I was going to wind up talking to him here in the green room. Um, nice. But I caught the beginning of your talk and then I jumped toward the end when I realized I wasn't going to have time to get caught up before uh you came into the green room. So I caught sure. the tail end of it too. But yeah, it it uh the medium kind of what we're doing the way the way we are we are instrumentalizing Zoom, YouTube, uh, Substack, these platforms for a, a truly, uh, and I hate this word, but it does seem like it's developing into a truly political project as opposed yeah. to, um, you know, what passes for politics on my TV when I turn on CNN, when I turn on Fox News, News Nation, what, whatever. Like this type of, of action that we're all engaged in by developing these um, pseudo rhizomatic webs of, inter, you know, interconnected communication, education, e moral support even too, you know, because yeah. there is a, a strictly social aspect to what's going on. But this is a political project. Yes. Um, in the, you know, it, and I don't use that term in a derogative fashion. Normally I do like, normally I, I would say, yeah. uh, you know, I'm apolitical. In fact, I'm anti-political in this sense. Like, no, what passes for politics today is regressive. It's all reactionary. Yes. It all leads to the same, you know, or Ouroboros of oppression and death and genocide. And, and I don't want any part of it. So while I can have yeah. these, you know, these ideals of emancipation and egalitarianism, that is not represented in anything that gets called politics today. However, Correct. this uh, developing, emerging technology that we're all co-creating together, I think it is a politics that I can get behind. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting, right? Because it does have elements of transhumanism. It, it, it also has uh, a, a, almost like a, a triumphant return to humanism, like like a proper humanism like no i want to center me the political subject um yeah this tension between the individual and the state and what is power where does power arise it's all interesting and i love it um and and i i, I don't know what <sighs> i i keep trying to think like what would i say to to um, 18 year old me, if, if I could go back in time, 20, 20 years back in time to when I was 18, I guess I'm getting old. Uh, what would I tell 
that young, idealistic, disgruntled anarchist um, to, I, I don't know, maybe jumpstart the, the process that, that we're doing right now. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, there's a few things. First, we are trying to do politics without a polis. So it's pathological. And we haven't had the mechanism to create a polis. Um, Aristotle talks about politics as being a matter of polis. And what has happened is we've destroyed, in the name of liberty and equality and justice, moral reasons. We've destroyed the polis, which has left us with a, a politics and an individual, which has no mediating structure. And therefore, it becomes um, terrible. Uh, it becomes very problematic. And the issue is, uh, if we look at Tocqueville, democracy is this. This is democracy. It is not merely the voting structure. But here's, here's the issue. The reason why we have not been able to maintain true democracy, if you grant me that, or a polis, is precisely because we've not been able to handle the moral real, we've not been able to handle status anxiety, we've not been able to learn how to converse, we've not learned how to get along, we haven't learned empathy, we haven't learned a lot of human skills, because the issue is, like what Tocqueville says, is when you have a polis and you get the barber together with the blacksmith and the Christian and the atheist and different stuff, it's really effing hard to actually interact without saying, screw you, I don't like you. Or the barbers, you know, the, the, um, the engineer guy, he's talking with this kid who clearly has a better understanding of Aristotle than him. And it's really hard for the freaking engineer not to go, well, you're, I'm, I went to college and I have $50,000. What do you got to use the status, right? The critical thing that Tocqueville shows you is that the polis was destroyed not because of a conspiracy of the state. The polis was destroyed because people couldn't handle it. And also, they didn't know how to not turn it into a force of oppression. I would argue reasons for this is because we didn't have a social coordination mechanism. Mm. We, we have not had a way to actually train through keeping the polis. So the truly political act today is the restoring of the polis. Because basically, I agree with Aristotle and others, Tocqueville, etc., there's no such thing as politics without a polis that isn't auto-cannibalistic. It will eat itself. So this, if this is a political act, and you could say it's the prerequisite for the possibility of political act. Yes. Like, if you don't do this, there is no political action. There is simply legal action. Mm. People are conflating legal and politics. And that's why, basically, the government is now about the Supreme Court. It really has become the most powerful form of government and everything is about the Supreme Court because we can talk all day that the politics is about elections. No, it's about rulings because that's inevitably what occurs when you have a politics without the polis. It's really about who controls the judiciary branch. And the problem with that is there's basically nothing that feels more oppressive than the judiciary, you know, than the law kind of being oppressive on people. Um, but if people are going to say we can't deal with moral disagreement, people who can't deal with difference writes law. Law is what makes up for the inability to deal with difference mm, because yeah. you simply make X, Y, or Z legal. And then all I need to do is control the judges. So if you don't have a poll, this is the point. If you don't have a polis, you won't have a politics that is actually not even about politics. It's about law. Then as about law, it becomes about the judiciary. And then as the judiciary, it becomes notably totalitarian. You could say there is no for you could really argue that judges are domestically more powerful than the president. The president is internationally perhaps more possible, and it depends on how much you think they influ influence the, the military or whatever. But generally, domestically, the judges are the most powerful. And that's that's what's going to you're going to get. I guess they call it an oligarchy. It's not an oligarchy. There's another term for it when the judges rule everything. I can't think of it. Um, that's what's happened. So if you want politics instead of um, law, if you want a political life instead of a judiciary review, you must restore the polis. That's the only way. And that's what this work is doing. The issue is, I think a lot of liberals who are still focused Rightly so, you could argue, who are focused on racism, xenophobia, oppression, saying, well, the polis oppress people. Yes, but that simply means we need to do it better, not get rid of it. You know, the issue is not you get the problem is a lot of liberal people on the side of, um, you know, uh, human rights or whatever. 
they don't realize that if they don't use those critiques to sublate the public polis as opposed to destroy the power that oppresses people then you contribute to the transformation of politics and government into basically law and judiciary and then under that you're absolutely going to get a populist revolt you are absolutely going to get people who stand up against it because they feel alienated by that judiciary um, oppression on them. That's so I, I have a hard time thinking about politics because even the mention of the word politics, I just kind of default to what's happening today. Kamala Harris, Donald Trump, radical centrists uh, on golf courses with AKs, um, you know, 18 year olds, killing uh random civilians in a in a philadelphia crowd or uh pennsylvania right. crowd what like i nance yeah. give me one second i hear my kid i'll be yeah, right yeah. back just a absolutely second. absolutely Sorry about that, Nance. I just Not had to check on something. I'm sorry, but you were saying Camilla Harris and death and stuff. Yeah, it it, it the, the mention of the word politics uh, turns yeah. my stomach it, and it shuts my brain off. Oh, yeah. um, when I and, and and I always I guess think in reference to younger me and th this yeah. younger me was a very passionate, very idealistic. Uh, I was an anarchist for a long time. Then I was some kind of Marxist. Um, and I think I've returned to anarchism, but a more uh, sophisticated anarchism. But that's, you know, yeah. that doesn't matter. Um, but th th there is a way. And you mentioned Benjamin Studebaker, and I love this because he talks about politics in a way that doesn't break my heart and doesn't shut my brain down. And what you're talking about right now, similarly, um, we we have to kind of rebuild the, the potential for political action. And, yep. you know, taking these steps is, is itself a political act, but it allows me to, at, at least me, and I think a lot of other people too, to kind of maintain this distance and we can still pretend that we're at least apolitical, maybe not apolitical, anti-political. Um, but by doing this work to kind of rebuild some sort of fabric, some sort of moral fabric, some sort of uh, belonging, uh, we're all digital nomads. You know, we we no longer the, the nation, the which you know, the state and the nation. It's not the same thing, but the state is kind of like uh, founded on the nation, but they're yeah. different now. And and we we like you and I have a lot more in common than my next door neighbor. In fact, my next door neighbor and I just got in an argument about parking and dogs barking because. <laughs> uh, yeah. But that, that's something you have to deal with, um, you know, the, the physical world when, when you live with someone who has a barking dog and who likes to park in yeah. front of your house, um, which, yeah, there's difference and we have to cope with that. And my neighbor and I have to kind of come up with some type of agreement that allows us to coexist peacefully. Um, and it is this, this difference. But there's also, because of the internet. Okay, but it's not something to like play. There's uh there's infinite difference. Um, well, no, I mean not to interrupt. So there's a few. So first of all, um, I think it is very difficult for younger people to think of politics po positively when you don't even have the schema of the difference between state, society, and individual. Mm -hmm. um, I don't agree with his economics, but Murthy Rothbard did make a very important point where he said the conflation of state and society is a huge problem. They're not the same thing. Yep. You know, to share government is not the same thing as sharing a community. Um, there's also people that stresses the commons, right? Or mm -hmm. Jonathan Rauch or some of these other, like a Wendell Berry, you could call a communitarian. A uh, communitarian is between, um, you know, the individual and, and a heavy government, right? So there are all these distinctions that have been lost. And if you're younger... And you're like, wow, this system isn't working. And you don't even have at hand 
an alternative logic by which to think, well, then, yeah, you're going to say, forget it. I don't want anything to do with it. But here's the problem. That benefits the freaking state, right? Like, yes, you give it does. up, they win. Yes, it does. That's where also, this is where, in my opinion, many of the Marxists make a mistake. If you overly demonize capitalism, capitalism wins. Ooh. Like, if you say, I don't want anything to do with capital, well, then it wins. It, it's very glad you want nothing to do with it. And so you actually undermine your very, you can't sublate something you disown. Like, if you want to sublate the world, mm. then you can't disown it. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you're going to get all sorts of trouble. Um, and I and I would also note, and you want to say hi, Haven? You want to say hi? Hi. That's hey. great. You want to say hi to Nance? Hey. They appreciate it. <laughs> so on different things um but uh okay you want to say hi reed you want to you want to wave yes there he is hi there yeah hey. yeah yeah he says hi too so <laughs> on different things um but what ends up happening so you you can't sublate what you disown mm. so if you disown politics if you disown mm. google and youtube or whatever because it's all corporatism and techno feudalism well then you're out of the game um because you simply cannot court you simply cannot how, how are you going to build the um servers or the websites or all of these things that allow this social coordination you simply can't do it without what money well then you're back in the game right um and so, you know you're back into the thing you're disowning what ends up happening is when you disown something that you're trying you end up inevitably actually falling back into the thing you disowned without realizing it. And that just benefits it. It's a false revolution. It's a revolution that goes in a circle, right? Um, and so that's the joke. We always have to keep in mind when they came up with the term revolution, it has a very important irony in it. A revolution is a full circle. It means you don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so if you want a real revolution, the only real revolution as Hegel understood is a true infinity, which is a sublation of an, it's a negation sublation that goes together. Um, the other thing I was going to say is why it is so important. Like, and I, I, di I didn't bring this up, I, um, but I think it's very important. One of the reasons why we go, well, why does philosophy matter? Like, why does it really matter to think is because we are at mercy. And if you have to go or anything, don't let me keep you, Nan. No, no, I no, no, with no. You. I can keep you all day. Um, <laughs> we are at the mercy of whatever symbolic we are in. And if we are in the wrong symbolic, then you're you're trapped in it and you go insane. There's a wonderful thinker who I love. His name was um, Alfred Korobosky, and he wrote a fascinating book called Science and Sanity. Mm. Unfortunately, it's impossible to read, uh, but it's really good. But if I were to tell you what I would take to be the main takeaway from that book um, is he points out if you were trying to do modern physics and um, you had Roman numerals, you literally mm. could not do it. Mm. Like if you have the wrong symbolic, you can't think modern physics. It really matters what symbols you use. And schemas. And he's he's part of the semantic movement with Paris and all these different people, right? So what he's critiquing, funny enough, is Aristotelian logic. Not because he's trying to say it's wrong, but he's saying that Aristotelian logic, A is A logic, is actually an inefficient um, symbolic by which to think the world today. It's much more flow. It's much more network. It's much more. He actually, funny enough, he calls identification a mind virus. So identifying mm -hmm. things, equal signs, is actually something that causes mental illness because reality, there are no things in reality. There are simply um, relations that saturate into relata. There are things passing over to overness and so on and so forth. So Alfred Korbasi, this is the main point. He says, if you have Roman numerals and you're faced with the problems of modern physics, you will go insane. You have to because the symbolic will not allow you to do it. And in your effort to try, you will you'll lose your mind. And that's why he's talking about there's an inevitable relationship between science and sanity. Mm. If you have the wrong science, you will not be sane. Well, guess what? Philosophy is making sure you have the right symbolic. You have the right framework. If you do not. You may be you may be using Roman numerals to understand a world where you need um, much more. You need calculus. You need mm. new digits. Philosophy makes sure that you have a symbolic to understand the world that you're in, that if you don't have the right symbolic, you will lose sanity or you'll go into like revolution, like burn it all down, apathy, boredom and so on and so forth. Philosophy is making sure there's an alignment of the symbolic with the actuality. But here's the problem. This is the big this is the big problem and why you need the meta move of philosophy. If you are using the wrong symbolic, then how would you learn you're using the wrong symbolic except using the symbolic that is wrong, right? So you're, if, you're, if all you've got is Roman numerals and Roman numerals are literally your problem, all you have is Roman numerals then. How do you escape the enclosure, right? So what Korobosky is pointing out is that all symbolics, and it's impossible to have thought without symbolics, all symbolics have an enclosure structure. They enclose on themselves. How do you think beyond an enclosure you don't know you're in, is the question. 
well, this is the benefit of sociology and globalization and networks and coordination systems because you suddenly, oh, wait, I never read. Who's Hegel? Yeah. You suddenly are bumping in the other, the other, the face, the leaveness, the encounter, the surprise, the, the running into the unexpected. These are the ways to suddenly find out you're in a symbolic you didn't know you were in. But here's the issue. For most of history, the best chance you had to find out you were in an inefficient, um, insufficient symbolic was to go to college or to know somebody, or to happen to have a wise man in the village. Well, if social capital is gone, if there is no society, you have very little potential unless you have money and connections and elitism or whatever to find out your symbolic is wrong, right? That's why the democratization of these mechanisms is super important because it increases the probability that the number of people who realize they're in an in, um, inadequate symbolic increases. And if an inadequate symbolic makes a new polis impossible, then the only hope you have for a new polis and new political action is the increased realization of the average person that they are in, in that they are in an insufficient symbolic, and in so realizing that they are actually able to think outside a logic of capital or a closed horizon they don't know they're in. But if you don't create the networks of the possibility of that coordination, then you do not increase the probability of people realizing they're in the wrong symbolic, except those who happen to. Have have elite connections or who get lucky mm. you're basically saying mm. it's luck well luck is not an effective uh, risk strategy one would hope that we would uh, try a better risk strategy than luck and basically when it turns out the luck doesn't work out you lose hope you say well i don't even want to talk about politics then right which of course yep. benefits politics i don't even want to talk about capital which of course benefits capital and different things so the problem yeah. this would this would i would say and i'll give it to you the true sublative revolution is the spread of a new symbolic, of a new structure of thought, of a new means by which to understand what is so that you come out of insanity and actually can get a sense of sanity that brings with it grounding meaning and, and motivation and different things like that. Well, that by definition is a social coordination mechanism. That is the act that makes possible a new way of thinking that then, of course, changes the polis, which then, of course, can change the political. Um, and so that this is the, politi this is the political work. Um, mm. It's just that... It's just that it benefits, unfortunately, it benefits the political for us to have a knee jerk against the word political. It benefits capital for us to have a knee jerk against capital, which is completely understandable. In fact, it's kind of weird because it's like David Hume talking about the return to common life. If you don't have a knee jerk to the political, if you think this is great, that's a problem. But then yep. if you have a knee jerk that you don't sublate into a focus on the society, that's a problem. So for David Hume, you need to leave common life with the philosophical ascent, otherwise you're brainwashed. But then in the philosophical ascent, you need to return to the common life in Kukri. Because if you stay up here, you're arrogant, you think you're better than everyone, and you become the intellectual class that controls the world. So philosophy takes you out of the common life, you see a new horizon, but then you have to come back, and that's the sublative, because if you stay up here, you become a tyrant, the philosophical tyrant versus the philosophical king, per se. Mm. And so you have to come back. So likewise, you go, you, you need to realize politics is broken. So you're rising out, politics is broken. Oh, I, well, I just want nothing to do with it. Well, then it wins. But you say it's broken. So let's try to return the polis so we can have a new politics, right? That, that becomes the sublative act. Um, and I think, and it, but again, for most of history, it wasn't possible really at scale. But now mm -hmm. I think the, the social coordination is possible. Yeah, I think, uh, one thing that that I always find myself going back to is Audrey Lord, uh, the master's tools will never, you know, tear down the master's house. And uh, I, I think it's, in fact, all we have are the master's tools. And if we want to dissemble this house, we we have to use the master's tools. We can't just disavow it. Um, and it it seems like we are creating conditions of possibility for an entire field of, of, of activity that just hasn't been possible for so long. And, and so, yeah, kind of overcoming the distaste um, of, well, you know, we can't do anything about it. I'm not going to waste all my time over identifying with, which I think in the past I absolutely did. Like I, I was uh, obsessed to the point of it, like it, it became a fetish over, you know, political alignment. Um, and, and that kind of, uh, covered up the fact that all I was doing was just supporting the machine and adding fuel to the fire. But because I took bold stances, it was like, no, I am a moral, <laughs> ethical, <laughs> ethical person. Um, and, uh, and 
using these these new tools using um you know what's what's available to us uh to create new possibilities and and that's the thing uh we're having our own kunian revolution uh we we are um i don't even think creating a new symbolic i don't even think imagining a new symbolic we're creating the conditions for a new symbolic to maybe emerge no uh I don't disagree. What I, I what I would say is it's the realization of a new symbolic that has already existed. But there it is. The new. It is. It's the socialization of the symbolic. Um, yeah. It's certainly like that's that's Hegel all the way because Hegel's like, um, no, if you think you're coming up with something new, it's probably at it's like State, Studebaker was saying, right? Like whatever's new is what's actually at hand is probably not new. There's actually the most revolutionary actress is going back. Because then you're able to articulate or find a symbolic that was already there, but that has not spread, yeah. that has not been scaled. So it's new in the sense of it, but it could become spread and social. Um, I, I think also the point on the extremism or over identifying like that's that is what happens because that's the only thing you feel like you can do is this kind of extreme identification is like because you're if there's no polis, what else are you going to do? Mm -hmm. But try to take a more strong moral sense and identify it as a revolutionary act. So the problem is when you split, this is the this is the trick of it, in my opinion. Um, when you destroy the social and you have the state and the individual, then the most revolutionary act is taking these extreme positions, which then the state is like, yeah, this is why we don't give individuals any power. Look how crazy they are. The the unfortunately, the populist movement, when it is not careful, is propaganda is propaganda against its own legitimacy exactly as the capital nation state wants because what else are you going to do are you just going to continue to have your time and energy taken the well you know profits are going up but wages are going down you don't you're well and also here's the here's the, the problem you have to do something right but you don't have the category of the social as i'm so describing it to think so you have to do something and you can't think the thing you need to do. That is a recipe. Exactly. It's a great Kafka story. Um, that is the recipe for trouble. And unfortunately, the, 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 the state benefits from that. Because if you can't think of the thing you need to do to sublate the state, then your realization you need to do something is either going to function to make you look ridiculous and, and benefit the state, or it is going to lead to a hopelessness and an atomization that paralyzes you and thus makes you irrelevant. Mm. And so there is a strategy in making sure that proper symbolic, the AB, as we might say, to align it with Hegel, is not scaled or known. And then funny enough, the people who do, it doesn't actually hurt the state if a limited number of people have, know it because they're just crazy. Oh, mm -hmm. They're just mm -hmm. weird philosophy people. They're, they're not legitimate. They have no social capital. So the state is actually it's great. You want about 100,000 people who know about AB because yep. it makes it look dumb. Uh, so why would you even try that road, right? Look at all these philosophy guys. They're such jerks. They're so arrogant. Why would you think philosophy can help change the world, right? You want <laughs> the 100,000, if you will, that seem to function as evidence against that road. The when useful actually, idiots. The useful, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so I think, I think we are in the age, in a way, where we've gone through a proper understanding of a critique of capital, a critique of the political, but now we are in a kind of splitting in the road. Okay, are you going to sublate it? Are mm. you going to figure out how to bring back the polis? Or are you just going to continue speaking about emancipation in a way mm. that benefits the thing that has enslaved you, right? Mm. We're at a fork in the road. And I think actually bringing up the master-slave dialectic is really important because what we learn in that is that the slave has all the power. But there's another side of this equation. You, you said it very well. The master has the tools. Slave has the power. The master has the tools. If the slave doesn't use the master's tools, the power doesn't do much. Yeah. And so, you know, the issue is that those, the master-slave dynamic makes the slave empowered, but it actually becomes a power that's almost like a fire without a, without a heat, right? It's a fire mm -hmm. that then burned down to the house because you have nothing to contain it because the master has the tools to contain the power you have. So yes, this is one issue I have with the, mas with the master-slave dialectic is actually a failure to realize that the master can benefit from the slave having the power. Because mm -hmm. what ends up happening is that the slave has the power, but he doesn't have the tools to do anything. It makes the slave look like a fool. Mm -hmm. You know, and that benefits the master, actually. So this, because if because if the slave has power in the Hegelian dialectic Hegel, uh, haven, but they don't have the power to do anything with it, it actually then seems to legitimize the master having control because the people that have ability can't do much with it. Yeah, right? that makes sense. Yeah, so that, that's kind of the other side of that master-slave dialectic, I think, is really important. So, so 
that means you've got a person in charge. Yep. To keep being in charge. Yes. He takes away power from everybody else. Yes. So everybody else looks like they can't have power. Yes. He stays on top. Yeah, that's right. And then the other issue is that well, and also if the people, quote, even if you talk about the sovereignty of the people, sir, the people have sovereignty, but they don't have any resources to do anything with that sovereignty. That's making it look like they shouldn't have the sovereignty. So I, that's correct. So I definitely think there's another, hey, Reed, we're not fighting over a bouncy ball. And mom's in a talk, Reed, Reed, mom, okay. We're fighting, you know, bouncy balls are so much fun. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it's, it's where there's another side of that master-slave dialectic I don't think is always brought out that's really important of how actually the master can benefit from the master-slave dialectic, even mm. if the slave has the power because the master has the tools. And yeah. so then when the slave can't do anything with the power, it makes it look like the slave is unworthy of it. And yeah. actually, that there is actually – you could argue this is what Zizek is saying with freedom as a kind of torture. You mm. could argue – that having power you can't do anything with is worse than not having power at all because uh -huh. it's a kind of psychological tension. It's a kind of, it destroys you, right? So if the master's like, oh, sure, slave, you have all the power. I just have the tools that you need to do something with. The slave is destroyed. They can't do anything against the master. And that, I think, is what the capital nation state has ultimately done. It's, um, sure, the people are the workers. Well, this, but this is also, you talk, when we talk about labor power, this is where I would there's a certain critique I would have against certain emphasizes on the workers have the labor power, therefore they can rise up, they can revolt, and they can do something, right? That is basically based on the master-slave dialectic of Hegel when Marx talks about the labor power and power and value found in labor. Yeah, okay, labor has the power, but they don't have any tools to do anything with that power other than the job. <laughs> so the only power they have is the only tool they are given is the power that generates the profit for the master, right? They don't actually have the tools to revolt. The assumption is you say, well, they have the power, therefore they can revolt. No, 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 no. They could have the power, but not have the tools to revolt. And actually that then means they're destroyed by that power. So that to me is where not adding that like you've added the second part of that master slave dialectic actually has significant impacts on how you think about marx and labor power because other because if you don't take that seriously you would say well the laborers have the power all they need to do is rise up that's what like a fire without fuel or oxygen yeah mm. that's one way to think about it that's exactly right hey let me yeah yeah you'll see this ball this is the ball <laughs> right here you want to see it you want to say hi to nance can you say hi? yeah i know we want the ball. it's so much fun hi everyone yeah i know it's a bouncy ball it's a good time now guys wait a minute wait a minute i'm gonna finish up here with nance and then we're gonna do lunch okay um Hook and I'm the fishing fish. hook and I got the fish. I should do, I'll do lunch for the kids. Oh yeah. <laughs> but um, I've enjoyed speaking with you. But this, this point that you're adding on the, there is just because the slave in the working class has the power that does not mean they're better off or have the tools. In fact, they could be worse off to have yeah. labor power. That's what I would really stress with the Marxists. The fact that the laborer has labor power could make them worse off. Yep. than not having labor power if they don't have the tools to realize that thing. Um, and that's that's what we're seeing today, um, yep. in my in my opinion. Um, but you're awesome. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I know you got to go. I I would love to stick stick around and talk for hours and hours and hours. But uh, I, feed those I beautiful enjoy. children. I will do it. Can everyone say bye to Nance and different things? <laughs> yes. Red. Yeah, we did. Don't hit the button. No, sir. Don't hit the little button. No, I'd love to speak. I think this topic of the social and the polis for the possibility of the political cloud realist, capital realist, social realist, and how there's an extension of the um, master slave dialectic that has to be very taken very seriously, um, yeah. I think is really important. Um, but thank you, Nance. It's yeah. really been a treat to have this chance to speak with you. I will see you soon. Yes, sir. Best Have a good now. one. Have a good one. Thank Bye. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okie dokie. Oh, my dogs just passed gas. And it is gnarly. Um, I just cut the little um, interlocution segment, whatever. I just cut a little intro to this, this next clip. And then I looked over at OBS and I realized I wasn't recording. I, I hit start virtual camera. I didn't hit start recording. Um, 
but it's probably a good thing anyway, because like it was long and I started talking about, um, gang members and, uh, and silly stuff that is super irrelevant. But anyway, um, Daniel, I love you. Always good to see you. Thank you, my friend. Um, and this next set segment or whatever is a long one. I believe it starts out with J Reg, um, the man, the myth, the legend, J Reg from the internet, mind you, um, and also from Canada. J Reg and Tony from One Dime, two Canadians. Um, and I think Kier makes an appearance in well, and I believe that makes three Canadians. I have more Canadians than you. Um, but yeah, so it starts out with, uh, with J Reg and, and Tony. Uh, J Reg had to take off. He had a lot of stuff to do. Um, Tony stuck around for a long time. That was cool. I like I like picking Tony's brain. Uh, he makes great content. I don't get a chance to watch his his, his videos, but I do know that they're good. Um, and, I, and I mean, I'm I'm not a reliable source on that. I just told you I don't get a chance to watch them, but I'm also telling you that they're good. But I do know that One Dime Radio. Uh, I, I do get a chance to listen to that sometimes, and I do like that. Um, and he's got his thumbnail game is fire because I do see the notifications on YouTube. Uh, I just never actually get time. There's so many things to do and so little time to do them all in. So unfortunately, uh, but I don't, I don't really watch many, many videos anymore anyway so it's not because uh, you know i don't want to tony uh there actually i have a huge watch later list and there are several of your videos on my watch later list but i don't get a chance to do it. but anyway as i was saying starts out with j reg and tony um tony sticks around we pick his brain a little bit we have a good back and forth um kira unfortunately had to go before they got a chance to speak and like i was bummed out i was looking forward to that um we haven't actually had any communication. I was looking forward to that, but I understand, like, what are you going to do? Sit, sit on your butt all day long and, and talk to people in a Zoom call? Who in their right mind would do something like that? Beats me. Um, next time. Next time we'll have a good convo. Uh, and I, I was happy that, sh that you at least stuck around for as long as you were able to. Um, Benjamin Studebaker, Cadell last join us. And this is actually when we were trying to experiment with having some crosstalk between the mainstream and the green room. Um, and of course, well played, well laid plans of mice and men, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't know if it went out, went off uh, as it was expected or not. And you won't know either until Dave actually goes back and edits all that stuff together. And that's something I don't want to do. He is the one who's going to do that and make it a nice finished product. Um, I'm just going to throw this whole clip on here, unedited, uncut, and you're going to watch it. Maybe you won't watch it. I don't know. But anyway, Benjamin and Cadell, come on. Uh, that was great. Cesar is there. Cesar was there for a long time throughout the day. Cesar is, is usually working, but he manages to listen and interject when he finds the time same thing with wukash he stayed up till two in the morning um hanging out on stream with us he has some great questions with benjamin and cadell i believe ian may make an appearance in this clip if not this clip then the next clip ian comes in he similarly was busy accomplishing things but he was listening um and uh i, th I think that's i think that's it Tony and J-Reg, Kier, Benjamin, Cadell, Cesar, Wukash, Ian, Daniel comes back at some point. I don't remember if it was during this session or not. I don't know. This is a long one. Uh, so if, if, you're, if you want a, like a long continuity conversation, I think this, this would be the one, you know, throw this one on, work out, take a little run, do your chores around the house. Um, or take a bubble bath um, or, or whatever. But yeah, like, so playing around with the medium and, and trying to force almost a spatial relation to, to the internet or, or to the medium or whatever. Um, Mandy brought it up at some point. I don't remember if it was during this segment or 
the following segment or whatever. And I think I mentioned it earlier in one of my earlier interjections, but uh, Mandy mentioned that the whole day, because she was there on the live in the main room and in the green room, she was kind of back and forth between the two, but she mentioned that this was the first time she felt the internet actually managed to simulate a physical space in that way that we're looking for living spaces, real people, persistent conversation, something that you are coming into, participating in, and co-creating, but isn't like this simulacrum of engagement. Like it is a real thing. And so you're going to come in on a conversation. Like imagine you, you share uh, an apartment with your homies. And you're like out at work or something, but all your homies are home because they have the day off. And then like, imagine you get off work and you're like driving home or whatever, riding the bus, riding the Metro, whatever, riding your skateboard and you're tired and you're like, damn son, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to get some of that good old bed. You know what I'm saying? Um, but you come in, you know, and you're all tired and, and like, maybe you smell bad or maybe you smell good. I don't know. Maybe that Maybe you don't smell at all. Some people like don't have any odor. I like to wear cologne. Uh, I put on cologne before I go to bed because I, I, liked, I like it when I don't smell bad. And I, in fact, I like it when I smell good. So I put on cologne after I get out of the shower. Um, and I, a lot of the time I shower like right before bed. So I get out of the shower, you know what I'm saying? I throw on some cologne and then get in bed. But that's totally irrelevant. Imagine you're getting home, you open the front door, and it's like, Bleh! you know, you're like, yo, dude, what's cracking? What's up? You know, what's up, Dave? What's up, Mikey? What's up, Ann? They're like chilling or whatever, and they're having a bomb ass conversation, and you're tired, you're beat. But you come into that conversation, and you can just kind of feel this like energy in the room of like, of like love for the moment, you know? And it's not this immediacy type bullshit, commoditized fucking bullshit that we get on the internet where it's like, come on, like, and subscribe and make sure you hit the bell so you don't miss out on our next live stream. And while there is definitely something important and special about being a part of a live stream, and we just witnessed it yesterday. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, the, the, there's a cheapening of like shared spaces there's a there's a, a perversion of simultaneity when uh when everything is like do it now watch the next mr beast i don't think mr beast does live shit watch the next hassan stream and you have to be there live and you have to be in the chat and you have to say some moronic bullshit and he has to fucking acknowledge you and blah 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 um but when you're in a room with people who you know and they're three-dimensional people. They're not screen beings, you know? They're real people. And they're engaged in the moment. And, and, and they love each other, you know, platonically. I'm not being weird about it. It's okay to love people. Guess what? Hey, knock, knock, knock. The internet, it's okay to fucking love people. It's okay to enjoy the presence of others. It's okay. Friendship is fucking okay. Motherfuckers talk about camaraderie all the time, but then they're like post-ironic, cynical fucking assholes, and they fucking hate everybody. But they don't really hate everybody. They're jealous of the fact that it seems to be the case that not everybody hates themselves as much as they hate themselves. So anyway, I'm rambling and I'm, 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 I'm derailing. Oh, that's right. So imagine you walk into the door and you feel the energy and you're like, Dave, what's cracking? And hey, how are you? It's good to see you. I, you've been working a lot. I've been working a lot. We haven't, we haven't seen each other in a week. I'm cool. And Mikey, what's good, man? How, how you doing? You called in work today. What'd you do? And it's like, oh, I sat around and hung out and took a day for myself. Oh, cool. What's up? And you, but you just feel the love. You feel the energy. The room is buzzing and you just plop in and you join the conversation and you listen and you get yourself caught up and you're like, okay, that's what's going on. I see now, and maybe you interject, or maybe you don't. You don't always have to interject. Sometimes it's okay to be quiet and sit back and observe because when it is a persistent thing, you can always come back to it. And maybe you don't have anything constructive to add um, at the time. But because you're engaged, because you're paying attention, and because you, know, you love it, and these are people that are in your life for real, 
And the next time you come back, you can make a call back to like, hey, remember? So like your, your brain is active, your limbic system is active, your body is active, and you're sharing space and la, 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 la. Anyway, that type of conversation, that type of shared space, hyper simultaneity. It's not hyper simultaneity, it's simultaneity. What we're doing on the internet with the medium, what we're trying to do, we're trying to create some kind of hyper simultaneity, some kind of non locative, local, hyper simultaneous. I, okay, now I'm just being silly. But anyway, coffee shop conversation, you know, it's already, you know, going when you come in in media res right um and then you take part and then you go because you got shit to do but those motherfuckers are still chopping it up and, and maybe it's like the conversation of theseus you know m maybe you sit down and one person leaves but a new person comes and then another person leaves but a new person comes and then the, fi the final original person leaves but another person comes and so you manage to keep the conversation rolling but you take a look around and you realize this is the conversation of theseus um, it doesn't make it any less real. It doesn't make it any less important. And in fact, I would fucking wager that it, it makes it more real. It makes it more important to us when we're trying to do things to rebuild the polis, like Daniel Garner is talking about, to build some kind of community. I got to find a better word because community doesn't say what I'm trying to say, uh, but it's close enough for right now. Um... We're trying to do these things. We're trying to rebuild a socius. Um, because ours has been taken away from us. So anyway, here's this next long, long clip. Tons of guests, tons of friends, tons of fucking fun. It was a disaster. And now I'm permanently psychotic. What a disaster. Damn. Yeah. Oh, well. We, uh, we didn't get to talking about, I mean, we kind of brought it up, but we didn't talk about why so many of you Canadians are corrupting the minds of American youth. And also, yes. why you're so good at it. Why are you so much better, uh, both of you guys, why are you guys good at what you do? It's the Canadian supremacy flowing through us, surely. <laughs> um, I don't know. I do. Why? Why? I, I, I'm interested to hear Tony's take. Like, are you asking why can so many YouTubers are Canadian? Like, I don't know. He's specifically asking why we're the superior race. Um, I actually think. Okay. Well, my my general theory for for that in particular isn't like why and they're not better or anything. Uh, it's it's probably just a matter of like. Um, I think there's a detachment. From American politics in Canada, a little bit that that bit of distance. That's probably it. Mm. Um, with, without being so so in it, you know. Uh, that's my that's my, that's my thought. I think it's because Canada is the most ethnically diverse country, mm. and Toronto is the most most ethnically diverse city. Mm. And mixed race supremacy. Hell yeah! <laughs> oh man, that was that was way better than my answer. Hell so yeah, brother. We, we Hell yeah, fam. Better, we we're better at everything. <laughs> yeah, we just yeah. have like high, we just have like mutts in this in this city, like me and JREG people who are like yeah, we we got mutt supremacy here, Arab, is... Spanish, and European, and African, and all sort of things. Yeah, I've I've kind of thought that it's because Canada just has like a better like education system, and like you guys are you guys do tend to be more media literate than Americans, uh, mm. because just in general, like you have better schools, you have more access to tools to learning how to fucking how to do this. Uh, but I, th maybe that's just like my rationalization as as an American um, looking up at you guys and wishing you would stop talking. <laughs> is it is it like, what is it like to have health care? Like, do you guys have universal health care? Yeah. I mean, people complain about the long lines, but at the end of the day, like, we don't have to pay money if you have a skiing accident. So it's pretty good. Like, the only thing is, it's underfunded. There's, like, not enough hospitals, not enough nurses. 
even we have this, these stupid laws where it's really hard to become a doctor or a nurse. So you have, we have, we let, we have so many immigrants and we don't actually use their talents. We make them drive Ubers. So we have really cheap Uber, but we don't have enough nurses. So we have like people hey, who are doctors, nurses. We're supposed to do the Canadian supremacy bit here one time. We, <laughs> you, you, you're not, you can't tell us, tell them about the bad parts. Well, you know, we actually have uni universal dental care. We have universal skin care. So everyone, yes. everyone is cute in Canada. Mm. Everyone's yeah. cute. We, we, yeah, we pussify all the men in Canada for free. <laughs> uh, Trudeau's agenda. Are there like private healthcare companies that are moving in to the market because they're like neoliberalizing and they're, un they're like intentionally underfunding healthcare? I, I different for the provinces, but yeah, hmm. like I, I in Ontario for sure. I, I but I wonder is that like because like that to me seems really obvious, but like I haven't got the generic like Canadian Ontario right wingers take on that, and like I wonder what they're like. Would they say no, like, or would they, they say would yes say and it's a good socialist. thing? They would say we're too socialist. Yeah, right, right, okay. Like, okay. um, if you look at, I think it's only Saskatchewan and Quebec that have a two tiered healthcare system, mm -hmm. and uh it's notoriously very difficult to find a doctor there, like a family doctor. Mm. However, if you don't want to wait in line to, you know, get an MRI, you can kind of pay to skip the line. Mm. From what I've looked at, like a two tiered system is actually the best system. If you really fund the public option, well, so like France and Italy have very good healthcare systems, but that's because they actually fund the public. Most of the time when they want to, do two tiered it's because it's a trojan horse for just privatization so they want to like underfund it and the problem is it's funded by provinces and provinces can't create money so pretty much like they're uh always scalping for you know minimal spending trying to balance the budget so they end up just cutting health care and uh, making rich people pay less in tax so that's kind of what's happening I think we're too socialist. <laughs> a lot of people do unironically think that. You know, Canada, if you ask the average like conservative, they definitely think that. Like JJ McCullough, who we've both, you know, frequently hung out with, uh, JJ McCullough thinks the CBC should be like pretty much defunded, like if not cut entirely. And the CBC is like, it's like you guys, you guys have NPR, except NPR just like is really underfunded. CBC is like the channel, and it's what hosts the prime minister debates. So like, yeah, it's the, the CBC is like public media. I know I'm personally pro CBC. I think it's one of like our more democratic features, but the uh, conservatives definitely like they think it's better when you have all private media. So that if they don't platform candidates, there's nothing you can do to hold them accountable. I think, and this is a hot take, all, everything you see should be CBC. I don't want any other form of media. You open up your laptop screen. You try to log into a Zoom call for, for Theory Underground. It's just CBC. You can't do it. You open up your phone, reply to a text. You get, you're getting an anxious text from your girlfriend. No, it's CBC. It's Paul Paul Dwyer from CBC, the, the National, and he's telling you about he's telling you what's going on. That's the world I want to live in, where everything is useless and the only thing you can consume is CBC. That's like pretty much the Soviet Union. Hell yeah! You just but, have one news channel called Pravda, and it's Pravda uh, called Truth. That sounds. I, hmm. I feel like we kind of already now a tanky. We already kind of have that, except it's not you know the glorious socialist regime it's amazon like everything amazon is just... socialist well a I mean people's republic of walmart I mean type that deal seriously yeah no it's it's a it's a brilliant example of like central organizing um and it's like but like everything is an advertisement for something you can buy whether it be uh, a course at Theory Underground or somebody's like silver, silver urine drink or some shit on Amazon or um, 
another commodity. Like we already have that communication is, is already useless. Like I open up my computer and unless I'm bending over backwards, I am seeing an advertisement. I am seeing propaganda. Um, hmm. I don't know. Like I, I, it's, it's interesting because you guys both um, seem like more genuinely excited about the future. Um, or at least from my perspective, like it's interesting to me, like the fact that you guys will talk about politics, like I fucking hate talking about politics and thinking about politics because it seems useless. It seems like we've already lost. It doesn't matter if you're an anarchist or a communist or a fucking reactionary or, or whatever, like it, it, it's just hard to think about it, but you guys both will talk about politics in a way that, that leads me to believe like you have more hope in, ex in I don't necessarily want to say like existing structures, but, um, I don't know. You managed to have more hope somehow. I'll go, I'll go first. I got hope. Hope in my specific YouTube channel doing better the more I talk about specific political issues as they're relevant on my YouTube channel, which is specifically referencing those videos for the algorithm. I got hope for me, for this guy. Okay, now you show Tony. I mean, kind of unironically, that is kind of same. Like, I mean, it is, it's pretty fucked because like, yes, I, I think because I'm, I've started this at a fairly young age, we're both quite, we're both pretty much the same age. And like, I have pretty, I, I, I know my channel is long-term going to do very well. I also cover stuff that ages well, like topics that are historical. So I have hope for myself, but you know, and I do, I, I enjoy politics, not really because I have hope for it. Mm -hmm. I like enjoy talking about politics because i'm autistic <laughs> like hell yeah brother hell yeah and, and i have death and it's where my death drive is kind of geared towards you know like i get jewish sauce out of procrastinating my tasks by reading mm -hmm. you know it's like it's a pr i call it productive procrastination Damn, like sometimes awesome. when i want to work on things i'll be like here's why i need to read this whole book and I just end up procrastinating, but I do get something out of it. Oh, interesting. I know. Okay. Hope, I'm not so sure. Like, it's hard to say because, like, events can change stuff. But I don't know. I think Gen Z is, like, I wouldn't say an illiterate generation. It's, like, post-literate. Yeah, yeah. In this, that people are, are smarter and dumber because we consume so much information. We're able to handle more, and we're, like, more versatile. And I think more cynically aware of certain things, especially power dynamics. Whereas, but like, we just like, don't have the focus or wherewithal to really sit down and read anything. Like, mm. I know I, I meet a lot of people increasingly who are like, they can't even watch a movie. So like, we're both zillennials. So we're like at the very tail, like where Gen Z kind of starts. Um, I think it's almost a little bit different from Zoomers. Like real Zoomers are born in the 2000s. And Zoomers, I find increasingly like the average Zoomer just has, they can't, they can't even like watch a movie, you know, they can't sit down. Mm -hmm. So One that's kind of depressing. Let me, let, let, me maybe, yeah. let me drop in here and say, next time you are procrastinating on a video by reading a book, because I would love to, I would love to join in and like consciously read a book. Because I am one of, I am as brain fucked as those Zoomers you're describing in terms of book reading. And that would, that's, I, I think that would actually make me read a book. And you brought a beautiful stack or I, I saw, I saw a beautiful stack uh, at the studio here. I want to, I want to, I want to read one of those books. Some of them are still there. I think there's, most of them I brought back, but some are still there. I think yeah, I brought so the theory, through. I brought the theory underground book there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll take a look at it. <laughs> remind, remind me. That's the power of a flesh space community. Yeah. Depends what, honestly, like people say like have a reading list. Yeah, that's good, but it's best to read what you're most immediately interested in simply mm -hmm. like what is 
driving you because you'll actually just naturally focus on it, I find. But the mm-hmm. hard thing is like a building a habit. Most people who don't read much, it's not because they can't focus. Because even if you read like 30 minutes a day, which isn't that much, it's way more than like not reading at all, right? So like mm-hmm. you just need like a habit. Like for me, it's the morning. Because if I have like, the day goes by and I do too much stuff. I talk to people. I have a couple conversations or I go on Twitter. My brain's too clogged to really read. For me, it's like I just read in the morning, fresh, like out of bed, you know, with a coffee. Hmm. That sounds nice. That sounds nice. Okay. I have to go. I have to go, unfortunately, because my booking schedule is terrible. Is this okay? It's perfect. Okay, good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for talking to us, man. Uh, Thank you. Okay, see you later. I'll see you tomorrow. I think there's... uh, Who else is in... Everyone else who's in here, you guys can go ahead and turn your cameras on. Um, We're just behind the scenes. Who else? Mandy, Wukash, Cesar. Uh, What's up, Cesar? So I know... What's up, Wukash? I, I think I, I always do come back to it. And Tony, I, I think you are maybe one of the best examples. Uh, you have like a, a capacity to think about politics that like it, it really does baffle me. Like I, the, the, you go into it to a depth that to me, it's just like, no, that's, that's fucking retarded. Like I, I can't do that. Like, and it, it is amazing. Like I, I think, uh, I love one dime radio and I don't get a chance to watch your videos, but I've definitely watched some of your videos and I think they're great. Like, I, I think it is some of the best video essay content out there. Um, but like, how are you able to stomach it? Thinking about politics, thinking about social change, thinking about I don't know, just resisting the black pill, I guess. Hmm. Okay, so maybe to answer your question, I have like a theory of intelligence. Mm. And that there's like components that, because I don't really, I'm, I don't believe very much in IQ mm-hmm. as a way of measuring conscious, uh, intelligence. And I also think, there's things that are not really related to intelligence that impact the way you use intelligence, the way you actualize it, right? And I think, because I'm not, like, I was never, like, considered, like, a gifted kid or anything, you know? So, like, people, some people think, like, I speak many, many languages or stuff like that. I do have a very good memory. Mm. I have a kind of very very good memory i guess that's the only thing there but in terms of focus you know i have i was like diagnosed with add uh you know when i was younger but i think will is a huge factor will Mm. is like not and i don't mean that is willpower i mean will to power like in a nietzschean sense you can manifest that in different ways and i think will is essentially what actualizes one's ability so, like, if you were to break intelligence into components, I think it would be adil- ability, knowledge, will, and what is the other one? Conscientiousness. So, conscientiousness might be, like, what people call, like, psychological intelligence, emotional intelligence, self-awareness, stuff like that. Also, just, you could say, ability to kind of think in different perspectives, think outside of your own shoes. Uh Ability is what I think IQ just is like ability is just what is cognitive, you know, and the reason I don't like to stress that too much is because that can change so much based on your health and diet and stuff. I think like measuring people based on ability is kind of very rigid and it's only a small part because some people I think are stupid and have very strong ability in our high IQ. like Ben Shapiro is probably someone with a very high IQ. You know, he can talk very well, but. He's just good at defending what are like very one dimensional positions. Now, knowledge also is accumulative. Anyone can really add more. Right. Will is like 
whether you essentially have the drive to actually actualize that knowledge. So I know I've met a lot of people who read a lot, but they just, it stays in their head and they kind of forget often what they know and they're not able to explain it. And I wonder what differentiates like those people who are really good orators who can teach it. And I think people who can teach it, it's because they have a will to like impose it on the world in some regard. Or, and I don't mean that in like an authoritarian way, but I mean that there's something in them that wants to tell people about this. You know, there's this basic instinct, like other people should know this too. I'm going to do that. And that's like a willful thing. It's an assertive act. So like willfulness, I think is highly related to assertiveness as opposed to passiveness. So people who are like have more will are able to actualize all those other aspects. Like they're able to actualize their knowledge. And if you're able to teach people things, you just learn it better. Right. Mikey says this all the time, like Michael Downs, you know, says the reason he loves teaching is because he uh, learns it himself. He like perfects it. So for me, the making videos and stuff was a way for me to translate what I had been reading and it sticks in my head way better. Or if I have a pod, it helps me learn, you know, mm -hmm. whereas it's, we can only handle so much in our head at a point in time. If you just have it in our head lingering, it'll kind of just stay in the background. You, you'll forget about it. So I guess that's, at the how uh, that doesn't really answer your question so much about politics, but about how I make these videos. I think that's a big part of it. Uh, and also, like what I mentioned before, like drive and jouissance. People have all kind of ways of getting that, you know, like they might eat a lot of food that's bad for you, mm -hmm. right? Because jouissance, I view it as like it's not in your interest. What's in your immediate self-interest is like the more Darwinian drive to survive. Whereas if I wanted to be successful on YouTube much faster, I would just do like, I would do videos that cater to the mass. I would do a video about the latest political scandal. I'll be a, do a video about <clears throat> some YouTube drama beef. That would be the cynical way to do it. Um, I want to do stuff in my self-interest. Like there's just way more things I, I could do. So I, I try the real reason, like I do what I do is because like, I have a kind of weird obsession uh, and I get like fun out of torturing myself, learning this stuff. Why it political stuff, as opposed to non-political, that's I think harder to answer. Um, but perhaps like, I think, okay, so politics is an intervention into history as I view it. So politics is an act of like a groups of willful individuals who intervene into history to like make changes. Like politics to me is not, I don't believe individual, like great men theory. And I also don't believe the idea of like the masses quote unquote make history like they do, but it's really groups. I think gr different groups are what make history and groups are like political. For me, I view religion as politics. That's why I study religion so much, like the history of Christianity and more recently history of Islam. To me, that's a political, those, these are political movements. They're pe groups of people who want to impose something on society. And for me, that's very fascinating, I guess. Uh, so like, I like to study that. I don't think I do politics on my channel. I talk about it, but I don't do politics. I don't have sure. a politics I'm advancing. Sure. Will I in the future? Maybe. But at this point in time, I don't think I have the answers to do that. Sure. So like, I want to like first figure that stuff out through, through conversations and through stuff that I'm doing through study. Maybe I'll, you know, do get it. Who knows? Long-term, I do want to turn one dime into a think tank, which could help a political party of sorts. That's not what I'm doing right now, because I don't think like what that politics is, is up in the air. Like, I don't think it's clear. I'm very skeptical of people who are like, we have the answers right we away. We have the and truth. Just, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was um, talking to, to Daniel earlier and, and uh, like in, in a sense, what we're kind of engaging in is political action or at least praxis. And I don't know if you say those are one and the same, but like, trying to study, trying to get educated, trying to spread 
um, like a, a structure that can support a milieu and, and can kind of support people on their individual journeys. Um, that is a type of political action um, that I think for, for me at least is far more satisfying than back when I was like an anarchist and I was fucking talking about, you know, this is the answer. Um, but in order to do that, we have to like suspend political commitments or whatever. And I don't know. I just, I, I think it's interesting. I think, um, like interrogating what we're doing with the medium in, instead of just making that sensational clickbait. Oh, I need money. I'm good at YouTube. So I'm going to make sensational YouTube videos so I can eat and pay my bills and, and shit like that. Like I think, um, I don't know. And, and it is like, it, it's all just kind of fascinating. Cause why, why, um, why don't we all just go get regular boring jobs and turn our brains off and not think about this because history, politics, theory, philosophy, all this shit is hard. Like it's hard to take seriously. It's, it's hard to, to stay engaged. Um, there's definitely drive, definitely some, some self, overcoming self-defeating i think i i thought of another better way to answer your question actually that you originally asked so i think there's one that is a selfless motive and one that is a selfish motive like at play the selfish motive would be yes i'll go back on that the wheel to power because i think people have different ways of manifesting their power you know, they say like intellectuals are people who fail at everything else, right? There's a, the, there's that quote. I think there is something to this idea that like, how do you best po bolster your power? And for me, you know, like I've done sports, but I was never like, you know, one of the, like the good ones. I was always kind of like, it, it's not something I would excel at, you know? Like I felt for me, the thing I was best at was like having a good memory and being a good talker. So I just learned a bunch of shit. And I guess maybe subconsciously, that's like a way of manifesting power for myself, like building this channel. It does make it, it certainly, you know, raise my self-confidence and all that. So I think there's that cynical motive in part, you know, and I think a lot of people actually get into activism for these reasons. And I think the most dangerous people are people who are not self-aware of this are people. I've never been an activist type. And I think that's not because that might be because I'm more a little bit antisocial. There's there's something about activism that always just made me cringe, to be honest. Like I've been to protests and I always felt a little stupid. Like I always, maybe it's the nature, even if I sympathize with the cause, the cause, I just felt like there's a lot of, there's some people there who are very genuine and there's some people there who are just trying to vert, like signal to other people to say, look how, you know, woke I am or whatever. And I don't know, I could always see that. And I found that so, something about that so just makes my skin crawl. I couldn't really do that. So for me, instead of like doing activism, I guess being a kind of creator, a writer, aspiring intellectual was more like something I, I could do. I, I felt more comfortable doing that. And the other motive is, I think, why people get into politics is a kind of, you could say selfless motive, maybe not, but it's basic. I think empathy, empathy mm. is a huge one for left politics. And this is this visceral sense of justice. I think like some people are inherently more political because when they see something happen, they just get a kind of like a powerful feeling in their body that just makes them think like, this is just not cool. You know, and uh, Marxists will always say we're not moralistic, we're materialist. But at the end of the day, politics is moral. You know, you can be a Marxist and say, this happens, exploitation, capitalism, whatever. But if you don't actually feel like something about it, you have to tell us what you think about that. What should be done? That's a moral question. It's a subjective question, right? right? Like the why socialism is a subjective moral question. And I think, yeah, like I know I, I have I've had this thing, thing since I was a kid. I don't know. I've always kind of empathized with. The oppressed it could be like my background because i'm half lebanese you know i've been aware of the palestine 
Israel issue for a very long time. So it could be that. I've had, oh, I was an anti-imperialist before I was a leftist, before I knew anything about leftism, Marxism, socialism, whatever. I was just anti-imperialist partially due to like upbringing, you know, knowing about the history of what the U.S. and Britain and France have done to oppressed countries. So I guess maybe that instilled that into me or something. So there's that, uh, there's that visceral sense. Some people have that more than others, you know, and some people have it and it's, it doesn't, I guess, get converted politically. Like it, they get stuck in a kind of, like the moral instinct is real. I think conservatives have it too. They just express it differently. Mm -hmm. You know, conservatives are highly like moralistic. They feel a sense of empathy. Like, you know, you see, they're like when that's why save the children is such a powerful yep. slogan with them and it works. So they, they just express it differently. Right. Uh, and, but I think that is what drives people to act politically. It's a sort of sense of like justice and a collective uh, compassion, I guess. And um, I don't know, like it sounds, it sounds corny and all, but I think like that is a real driver of what is political. It's like, it's, it's a drive to, get invested in an issue that's bigger than oneself. And perhaps there is maybe another dimension to that too, like meaning. It gives somebody a meaning in life. But I don't know, man. I recently, I was at the Toronto Film Festival um, and there was this movie called The Substance playing. So, you know, at the film festival, they show films that are way before they come out. I don't know when this is coming out. But The Substance with uh, Demi Moore. And it's like this really vis viscerally gross movie about how about like women aging mm. and capitalism. I mean, it doesn't talk about capitalism explicitly or anything, but it's like how women's like value plummets as they get older. And there's a substance people can take to look younger. And it's like everything about it, it's a meta commentary on like hyper, hyper real capitalism, like our new capitalism where, you know, it's like ultra materialistic, ultra, you're like you are nothing if you're old. You have to, you know, you have to be as like marketable as possible. And I don't know, it, it, the movie just makes you feel a sense of disgust. That's all I could say. It makes you feel an absolute sense of disgust at the system. And I don't know, when I watch stuff like that, sometimes it reignites my energies. Like before, sometimes I get disenchanted. I'm like, oh, I don't care about politics. Then I watch a movie like this and I just, I'm like, burn it all down. Like, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I put on the commie hat. It's like, <laughs> Movies do that sometimes for me, or like little things I see. I don't know if you've seen 1900, the movie by Alberto Lucci. Mm -mm. Robert De Niro's in it. It's a movie about Italian fascism. And it really depicts like the rise of Italian fascism in a very interesting way. It's a very powerful movie. And I remember watching that. It kind of like also reignited my like communist sympathies and antipathy it's fascism like I, I saw what i was like yeah you know this is not to be taken lightly i know th this is what i mean it, like politics is emotional we can all all people who study theory hate to admit this we like to say oh it's because of these logical reasons but these are rationalizations <laughs> at the end of the day it's because you see something and you're like mm, you have an instinct you know it's, it's a very all too human drive yeah the burn it all down i i, I find myself always going back to that whole burn it all down um because it's it's fucking heartbreaking like looking around looking at conditions it, it's it's too fucking heartbreaking to to like to face it um and i like i'm definitely aware of the fact that uh making this retreat into like detached theory is what I do to cope with the horrors of, of the world, but the world is fucking horrifying. Um, I don't know, Sasar and, and Wukash, I want to hear what you guys also have to say about this. You mean the politics question? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, for me, it was like, I was, it was the, like seeing the situation like world situation but also my local situation like things which were wrong with it and like the stupidity of explanations which like 
adults would <laughs> provide to me like I, because I was in middle school and I became a libertarian and like and it was because like watching YouTube videos of politicians like uh, clicked for me because they were talking about issues but also in this emotional way but also provided like structural solutions which were stupid like remove taxes do this do that it will be better but it kind it like it like clicked in my mind that you can you can like you can go deeper and i went in the like stupid way but it it was the beginning of the road for me so i would totally agree that it's emotional but it's also this like like Freud talks somewhere, talks somewhere about like the kid has the inherent uh, drive for knowledge, and Lacan was like critical of this, and he was like, no, nah, but it's because of the like the adults, like his explanations, like they don't really like it's not like the kid automatically searches for knowledge; it's the like dissatisfaction with what the adult tells him, and I think like when you reach a certain point. And when you are really dissatisfied, because like I have friends who like never went this way because they they kind of I don't know maybe they they saw things differently they didn't encounter particular contradictions and they just never got into politics they got into it when they were like adult and they had to you have to vote you have to say why you vote because you <laughs> it's like you have you want to get recognition for your like but like it's different that way. Um, I might change this in a kind of different direction where, um, I guess thinking more on a day to day experience of what politics could then grow out of where me, me and Nance and, um, um, our other fellow traveler, Christopher, uh, we started doing um, exegetical readings of Emmanuel Levinas. Um, and something I didn't really understand at first, and then like kind of dawned on me as we like read more and more, um, was Levinas proposing that we kind of have like our, our, for lack of a better way, we have our materialness of each of us as individuals. Um, but also we have this other side of us, which is our infinity. And Levinas is arguing that no matter what you do, you could you could imagine the other person as being their full material self, and that's what they are. Levinas is saying there's also this infinity side of them, their metaphysics, their metaphysical self, in a sense. And um, in that sense, you can't, it's because it's infinite, you can never like reach it really. And in, in this specific sense, you can't, you can't focus on the particularities of, of another person um, to get to their fullness, so to speak. Um, and so I don't know, that's just been like, I think about that with uh, anybody who annoys me throughout my daily life, right? Is like, okay, even if even if I, it's like so hard to uh, try to uh, um, connect with anyone or like maybe the specific person who like, I feel like I almost don't have anything in common with or that I can't get along with. If I were to take a Levinasian politics, Ultimately, I would know that, okay, I have an infinite self, they have an infinite self, and that's at least the most basic thing that um, that could be shared. And so, I don't know, th that then that's kind of gotten me started to think about, like, what does it mean to try to connect with people and projects in a in a sense where you don't have to necessarily agree with the particularities of them as well uh but you know i don't know if if this can be extended to a politics necessary for levinas but um i don't know it, it, it's just been a challenge and um we're gonna we're gonna continue reading through 
that later on in the year, but um, just wanted to throw that out there. I like that. I, I, uh, I fucking love Levy Nas. Um, there's something that is very intuitive, almost like easy to take for granted where it's, it's just like, yeah, well, people can't be reduced to their, uh, you know, their circumstance and their existing conditions. People, people really are this track that projects out ahead of them temporally. Um, and, and it, it does speak to the, you know, think of the kids, save the children. Like that is an appeal to their potential, their field of potentials. Um, so it's super intuitive. It, it's, it's like, we do take this, uh, um, you know, virtual potential, um, for granted while almost always flattening out and instrumentalizing people, um, Oh, you're just a you're just a shitty conservative, or or you're just a wacky communist, or oh, you're just a this, oh, you're just a that. Um, and the medium, the internet, just kind of accelerates that tendency because as we all go through our day, working, studying, uh, trying to spend quality time with you know loved ones, trying to get laid, trying to get fucked up, whatever, like all this shit we go through, uh the internet provides this background environment where everybody just props up our already existing worldview and our already existing perspective where I think I'm a good person. Of course, I'm a, uh, it got super popular, at least in America to be a progressive and, and to talk about like, yeah, we're progressive liberals. Racism is bad. Sexism is bad. Homophobia is bad. Like making all these moral proclamations uh, and then just taking it for granted, but not ever really considering, well, what does that, what does that mean? What would a just society entail? What would that look like? And how would that function? And what about exploitation? And what does it actually mean? Um, yeah, and I, I don't know. Like, it, I don't blame anybody for getting stuck in this routine. Um, because it is the situation everyone finds themselves in. Like we are in this postmodern fucked up hell world where nobody has the time to take a step back and breathe and think and really interrogate these things. But also at the same time, things are accelerating. I mean, there was another dude just the other day trying to kill the president or the ex-president or former president or whatever like and you know good for you buddy uh, I, I wish you luck next time but also that's absurd like i don't want to live in a world where assassinations are are happening like there there should be something um here in the imperial core like there should be some benefit there, there should be safety there should be stability there should be something um, here, you know, not to mention everywhere else, the, the rest of the world that, that kind of supports what goes on, um, things are getting worse. Things are getting more fucked up. The world is on fire. We are on a, like a, a one way road. Uh, we're locked in on a crash course with, with ultimate doom. And we're all pretty soon going to be replaced by robots and algorithms. Um, I don't, and, and that's like, I always find a way to talk myself back into the black pill always like, but, um, I know it's wrong. It's almost a guilty pleasure. Like it, 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 it almost is like a disavowal and just like, Ooh, yeah, fuck it. We're all doomed. We're all going to die anyway. So, so let's just have this dance party at, at the end of the world. Um, but there's like an internal resistance and that's probably just like reflexivity where I, I realize I'm full of shit and I don't want to be full of shit. I want to be better than that, but I don't see like, I, I, I don't see a course, a practical course of action that can change anything. This is why I stopped going to protest. This is why I, I, you know, I stopped saying a cab, um, because I realized it's not doing anything. And in fact, it's making things worse. But I mean, and, and that comes to 
experimenting with the medium and, and trying to like situate, situate myself, you know, tur turning, turning the critical eye back on myself rather than, than everyone else. I don't know. It's so good right. to go into the black beer mode. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're uh, getting at a contradiction between philosophy and politics. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's, and that's something I talk about a lot increasingly. At uh, some point, I might even write a short little book on it. Um, the various thinkers who have looked at this contradiction a lot. One is Leo Strauss. Yep. He calls that the political theological problem. Now, this is a, it's been dealt with by philosophers, very rarely by leftist thinkers. And philosophy and politics being a contradiction might seem obvious to us, but the implications of this distinction are pretty massive. Like, first off, philosophy is all about questions. Politics is all about answers. Mm. Now, you've already divided the population in that distinction. Politics is a mass activity. It's about the common. It involves the many. Philosophy, by its nature, is very exclusive. I would say it's an anti-social activity. And why that is, you could make, you could speculate various reasons. Some could say some people just aren't smart enough. Or you could say people don't have the time energy. I think that would be a safe guarantee as to why. Because I think time energy and intelligence are like extremely linked. You know, when I was working a nine to five job in the office and mind you, like I still had like a little more leeway as to messing around and sometimes like even reading stuff, just working nine to five and having to do what I, I saw at, at that time, meaningless work. This is like a very much a PMC job that I was working, but still under like starter starter wages but still like you know it's 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 comfy but it's deprives your time and energy and i did not read nearly as much theory as i did when i became a full-time grad student or when i became a you know like youtuber right so time energy is super tied to like intelligence like i remember when i'd want to come home from work i would literally i'd want to watch a tv show most of the time i didn't want to like you know watch a Chris Catrone interview. <laughs> like, although I did listen to Chris Catrone interviews, but certainly not as much as I would have liked. You know, I, it's super linked. So, what I mean, for whatever reason, mo philosophy is just inaccessible to a lot of people. I do think part of it, though, is also a personality category. Mm. I think that there's some people who, so I would put this category with a grain of salt, but I think. Ten tenacity, mental tenacity is a big factor. Like there's some people who just can't cope with contradiction as well. Mm -hmm. And that might be due to a lot of reasons. They might have like simply way more trauma involved that where like if they like slightly punch in their reality a little bit, like they question their basic norms, it could throw them into the abyss very fast. It might give them a psychotic break. Who knows? You know, I think it's like, Studying philosophy is a lot like psychedelics in a certain sense, like that, you know, you're kind of really questioning a lot of what you take for granted. You're going to have to accept that as a risk. Like if you're seriously doing philosophy, I know some people do philosophy, what they call philosophy is really like, I don't know, reading like some kind of political manifesto that's, that's different or, you know, self-help. Mm -hmm. But like philosophy, right? Proper philosophy, the, the stuff that you guys all do, studying real philosophers who are questioning our basic assumptions. I mean, this is not comfortable for a lot of people. You have to have, a, it takes a certain kind of person who they're not just going to like break mentally at that. You know, and I think a lot of people intuitively know if they will and they avoid it. Mm. You know, I've noticed that people, 
there's two kind of people who say, I don't like, I'm not just into politics, right? There's the kind of person who says, I'm not that into politics because they're burnt out, mm -hmm. right? And there's a the kind of person who, when they say they're not that into politics, what they really mean is I'm not into thinking. And I think we've all met that kind of person. Mm. Do you know, like, I would say it's actually probably the majority. You know, in the sense that, like, if something is too, they, it's effort. Thinking is effort, you know, and you have to kind of enjoy that. So, like, philosophy is very narrow as to who it allows. And I think the problem as to why philosophers make bad politicians and why politicians sometimes make bad philosophers is because often philosophers think like they try to do politics through philosophy and you just can't, you know, so this is the problem. Even if there'll be these contradictions, reality is complex, <clears throat> reality is complex. A successful politics will have to water it down. Mm -hmm. It will have to have a grand narrative. It will have to have some kind of like big mass appeal, unifying slogan it'll have to be aesthetic it'll have to appeal to all these limbic psychological factors you know and i i engage in this to some extent not in so much like you know building a political movement or anything like that or involved in politics but engaging in these psychological things it's how i've kind of compensated for the density of my content because like a lot of the content i do would not normally succeed on youtube but over the years i've gotten very good at marketing learning from these YouTubers. Like I have to use clickbaity titles. I have to, you know, start off with the less complex stuff and less counterintuitive stuff, and then gradually go into the more counterintuitive stuff. So uh, philosophers, you know, don't do this because philosophy is, 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 you know, it's a high barrier to entry. Um, it's it's a whole different task. And I guess, you know, this is the thing I've discussed with Dave. I have a bit of my criticism of Dave sometimes is Dave thinks too much like a philosopher. And he like sometimes takes that judgment politically. And I think you can't judge political mm -hmm. movements in that same way. Like he'll sometimes say like, oh, all you have the answer is no, you don't. It's like, yes, Socrates, obviously, <laughs> right? But they killed Socrates to preserve the noble lie. You know, and this is what Plato understood. Like Plato has this like double component to his work. Like he has the political and the philosophical. And he always, you know, compares the ideal and the real for this reason. So I don't know. This it's just like some thoughts I have, I guess, because yeah, sometimes I think Dave with Theory Underground, I th I think it's best if it is just like a philosophical project, which I think it is. Mm -hmm. But sometimes he kind of like judges other actors. He'll be like, all these people are selling a thing. They're doing politics. They're selling it. And of course, that's what politics is going to be that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you can critique that. But the fact that they're making it simple, I I'm kind of cynical. And I think that's inevitable. I think if I eventually try to come up with, you know, if I settle on like a political movement for a certain country or whatever, Canada, US, because I'm a dual citizen, and those are the two countries I really am most interested in. I'm gonna, I would have to create a simp more simplified message, but I'm not at the point where like I have that, so I don't really, really. Do yeah, that. yeah, I, I think, um, like what we're doing is expressly anti-political. Like it, 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 we're not doing politics. A lot of us um, come from maybe a political background. Maybe some of us are, are engaged in political action. But yeah, like this is an anti-political project because um, politics, politics isn't real. Like how birds aren't real, how that took the internet by storm. Politics also isn't real. Uh, at least currently actually existing politics. They're all psyops. <laughs> Whether they were crafted to be that or not, like what exists right now, which is why going back to, to Rock Hill, like when I read the CIA and Frankfurt School piece, I was like, well, he can say all this about like the actually existing left right now. But to say it about the Frankfurt School, that, that's no, that, that's incorrect. But 
I don't disagree that all the shit happening today uh, are ops. Um, but yeah, like I, I hope I die before, before politics becomes relevant again. Because the world will have to go through intense change for them to be not relevant. Like it is relevant. It is real. Uh, uh, words have consequences. Like, act, like horrible things are happening right now due to politics and, and due to people's like political beliefs and commitments. Um, but as far as like emancipatory politics, um, many, many, many things are going to have to change before, you know, utopian socialism becomes an option on the table. And I won't settle for less than utopian socialism. Sorry. Like I, I'm, I'm not into that. Um, but I don't know. But again, I have a privileged position. I have, you know, relative stability. I, I can take up this position. Um, and there are people who can't, there are people right now who are suffering and, and they need, they need like actual change and it's fucking, it's horrifying. I don't know. Now I'm getting all bummed out. I, I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> someone else say something happy. Uh, Nance, well, I don't know if this is happy, but, um, remind me, um, if, uh, if we're, if we'll be able to meet up soon, um, remind me to bring my book called Desert along with me. Um, just because I think it has an interesting take on, uh, something like, catastrophe or collapse and how that can be looked at in a different way as instead of just uh it's only it's only one way to look at it um but the book's called desert um and uh the the thing that you were just mentioning about the socialist utopia um and it made me think of a comment you had when uh, we kind of mentioned Star Trek with Levinas, mm -hmm. um, how you were talking about the next generation is is what you interpret as the vision of what communism basically is supposed to be in space future. Um, and, you know, like, there's still conflicts between worlds in that future. There's still tragedies that happen. Um, you can't trust a Romulan, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, I know what you mean of there's like a certain, a certain vision of like, oh, this is what human life could look like. Um, and maybe in like, you know, material ways and maybe how that affects how the society is structured. But then you were saying the the next iteration, um, Deep Space Nine, that you were saying that's like the the neoliberal uh, kind of perspective of the future. Um, <laughs> and I don't want this to turn into a Star Trek thing necessarily, <laughs> uh, but more of um, how there is just like possibly different visions of how the future could be um, even if we're not, we're not going to be able to see it ourselves. We had to look at maybe our own futures for now, but we could also, you know, still talk about stories of what um, other futures could be too. Yeah, I. Uh, th that's valid. Like the, who knows what the future looks like, and, and the fact that we, like, we can't say. Is it Star Trek or, uh, I don't know, or is it something else? Is it <sighs> what we have right now? Is it, is it just more social democracy, more, you know, more attempts at ethical capitalism? I don't know. Um, which is why, like, yeah, that's not the game I want to play. Like, I, I don't want to think about politics. I don't want to have to care about politics. I just want to read. Marx 
and Durkheim and Levy Noss and sit back in my air conditioned house and, and like hide from the world. Um, I don't know. Damn. We got a lot of people. Oh, can I say something, Nance? Yeah, indeed. Please do. <laughs> right on here. I'll start my video. I Hell look yeah. like crap right now, but don't mind me. But, oh, I just wanted to try to say like something, um, I don't know, that could be uplifting, right? About like the the life of the mind and all that stuff, right? Like, uh, I just kind of started reading more widely. Um, so, because uh, I had always like identified as being like on the left and uh and then I was like kind of well not kind of but because of Dave you know I was like uh I'm not on the left you know I'm I'm just gonna be like free you know so I I started like reading more and more widely so like I just got some books in the mail so I like I'm reading like right people left people so I just got this book here I don't know if you could see this but I got Julius Evola Oh. <laughs> uh, meditations on the peaks mountain climbing as metaphor for the spiritual quest and then i got this other one frederick schiller i'm not saying it right frederick schiller um I, i'm always so bad with this wait oh yeah on the education aesthetic education of man and um this one's really cool because he goes into um talking about like the drives and he does like a sublation where there's like you know kind of like the sensual drive and then there's the the spiritual drive and if you have like both of those together um it creates a third drive called the um like by sublating both of them the play drive right so like the play drive could kind of like give us hope and uh, it kind of relates to Levinas a little bit because the play drive is kind of like, uh, um, it, it, according to Schiller, he thinks, this is in his 14th letter in here, he thinks that um, we can sublate time. So like by play, like the ludic drive, we can like sort of become our full destiny as humans. So that's uplifting, right? So we've got like kind of more of the, the, the German, uh, you know romanticism thing and then the of course julius of Ola is super right wing and then i got i just got this so i'm excited and then i got um oh yeah like long Ginus on the sublime so that so that'll be nice so I'll, I'll be like reading on the on the sublime so yeah just read wildly kids yeah <laughs> I, sorry for my face in this thing i don't but yeah okay go right I, on nance <laughs> i like it read widely um read read yeah read critically and read enthusiastically right uh i like that thank you mandy um mm. kier just got here hello kier dave just popped in there's cadell what's up cadell benjamin's, benjamin's here hey benjamin everybody's here hi everybody <laughs> the back room just became the front room, but we're not live right now from my side. Are you recording right now, Nance? Uh, we are recording, not streaming, but I am recording. I can edit all this out if anyone objects. Okay. Yeah, no. A anybody who's here, definitely leave if you are going to make him edit. It. <laughs> um, we don't do private things. So uh, really quick, uh, we wanted to do something experimental, all right? And uh, to that end, uh, we've got two people here, the two guests for the next hour, going to be Cadell and Benjamin Studebaker. Nance, we didn't get a chance to really figure out what are we doing as an experiment here. We just knew that we wanted to use them as guinea pigs and do something fun where sometimes they're together, sometimes they're separate. Maybe we're asking them the same questions. We didn't know, guys. We, we actually fucking don't know. I'm sorry, Cadell. I'm sorry, Benjamin. We didn't have this better, more figured out. Um, but I, but I almost like want to riff off of everything that's happened so far, the stuff that you guys have already seen. Uh, we were going to do something maybe on Britain and anti-immigration, but we decided, I mean, that to me right now feels like it would be a little forced. Uh, I just want to hear your quick 10 seconds each because we're about to be live and we'll, we'll just return to being live in one minute and 20 seconds. 
I'm cool with whatever you want to do. I'm I'm game. Have fun with me. Okay. Run experiments on me. I'm good. Sweet. I'm I'm just looking forward to the hour. I I can I can go with the flow. All right. All right. Um and Kira, you're gonna be able to hang out for a while. Wukas, you as well. Tony. Oh, Tony's here. Tony's here. Cesar's here. Fuck, Mandy, we got quite quite the crew. And I know Nance is like running to the little boys' room or whatever right now. So um yeah, I'm gonna buy us some more time by instead rolling another minute and a half trailer. Uh, so we have another minute to talk. But okay, off of what you guys have heard so far, Benjamin and Cadell, what do you guys want to talk about? And then when Nance gets back, he and I will brainstorm with you. I mean, I, I've been I've been collaborating a lot with with Benjamin the last few months. So like the topics of his book are good. I've also been listening to a lot of Catrone and and his ideas on Marxism. I also liked what what Tony was saying on on Marxism. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many things like seeing kids to intellectual milieus was hot. I think yeah. like the plastic pills intellectual milieu scene kids thing is like super interesting. Absolutely. Uh, well then, yeah. And uh, so we could talk about uh, scene to milieu and the conditions of possibility for large scale structural like would, change. I would say scene to milieu in the context of art, philosophy, and religion. And what does that look like? I like that. Uh, art, philosophy, philosophy and, and religion. religion. Anything either of you want to add? Uh, the only thing that really comes to my mind is that I spent the last week at a conference in Germany about... Uh, Cold War liberalism and post liberalism. So there's all kinds of stuff floating around in my head related to that. A lot of academics, uh, you know, like Anton Yeager, Patrick Deneen, Samuel Moyne were at that. So some of that stuff is floating around in my head. I don't know if that's of any use. All right. And we with the last 20 seconds, Nance, you got anything? Other than uh just kind of injecting some meta commentary on the medium. And like how we're using it, what we're doing, like what is our intention, this and that. But yeah, I'm I'm loving it. I think Nance's point about the difference in generations that we can't escape the screen being. All right. With that, we're going to be live in three, two, one. And welcome back, everybody, to Theory Underground. This is the Epic Marathon live stream, and this is the first time of today that we are officially in the green room on the live side. Hey, everybody, go ahead and wave. Say hello to the audience. We've got Tony from One Dime. We've got Nance and myself, of course. We've got Cesar. We've got Kier, who was just on. We've got Benjamin Sudebaker and Cadell Last, as well as Wukas, who we stayed with, and he was a key organizer uh, for the tour uh, when we were in Europe, as well as Mandy, who traveled several hours to come visit us uh, for the event at Prospero's Bookstore when we were in Kansas City, Missouri, with Michael Downs of The Dangerous Maybe, who might still be here in the chat, actually, and he'll be on after this session. And so... Um, with this hour, we wanted to do something fun and experimental, which was uh, we know that uh, Benjamin Studebaker and Cadell Last, good friends of this channel at this point who we've collaborated with extensively, are both uh, – they've both been talking themselves, amongst themselves, together over time. And that's kind of why I was like, oh, you know, as far as pairing Cadell somewhere, I was like, where, where to pair Cadell? Like we want to do an experiment. Where, where? Well, it's, it, as far as personality and – like make me a guinea pig goes, Benjamin was most down. And so it's what made the most sense. So Cadell, thank you for taking a nap this afternoon uh, so you could be here late, late at night um, in France. How you doing? Doing great. Great to be here. And, and always a pleasure to be on Theory Underground and, of course, talking with Benjamin. So looking forward to the looking forward to the hour. Cool. Um, and so I think what we've decided we want to talk about is 
the idea of the theory and or political and or philosophy and or literary scenes, these are not all the same thing as Walter Ben Michael said when we had him on, uh, the scene, whatever it is for us, I think it's this kind of intersection of politics and theory and philosophy. Um, it being a scene, we talked about it kind of being like the hot topic for people who don't have money to spend at the mall, right? That was kind of coming up uh, when we were talking to JREG. And so uh, thinking about bringing bringing the scene to a milieu mm -hmm. in critical media theory terms, what are the conditions of possibility for doing that? And then the big question mark, why, why, do, what brings us all together in terms of wanting to, to do that? Well, it's large scale structural change. If we just keep it very simple at a, whether that means we're recovering anarchists and therefore Marxists or recovering Marxists and therefore what, um, we're, we're accelerationists with a, some weird spin on it. I, there's a bunch of different people of, of various tendencies here. Um, and I, I guess I, I want to open it up really quick to everyone who's not Benjamin or Cadell and hear what you guys have. Is there anything that either of you are excited to hear them elaborate on in, in relation to those topics? I got to say, um, I am, <clears throat> I, I'm excited to hear Benjamin talk to me about politics and, uh, and like potentials and possibilities and stuff like that here in the green room. We just spent the last hour kind of talking about, I guess I was like hystericizing about my nihilism with Tony and Cesar and Wukash. Um, and it's serendipitous that these, both of our current guests, um, have a knack at like smacking me in the face and, and making me put my nihilism away, at least for temporarily. Um, and I'm excited to hear Cadell talk about like the, the critical media side of it. Like, um, Cadell is also spent a lot of time thinking about the medium and, and how to use it, uh, against itself. Um, so those are probably the things I'm most excited about right now. All right. And then uh, Cesar, Kier, Tony, or Wukas, Mandy, I, really quick, going, going, gone. You've got uh, 45 seconds to say anything if you want to. I'm sure uh, they will say something very fascinating. And so I'm open for anything. <laughs> yeah, same here. Just looking forward to it. I'm excited about the topic of screen being and not being able to, like, Go away. Yeah, I've had uh, Ben and uh, Cadell on my show One Dime Radio, so I know they always have very interesting things to say, so I'm excited for it. Sweet. All right. So all of you who are in the green room currently, stay in the green room. Uh, Cadell and I will go on the front side. And then we'll talk for anywhere between 15 and 20 minutes. I'll give you guys a heads up. Uh, a couple minutes in advance before we do the swap. And then Cadell and Studebaker will trade places. We'll kind of run them through the same questions and then we'll reconvene for a closeout of like 10 minutes. And then Nance will send me those files. I'm going to splice those into this and then people watching it will be able to see them talk without one another present and then talking about the parts that they weren't able to say in front of one another. Now they won't be able to see it, ahead of that. So it is weird. And it's not quite what we're going to be doing at TUCon where they would be able to see what the other person said simultaneously. That's part of our goal with TUCon. But for right now, Cadell, you ready to go? Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm ready. <laughs> this is <laughs> <It's> what... <laughs> what is happening? Right. <laughs> yeah. How do I leave? <laughs> I don't even know how to leave. Leave room. Uh... Just, just like leave meeting, but down in the bottom, leave room. There we go. Same thing. Do I Cadell. press something? Uh, yeah. Do I press okay. leave room? Hit leave yeah, room, your, and then this. don't leave the meeting. Leave just leave the room. room. Yeah. Leave breakout that room. Yeah. We'll see you in a bit, Cadell. Okay. I'm confused. You don't have to be confused. We we don't have to go anywhere. We are in the right spot. Um. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> Benjamin, uh, I just kind of talked Tony's ear off a little bit about I think I was I was like trying to sell him on the idea of of nihilism and he was like no don't give up hope there's still a future worth fighting for um 
and you always it's not exactly what I said. But... Uh, no, it, okay, look, it, it's not. But uh, similar to like, like I, Tony, I think you're you're a realist in in a really good way. Uh, but and Benjamin, similarly, like you 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 just seem to have a way with thinking about political theory, political philosophy that stuns me because I can't do it. Um, I just want to give up. Like, like I get to the point where I'm like, no, that's gross. It's nasty. Um, we're never going to, we're never going to have any kind of success or anything. Um, but I know that you're not like a one dimensional optimist. Like I, I know that. How do you manage to, I don't know, not fall into the doom and gloom? Yeah, uh, for me, it's very much about erecting a distinction between positive despair and negative despair. You know, positive despair is about clearing away bad stuff that doesn't work, that traps you and takes all your time and energy away and uh, leaves you bereft ultimately, right? You have to get rid of that stuff if you're to do anything that would be of any value. And you have to get rid of a lot of that stuff just to even have the opportunity to think about what it would mean to do something that has any value. So there's this, this necessity of giving up on a set of things, right? Without giving up on life itself, without blaming yourself or other people or becoming you know, hateful toward yourself or toward other people. And I think a lot of people have a difficult time for reasons that have to do with their background, their uh, life experience of separating positive despair from negative despair. So once they start to take apart some of their projects and some of the things that they've gotten involved in, there's a slipping and sliding into the negative despair and into the hating themselves forever believing in it, hating other people for making whatever it was that they believed in not tractable or not workable. And then this becomes very much about targeting bodies, targeting individuals, either yourself or somebody else. It's, it doesn't matter which one, they're both equally uh, destructive on a spiritual and psychological level. And so then the positive despair becomes a psychological malaise, a mental illness. And this is the, the difficult thing. I don't know that everybody is constituted in such a way that they can handle the positive despair. And so a lot of people's politics therefore become a psychological palliative because they can't handle the positive despair. And conversely, a lot of people get out of politics and go into what I call the, the four Fs, the enclave of songs, faith, family, fandoms, and futurism, these other areas of life that you can libidinally invest as a way of not having to deal with that despair because they're not confident for various reasons that they'll be able to maintain that distinction between the positive and negative despair. It's why I think to do politics effectively, you have to operate from a position of uh, psychological abundance you really need to have a lot of internal capacity, which is why some of these left-wing groups that emphasize the oppressed or the person who has had the worst possible experience as having epistemic authority, I think they're mistaken in, in placing the emphasis there, not because the people who are oppressed are not important or that their perspectives or experiences don't matter, but because the effect of being brutalized by the system is to make you less able to think clearly about it and it is to make you more vulnerable to these pressures <sighs> yeah so we i guess when we give in to that negative despair we we either just like give up and uh leave it all behind entirely or we join up with other desperate people and find ourselves doing things that kind of support the ongoing oppression that caused us the initial despair. Um, hmm. Would you say that... Oh, can I go? Yeah. Would you say that uh, positive despair is connected to asociality or like becoming a weirdo in a sense because like if you go into this mode of positive despair then you have to clear like make a clearing and then you kind of appear as an i think maybe as an precisely like an outsider and maybe that's why people immediately go into fandoms because then you are in a pseudo community yeah that's a great point i think a lot of people they're 
their politics becomes their social world. And so their sociability reflects their politics and therefore the ways in which they feel it's socially acceptable to think and to express themselves are molded by that political praxis. I think that is uh, that does make it very difficult because that means that if you go through a period of despair, you aren't just clearing away a set of political orientations or commitments, but you also have to clear out your friends. You have to change your entire social world. You, you have relationships of trust that break down and are dissolved, and you discover that many friendships are based on contingent political agreement. That's extremely psychologically distressing. For me, I, I have always wanted to maintain my ability to go into despair. And part of that for me has been to maintain a certain peripherality with respect to the organizations that I interact with. So I've tried not to have my friends be all people from a particular political bent or ideological bent. And I really value organizations that have a certain internal diversity within them in terms of the politics and in terms of the norms that people follow. Uh, but this even uh, extends to say, you know, the academy, you know, there are people in the academy who disagree, but they all have a set of academic norms that to some degree circumscribes the way they interact with each other. And if you only have academic friends, it becomes difficult to violate the academic norms. Uh, and I think it, it's true of a lot of different professions and occupations. If you only had, say, lawyer friends, there would be a set of lawyer norms that would start to affect the way that you would tend to conduct yourself. So I think uh, a plurality of different kinds of organizations that you interact with a plurality of uh, different kinds of you know, ideologies and positions that you interact with, and, and a kind of conscious effort to avoid getting too wrapped up in too insular a thing. So uh, I guess one, one of the threads of the conversation is like scenes versus milieus or like scenes opposed to milieus, or specifically we were gonna talk about the movement of scene to milieu, um, but yeah, in a scene, like uh, when I was in the punk rock scene as a kid, like all my friends were from the punk rock scene and it, it was like our social identity. Like we're punk rockers and I had, you know, my youngest kid used to come to shows with us like in diapers. and, um, But thanks to the internet, critical thinking kind of became a scene and theory and, and philosophy became a scene where we just come to consume content and enjoy it. And we associate with with other like minded people who consume the same content that we do, and um, and that yeah, that's just it's it's just a scene. We don't want a scene that kind of makes everything worse. Like we we really do want a, a milieu that can support robust um, movement, and that movement is kind of predicated on like deep investigation, you know, thought critical. Uh, disagreements with one another and, and like all this stuff so we can have everything kind of unfold as it will. Um, but I don't know, from my perspective, just sitting back, being an, an enjoyer of things, not, not ever having had the privilege of going to university. Um, I think it's probably easy for me to talk, talk shit about the academy, the university institutions, this and that. Uh, because I've always been on the outside. And, and so I can do this resentment thing and be like, ah, oh, it's all bullshit anyway. But I, it's, it's not all bullshit anyway. And I think um, you have a lot of experience in that world, being an instructor and, and being like a mentor for other people who are learning and, and being, um, I don't know, like deeply on the inside of, of the institution. Um, but is, is the institution or the university or whatever, is that a proper milieu or, or is that also a different kind of scene? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that the universities have lost some of their ability to support milieus over time as they've been marketized, right? The thing that I think makes music tend to be a scene rather than a milieu is the degree to which music has been a marketized space pretty much consistently, right? Uh, there's a tendency over time for music to uh, consolidate, for the big labels to get bigger and bigger and for it to become harder and harder for people to succeed independently. And uh, when we're talking about scenes, we're talking about you know, the people who buy tickets, the people who 
buy albums, the people who stream, what do they like? You know, and over time, there's an optimizing, right? So if you discover over time that people want songs that are shorter than two minutes and all have the same beat structure, you know, gradually over time, things become homogenous and there's less variety. Those kinds of forces have affected the Academy in recent decades and have stripped it of some of its uh, higher qualities that it used to have, and which it still has a bit here and there in certain places. It's not as if the Academy is all one thing monolithically or that the whole thing should be avoided. I think a certain level of participation in it is a good thing, all things in moderation, but I think I've benefited certainly very much from it. It would be ridiculous for me to pretend that I haven't. You know, uh, so definitely a certain level of interaction with it is a good thing. But uh, one of the things that we do need to talk about is how to create the conditions for a milieu. Uh, and that's something that if the university system no longer supports straightforwardly or only supports in rare cases of increasing isolation, you know, then we have to think about ways of performing the functions of universities, but perhaps outside of that institutional setting. So in one way, that's an affirmation of the university in its ideal form. And at the same time, it's a critic, a critique of the actual existing university. And that's the thing that I think we've struggled to, to keep together. A lot of people who have critiqued actual existing universities then assume that they never were any good or that they always necessarily are terrible, right? And then conversely, you have people who uphold the university and so will defend it no matter what it does. And no matter how bad it gets and how off the tracks it gets, they will they will uphold it because they will hang on to this possibility that it may somehow still perform the functions it used to perform. Uh, this is something I think we've really struggled with because it involves institution building. It involves actually finding the resources to support an institution in a kind of non-market oriented way. Uh, that's really challenging. And it's been a big challenge for people throughout human history to make institutions that are not just about customer satisfaction. Very challenging. Uh, but I do think that's something that we need to increasingly talk about. It's, it's a question that keeps coming up for me. And oftentimes, I end up talking about monasteries in relation to it. Yeah. And uh, is it theurgy? It's not theurgy. Theurgy? Yeah, theurgy. Yeah, 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 yeah. The creation, creating a physical environment that invites a divine presence or brings about the the a divine feeling or an openness to the the more abstract or the more conceptual or the new or the good or the true. Do you think? And this just popped into my head. Do you think it's possible to do digital theurgy? And and what would that look like? I'm certainly not closed off to the possibility a bit. I think that the, the cool thing about the millennial left was that it took seriously the digital as something that could unlock new possibility. And as much as that might be framed as premature or naive or short-sighted, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of the Gen Xers go, ah, you stupid millennials, you thought the internet could replace social organizations. And then I go look at their attempts to build social organizations, and those things strike me as out of time and utopian and out of touch and all the ways in which the old Gen X organizations struck me as, as out of time and out of touch. You know, in the Occupy Wall Street era, in the era of the Iraq War Resistance Movement, you know, a lot of these kind of anarchist, uh, anti-war movement organizations you know, often were pursuing causes that I thought had merit, but not in, with a level of organization that could build real meaningful power. So I, I think that one of the things we have is a, a need to take more seriously the digital, but also to, to push the digital to a higher standard. And I think older academics who were more baked in theory could recognize that what we were doing digitally was not to a high enough standard in terms of the quality of the thinking, in terms of the quality of the organizing. At the same time, because they were not organizing digitally, because they dismissed the internet as not important, they were becoming increasingly irrelevant and unable to reach younger people. And so as their influence over the younger people declined, they were only able to decry that and to critique it in language. They weren't able to institutionally respond to their decline. Uh, and so now that I, I think a lot of millennials have recognized the limits of the way we were originally digitally organizing, there's an opportunity for us to dialogue a bit with some of these older generations and think about what can we do to make digital organizing 
uh, you know, serious and real in a way that it wasn't before. And we may be able to get somewhere with that. I, I'm not sure. It's difficult because it's always changing. Young people today, they who are 10 years younger than me are aware of all kinds of things you can do digitally that are hard for me to do. You know, my technical skills are great compared to someone in their 50s, but very poor compared to somebody 10 or 15 years younger than me. So it's, it's uh, one of the things I've learned from watching this over the last 10 years and being a part of it is that I have to be acutely aware that my familiarity with what's cool will decline very quickly. My familiarity with the medium and with the ways in which people can be best reached will decline very quickly. And if I adopt a kind of eh, TikTok, who needs that? You know, that's just for stupid kids, you know, kind of mentality, uh, that's not going to help anybody at all. Uh, if TikTok is bad, then I need to in some way get involved and make it better. Mm -hmm. you know, I have to find a way to talk to people. You know, that's ultimately we always have to find a way to talk to people. You can't just uh, you know write things on papyrus when people aren't reading that anymore. Mm. Yeah, it seems like there are a lot of people who seem content to write on papyri, uh, and and not really do anything, but also do this like moral high roading of of like we are the deserving class of you know, proper politeness. Especially institutionalized people. If you have already achieved institutional success with a particular mode of expression, then on a personal level, you're secure and you're good. You know, if you have a good university position, if you have tenure, if you have a you know, nice job working in the media, you know, you don't have to learn new media on a personal level. It's only for your political praxis that you would have to learn it. And a lot of people are not really very motivated by political objectives, especially well-established older people. Uh, they will say that they are, but in practice, and I don't mean this as a critique of them or to suggest that they're lying or being hypocritical. I just think that as people get older and they get embedded in a certain form of life, it's harder to maintain that connection to these broader social goals that may conflict in various ways with the details of their day-to-day -day lives. A lot of yeah. this stuff I think about in terms of uh, monasteries is to do with form of life. You know, the way that we live, what is it compatible with? Not on the level of just thinking or arguing, but on the level of, of actual activity. You know, and the time energy principle is very much, I think, in line with this. You know, thinking about how do you actually get your know, energy infused time such that you can do stuff? You know, relatedly, if you are spending all of your time in particular environments, talking to particular kinds of people who value particular kinds of work, it's gonna be really hard to get yourself to care about or appreciate other kinds of work that those people don't necessarily value or respect. If I go to an academic conference, if you start talking about YouTube numbers and YouTube channels and YouTubers, people go, well, that's a bunch of stupid crap. Why do you care about that? You know, and conversely, if I you know, start talking about academics that nobody's heard of online who have, you know, nice Google Scholar pages, but no online presence, people aren't going to know what I'm on about either, you know, here. And there's often an assumption that because the one is older or because the one comes with real money that uh, it has more legs in society. But that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, you know, it was an eye opening experience and then i'll follow this up with a question related to uh we were broadly saying was there's this brilliant professor i had who has this entire theory of political economy called capitalist power and it's like a kind of rival to marxism and in the in the sense that it tries to fill gaps that marxism has and what blew what really blew my mind is i have a podcast episode on capitalist power and it's the most viewed thing on the subject and i did not expect that to be the case and I think more people ought to hear about this guy's ideas, but, you know, he doesn't really branch out in turn. He doesn't have a media presence, like, you know, how you do. I've noticed this immediately. Like if people, if you don't put it out there, if you don't really market yourself, quote unquote, like nobody sees it, nobody sees it. But I want to follow up with the question related to what you're saying about acting politically. This is a, might seem like a simple question, but I think it's overlooked. 
by most people, and that is what motivates people to act politically? What motivates people to be political? You know, aside from what Marxists think is the only thing that motivates political action being economic interest, but what actually motivates people to be political? Uh, me and Nance were talking about this earlier. Yeah, I think you have to run up against something that you are not able to do that you think you ought to be able to do, which is tricky, right? Because there are a lot of people throughout history who have been very limited in what they could do, but have not thought that they should be able to do the things that they're not able to do. So they don't politicize these things. They instead naturalize them. You know, that kind of uh, classic stereotype of the peasant, although not always true, you know, that the peasant just doesn't have very high expectations. So even though their life is very limited, they rarely politicize it. They rarely do anything with it. Uh, although historically, you know, certainly that this is a gross oversimplification. Many peasants did get political. Uh, I think one of the reasons why we have a certain amount of political activity today is that there's still this, you know, very recent in historical terms, uh, life experience of the post-war era. And of it really being the case that if you worked hard in almost any field, you could get a house and you could, on a single income, you know, afford children and you could get decent health insurance and you could, uh, if you wanted to, go to a university and study a subject that might not be a very practical subject and it wouldn't ruin your life. It wouldn't cause you to be in a ton of debt or unable to, to get anywhere. And we all know that these countries that we live in have gotten in raw GDP terms much richer since the 50s and 60s. And yet it's now much harder for us to do these things than it was. And I think that that creates an expectation of being able to do the things that people in the post-war era were able to do. And therefore we have a tendency to politicize those things specifically and to look for explanations for why it is that we can't do those things. But I think one of the things that could happen, I'm not saying it will, but one of the things that could happen is that enough time could go by that we could forget about the post-war era and forget that these are things that we used to be able to do or that people used to be able to do. And then we would stop politicizing a lot of this stuff. And I've noticed in the UK in particular, there is an increasingly an orientation of just normalizing, not being able to do things. A lot of people in the UK going, well, the NHS just isn't practical anymore. You know, in a competitive global economy, you just can't raise enough tax to fund it. And this kind of orientation that I'm seeing in the UK, I, I don't think is spread to the United States yet. Uh, and I'm not even sure that it's spread that deep in the UK. I think it is currently something that people who write for magazines and newspapers are saying. It's very professional class. I don't think it has gone down into the British working class, which still believes that Brexit should enable the UK to in some way respond to the crisis of the health service. But I do see this as one of the things that might happen. And I think it uh, it's a significant thought for directing our attention toward the need to bear in mind that it's not just a question of needs. It's also a question of expectations. I uh, it, it, we're actually going to wind up switching here very shortly. But I, I wonder um, if that were to be normalized, this like hopeless powerlessness here in America. I, I do wonder how that would affect um, the rest of the world. I, I mean, I still think America is the hegemon when it comes to, um, I don't know, emancipation or, or at least what emancipation should be and, and what is, <laughs> uh, what the future should look like. Uh, and if we give up on, on that, I wonder what would happen. I wonder how that would affect the rest of the world. And I mean, of course, that's bracketing out all the other movements across the world that are kind of dedicated to emancipation and, and that I think have a better chance at it than whatever's going on here in America. But just in general, for the average working Welcome. person, we are like the hegemon. Uh, so I hope we don't forget what freedom should look like. Anyway, what's up, Dave? All right, we're back. We're back. It's Cadell should be popping over here any second now. Um, and then we'll uh I don't I, I will have time for you guys to like say a couple things about the experience, but you won't be able to share what you guys actually said. Now, Nance and I will each represent you guys to the best of our ability. It, it, almost like the the Lacanian uh, student who's supposed to have 
at their thesis defense, they're supposed to have their own student defend their thesis uh, to the dissertation committee. So we're kind of going to do that. I'll try my best to sort of say what Cadell's up to. And the, the the opportunity to clarify will always be there later. Is is Cadell here? Did he come over? No. Uh, he, has, he has not joined yet. Let's see. How do we get him over here? Uh, he has uh, to see. go down to breakout rooms. Well, he, he's not here. Cadell, yeah. if you're watching well, YouTube. Benjamin, <laughs> Benjamin, you can come back on over with me. I'm going to leave the room. Uh, and I, I'm not going to click leave meeting this time. That messed things up last time. Okay, Cadell's in here. Benjamin is... Hey, is this where I should be? This is where you should be. Benjamin, are you still in the breakout room? Oh, no, I can't. Well, I hope I hope they're in the right spot. Anyway, what's up, Cadell? Um, yo, yo. How are you, man? It's been a while since we actually spoke. I know, man. Yeah, no, it was it was great having a chance to spend like two weeks with you, man. Yeah, no, I thought that was it was a fantastic trip. And uh, no, just keeping keeping busy, man. Just, just on my grind, man. Yeah, that's it. Grinding. Grinding, dude. Absolutely. Um. So what did you guys talk about? Oh, like, so I think most of it was centering around like the art, philosophy, religion, uh, triad, the intellectual milieu, scene kids to milieu. What are the stakes of that? Um, and then a lot of like philosophy of right stuff. Hegel's idea of family, community, and state, and that the links between those three things are broken. Like the link between family and community is broken. The link between community and state is broken. And like that dialectical model doesn't hold up anymore for like very specific historical reasons. Like, and I think specifically the community state dimension is like the most disorienting and insane. Uh, and I think that Studebaker's work absolutely centers that, like with the idea that capital mobility is out of control and there is no possi possible way to, to regulate capital mobility anymore. And I think that what's interesting when you read the philosophy of right is that Hegel has this idea that it can be easily contained in the community, you know, like family run businesses and stuff like that as like the backbone of community life and stuff like that. I mean, it, it doesn't function anymore. It doesn't, it's, it's a totally, you know, broken. And consequently, that's why I think people say, you know, we live in a post-truth world. Mm. Yeah, like we, live we, post, live world. yeah post -truth. we live in a post-truth world. Yeah, it's a post-truth world. It's a post-literate world. Um, it's a post giving a shit world in, in, in many cases. Cause I, I think in order just to cope the average, you know, the average bear has to take up this, uh, detachment, like things suck for most people. Um, yeah. And it's, it's like the world's not real anymore. Like I think the yeah. point with the screen being thing. Yeah. Yeah, like it's it we live in hell. And and we're all exhausted and like the the humanity has been like beaten out of every single one of us. Um Yeah. screen being. You've said that several times. I, I love think it. that's a super important concept. I think that's a super important concept. I've been I've been thinking about it for a while. Like I even like I mean it's it's worth developing it. Um, because I think like, that's what I see. I think that's the most salient thing when I go out and look anywhere. Like if you go on the Metro, if you go on the bus, if you, wherever, like everyone's on their screen constantly, uh, and you're forced to be on your screen in many ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also we're obviously addicted to it. And, and, you know, there's, there's a political economic dimension to it, but it's not only a political economic dimension. It's also like a psycho, it's something also like psychological, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're, we're kind of hooked into it. One thing I've done, uh, I moved recently and we're in my new house. And one thing I've done is I've made a point that my cell phone doesn't come upstairs with me. So when I, when I go to my bedroom, my cell phone stays downstairs. If I'm in the living room with family, my cell phone is in here in the office. Um, so it, it has kind of hindered my ability to communicate with people and and like plan, but it's, it's been a boon for my personal well being. Like I'm, I'm just not on my phone unless I'm in here and when I'm in here, I'm supposed to be working. Uh, now I'm not always working, but I'm at least supposed to be. 
Um, and I break that rule. Like it's, it's not an absolute thing, but like, it's a thing that I have done to try to improve my, my immediate daily experience, but it's also kind of silly. Like it, it's silly to have to set that type of boundary. Like, uh, and, 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 and it's never, and it's not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's something we're going to have to do for our whole life. Probably in some ways, that's what it looks like. You know, it, it, it creates this, but it also like, it, you know, I think it's also this like strangest contradiction and the strangest contradiction to me is like, it brings this miraculous closeness to people mm. like, like the, I can interact with you right now. Like it's miraculous. Like, the, and, 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 and the relations I've been able to build through the screen are miraculous. Mm -hmm. Like really? It's magic. It's way better than the social, it's way better than the social relations in the institutions. Yeah. No, it's way it, better. It is. And, and at the magic. same time, it, it is magic. But at the same time, it brings an absolute distance in that technically we could set up our lives where we don't really need to interact with anyone in, in our day to day life. Like, like, for example, like if you go to the grocery store, everything can be automated. You don't really need to go to the movies anymore. Like you don't need to go out anymore, really. Like you, you could like you could just say I'm not like you could just not interact with society anymore. Mm hmm. Like it's much easier to do that. It was impossible to escape it before. Yeah. I So it's it's super strange. No, it's it's uh the way it it's dude really wrote the last vehicle and I like I don't want to bring up stuff that maybe not everyone has read but um we don't we don't ever have to venture out into the world anymore. Like I can travel the world. I can travel the solar system from the chair that I'm sitting in right now. And I can get like high definition yeah. detail close up. I can get intimate knowledge of the, the, the solar system without ever ha having to, to leave and go out into the real world. Um, and how does that change your relationship to risk? How does that change your relationship to even anxiety? Like, uh, I sometimes struggle with anxiety and, and that, uh, sometimes it's scary just to go to, it, it is scary to go grocery shopping, but I don't have to do that anymore. Like I can order everything here on my phone, <laughs> uh, and I have think that my needs met and it's not, it's, it's not really meeting my needs. It's meeting some of them, but it's not meeting all of them. It's, 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 you know, what you always say, and I'm quoting you on this is, will anything human get out? Like, that's what you always say. Will anything human get out? And that came up also in our tour, like, and that came out at the end of the tour as well, which was beautiful, you know, but when you're saying traveling the world, traveling the solar system from, from your own computer, you know, like think about like 500 years ago, the real horizon was exploring the world. And like there was a genuine adventure, there was a genuine novelty there. You couldn't just see the other side of the world from your chair, you know. And then the saying is, is that we're 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 too late for that adventure, and we're too early for the adventure into space. Ooh. But I think that like, but I but I think it's false though. Like I think that in in some way, because I don't think we're actually going to go to space. But that's too far beyond the point. The point is that I think where the real adventure and where the real horizon is today, I think is going into the messiness of human relations. Yeah. Like is sort of saying like you can you can cut yourself off, but I'm not going to. I'm going to man you I'm going to create the context where human relations can happen in an unpredictable way, like a contained way, like there's some intelligence to the containment of it. But that we're going to figure out more about the human, mm. I think. Yeah. We have to uh, be interested in that. I think. Inner space. Um Tyler, whose real name Extimate, is Extimate space. There Estimate we go. Space. Estimate. Th there we go. Um, Tyler, aka Kyler Murray, you got your hand raised. What's up, man? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for knowing my true identity. Yeah. Uh, I was renamed by the big other Todd McGowan recently. So I, uh, in the last Zoom call, I did uh, uh, actually uh, type that in uh, and I should have kept it that. Um, Cadell, so. Uh, you were talking a little bit about creating a space for subjective destitution and uh um and then yes i was listening to you uh recently interviewed a guy named jim uh ex mega church pastor 
Jim Palmer. Yeah. And I guess my question is, um, I've been wondering about thinking of, you know, maybe something similar to this idea of creating a space where subjective destitution can kind of be lived with. What about also creating spaces where multiple big others can can tarry with each other? Yeah, and, yeah. And I could even see, like, you know, for Jim, Absolutely. His, his big other is fractured. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And for you, like, your big other of evolution – that was fractured but you're finding these places where they can coexist but yeah. even even if those spa- even if those big others haven't fractured there's still something about it's like and i'm wondering if capital itself has become the dominant big other that then squashes out the possibility of like kind of other big others um i think because i think together in the commons yeah, sorry. I, I think that because capital's the real big other, that's why we need to do the work of holding the differences between big others and like actually doing the work of dialectical self self mediation, because otherwise we'll get stuck in kind of a we'll get stuck in a trap of some kind. Like and, and we won't be able to like to me, the ultimate process is like, how do we like this is my question, just an open question of, of my life is how do I how do I include capital and my relation to capital in such a way as that socialism's more possible? Or like by socialism, I mean just more social space. It could be common space. I, I don't know the word. I don't care really too much about the word, but like I'm I'm just trying to point in a direction there. So like what I do now is I I ha- like, and here's the thing, like if I didn't start a business, like back, I decided in 2017 to like, you know, give it a shot because I didn't see a way in the academic system, like a genuine path, like to, to survive in, in that, in that climate. So I said like, well, I, I, I've got to give it a shot. But the point is, is like, to me, not to get identified with capital, to work through the negativities of it, but to open up spaces of, of more, you know, social experiment. You know, I, I don't know the, the, is the, the path or the way. And like, I think you need that battle, that competition of big others, or like that death of the big others, uh, in order maybe for like both the subjective destitution and maybe like, I don't know if I'm reaching too much, but like something like Holy Spirit. But what I mean by Holy Spirit yeah. is just like a network. Do you, would this be a way of theorizing what we mean by the commons or the public would be? I, I, I've been it's listening a place, to... It's a place where big others actually do come together actually meet and we just don't have that anymore but i think that's the importance of dave's notion that's why i like collaborating with dave is the notion of intellectual milieu like the intellectual milieu is not a scene that's the crucial thing like and i think that like another thing final thing is like i've been listening to michelle bowens i don't know if you know michelle bowens but he's a, a basically a commons theorist and he's a great he's a great commons theorist and he's even saying that the commons requires a certain mode of subjective engagement of ontological commitment that is kind of like a religious orientation like a faith like mm. and and the thing is like a faith because even benjamin studebaker says uh, in this space it could look like you're destroying the economy <laughs> Like it could look like things are falling apart. Like it's not like a co- operating according to like your normal measures of progress or advance in in capital. Obviously, you know it. it and 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 it's it's going to have like social disruption. Like it's you got to make room for like the mess of humans and like humans are messy and and it's easy to like and it's hard to forgive and it's you know it's it's you know and and so forth. Like just the you know just you know being a human's tough, right? Like and you know and I think like you know on on the one hand. You know, Christianity can be a real help, but on the other hand, Christianity can be a, a an obstacle, depending on how you identify with it. I guess faith in a human future. Um. Yeah, like why? <laughs> why do we have to jump through these hoops and uh, and kind of come up with? different differentiations of I am this, I am that. Why can't we just agree um, 
that we are already part of something bigger than ourselves. Um, I don't know. That's probably a stupid and naive question, but, but it's an honest because question. Because it doesn't fit in our head. Yeah. We have, like, we're too used to thinking everything that we're a part of should fit in our head. And, like, the thing is, is, like, to be in that something bigger than us, it's, like, more of a storm. Mm. I think. Like, it's a storm. Like, it's, 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 and, like, that's where I think, like, cybernetics breaks. Because cybernetics is about steering. You know, but like, you know, and this is the, this is the, there's some weird, interesting paradoxes of God in like the first uh, papers written on cybernetics by Norbert Wiener. Yeah. It's like worth going into like what he thought about God. I, 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 would, I would need to study it again, but. Yeah. I uh, actually, this morning when I was talking to Terrence, uh, Wiener came up and, um, and lumen i've been going down the yeah path. i know you like lumen yeah i've i've been because i i feel like uh i don't know i want to have a deeper understanding of of cybernetics and and systems theory and stuff like that because it's mega powerful yeah and the boat is currently being steered by like a headless steersman like just a dumb idiot algorithm um and we're all at the mercy of of some all powerful, like diffuse nothing, but but also it, it's absolute. Um, and it, I, I feel like it's kind of standing in between us and that larger non belonging, um, that uh, that we all need to kind of like encounter and, and, and get, get familiar with. But of course, I called it enter the alien. Yeah, yeah. Like this non-belonging is like enter the alien. <sighs> so developing developing milieus. Oh, here's Dave. What's up, Dave? Yeah. Wait a minute. Yo. Oh. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I I saw so, you on my other screen and I was confused. I don't want to interrupt you guys because uh I just wanted to let you know uh Sudo Baker's going to pop on over. Don't feel the need to repeat yourselves, guys. Uh, you know, you can kind of just keep going. For the most part, Cadell, I already told Studebaker kind of what you had brought up. Uh, he'll be working under that kind of assumption. I think there's something really cool you guys could talk about with traditional ways of life and the trad life and all that kind of stuff that I'd be really curious to hear later. But for now, I'm going to go back over to the, to the live side, and I look forward to catching this later. Dope. Enjoy. <laughs> all right what are we what are we chatting about nance you you uh you felt phil i guess phil uh benjamin in. um so i actually saw in in the youtube chat somebody said something 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 romantic uh reactionary anti-capitalism and i think that was directed at you benjamin but I have, I have personally seen um, people say that you, Cadell, and you, Benjamin, are reactionary, and you're, and you're trying to hide it, and I disagree. Um, but the subject of, uh, what did Dave just say, ne Neotrad, Neo or what did, something like that. So that came up. Um, should we look towards... Our predecessors, should we look at traditions of the past or is that just reactionary brain disease? I don't know if you want to take this, Benjamin, or, or I mean, I, I for I for one, I, I mean, I don't personally identify as, I don't know whether I am, but I don't personally identify as reactionary or neo-trad. And I tend to sort of, uh, I tend to be on the side of creating my tradition than identifying with a tradition. And like, I, I think like I'm in the process of creating my tradition and creating my community that is like, you know, maybe because I don't think the traditions are going to hold up to what's going on today. Yeah, there, there was uh, something we talked about before when when I was last in here that is reminding me of this. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the people I said this on the other side, but I think a lot of the people who have this kind of view are imagining that I'm arguing for. Uh, you know, just ripping capital mobility apart and returning to the nation state or something. 
which is not the position I take in the book, but I recognize my book is expensive and hard to get a hold of. Uh, <laughs> uh, but really, you know, my view is that ultimately capital mobility is something that needs to be governed. And that attempting to simply get rid of it, suspend it, or disrupt it is likely to cause a lot of chaos and a lot of trouble. And part of our difficulty is that we have a lot of rationalizing on the part of people who think that you can uh, you know, just grab some stuff from the past and implement it without any regard to how things have changed. You know, I've always been critical of that kind of thing, what I call kind of Quixotism, grabbing ideas from the past, decontextualizing them, adopting them, or adopting institutional forms that you associate with them and trying to implement them. Uh, you know, there is, of course, a need. Oh, this is what I really wanted to get into. So when I was last here, I talked about expectations. And I think sometimes we have to be aware of certain things that certain people have enjoyed in the past so that we can realize that we might in fact be entitled to those things. So I talked about this when I was last year in relation to the post-war era, that if we're not aware that there was a time when people could get healthcare you know, from the state without having to pay for it, you know, at the free at the point of use, if we're not aware that that has ever happened, then we might not realize that that's something we might be able to demand or to expect, especially from states which are theoretically much richer than the states of the 50s and 60s. You know, conversely, if we're not aware of the things that aristocrats used to enjoy, we might not think about the possibility that we could enjoy them or that larger numbers of people could enjoy those same benefits. Right? And of course, the mode of life, the mode of production, the kinds of institutions and structures that existed in antiquity in the Middle Ages are not at all adequate to provide those things to very large numbers of people. That's why in those time periods, those benefits were enjoyed only by very, very narrow parts of the population, right? But if we aren't able to look at what was valuable or interesting about the way, ways people lived in the past, we may find it difficult to come up with demands or come up with things that are worth struggling for. And I think a lot of people today in neoliberal conditions have had their expectations to varying degrees worn down to the part where they don't think of very much that they might be entitled to. And it's part of what makes, say, the arguments of a Donald Trump or a Kamala Harris effective, because what they're promising uh, is not very bold or very transformative. But if you don't have much in the way of a horizon for what's possible, it may strike you as the best that can be done. So me being a millennial uh, denizen of the internet, uh, I, I grew up in the apocalypse. I grew up at the end of the world. I grew up in the end of history. What, I don't know, what should I expect? What should I demand of my philosophy, of my theory? Um, that like actually existing scenes can't, don't, won't provide. Um, I don't know. And, and, and like, I guess that goes back to like uh, demand the impossible. That's a slogan that gets tossed around in, in, in some spaces. And I don't know if I agree with it. Like, should we demand the impossible or should we just come up with with uh actually possible demands but that are just like better than what we're currently demanding because yeah i'll be honest with you i would i would sell my soul for free health care and that's pretty fucking pitiful but i would uh you know i would i would sell out all my fellow anarchist homeboys if i could go to the doctor for free and that's, that's fucking pathetic. That's pitiful, but it's true. Um, I, I don't know. Ooh, that's, that's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think. It, it can't just be ideational, right? It's not enough to just say in a kind of romantic sense that we should aspire to more or to conceptualize our values in more ambitious ways. A number of people in the academy have been doing this recently with liberal concepts, where they try to conceptualize the concepts in more ambitious ways. I think if you want to make 
bigger and bolder demands, you need institutions and organizations that make those demands realistic. And that's where, why I talk about capital mobility so much, because the framework of capital mobility, uh, I think, helps us to see what are the constraints we face in making these demands, right? Why is it that a demand that was perfectly reasonable in the 50s and 60s that you could get a European social democracy to agree to now strikes us as way outside the realm of possibility? Right, to the point where you have to be a stupid romantic idealist to organize on the basis of that. You know, to the point where politicians make fun of you for bringing it up. You know, I think that that reflects the way things have changed. And if we want to get a handle on that change, then we'll have to deal with the basic fact of capital mobility. And I think a lot of people uh, operate from the premise that there's nothing you can do about that fact. So if you start talking about that fact, all you can be doing is encouraging reactionary tendencies and a desire to tear apart the system of international trade and to plunge us back into the 30s. And I think it reflects the limits of their own abilities to think about politics that people say these kinds of things. Uh, at the same time, you can't blame them. We, we have lived in a world for so long now where it has been so difficult for people to come up with anything else politically to do apart from continue down the road of acquiescing to the demands of capital, uh, that people really struggle at this point to think of a politics, a vision for a new kind of political system uh, that could actually solve any of these problems. I'm definitely in that state of disengagement from, I mean, I, I could be a symptom of what Benjamin's talking about in a way, like I disengaged from these types of making these types of demands. And I guess where I put my time and energy, where I put my attention is on to building on the level of family or building on the level of a partnership and building on the level of uh, more small scale projects. And so like, that's where my like energy is because like, I, I felt like when I was uh, engaging in demands on the level of the state, I was just going to find myself going insane. I want to. Yeah, you need actual organizations and structures that can support the demands. It can't just be rhetorical. And so much of it recently has been rhetorical. So you have on the one side a set of rhetorical demands that don't make any sense. And on the other hand, a set of people just telling you to acquiesce to the existing institutions and their logic. I want. Uh, I mean, it's it's. Yeah, sorry. Uh, go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead, Cadell. I I was just gonna say I want well, sorry to have a here, chance, we need but to, just want to say I'll, I'll say really quick. I think like what's really interesting here for me psychoanalytically is the difference between demand and drive. You know, and and I think thinking about the difference between demand and drive is so central today because if if it you know if if you if you stay in this mode of just making demands on the level of the state and you forget about your drive, I think that's a, that that's itself its own problem, but it, it's at the same time, it's really hard to make your drive work in a social condition that is, you know, like Benjamin's saying, it's, it's abhorrent. I mean, it's, it's impossible to, to really stabilize your drive. It's like a, a super, you have to be a super, you know, it's like a super heroic effort. So I think, um, before Cesar, I'll, I'll give you a chance, but real quick, uh, if we want to have impossible demands or, or, or whatever, um, then it is kind of up to us to build from the ground up kind of institutions that, that can support that. And you can start, we, we must start at the level of the family because like politically the family has been gutted and in fact, like used against us to cow us into obedience. Um, I like it. Sasar, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'll, um, even though I want to like ask five different questions or, you know, go in five different directions, I'll, uh, I'll try to keep myself into one direction. So something I constantly think about and that, um, Daniel Gardner had brought up earlier in the live stream was kind of the ideas of how in the past there was just a lot more of a sense of um 
I guess being being part of the world that you're in and like having a specific um or or maybe not specific, maybe actually a generalized sense of being part of that world. Um whereas as conditions have changed over the past several centuries, we could say, um it you know, it could be argued where these changes happen but uh let's just say um in the past several hundred years um there's more of an idea that you could be an individual within the the world that you exist in um that you could have like taste you know personal taste um whereas i don't know if that was even a, a concept as much as how we think of it now um and yet and then yet uh the point i think daniel was making was um but but kind of like seeing how actually i can't even remember what his point was um but but there's like a sense of like then like a separation of you're no longer uh maybe feeling as much of a participant in your world but more of a uh something that could be um its own distinct thing and then the world may be its own distinct thing um and i and then but then like seeing like okay if you wanted to bring back that world that participation in the world um uh, Daniel brought up this point, and and I think uh, Michael Downs has also brought this up. That yeah, but that wasn't always rosy to necessarily have to be part of what those worlds were in the past. Um, especially if you wanted to, if you were someone who had more of an inclination towards a individuality or uniqueness, that might not have been so easily integrated into the world um and uh so like daniel was mentioning like uh you know that past world of of belonging uh was also the same thing that brought about like jim crow laws in america right it could get to those could be byproducts of what happens when you kind of the the world kind of takes over again from individuality um so then it is kind of like an interesting question, maybe in terms of politics, um, of how to kind of maintain something like, uh, I don't know, the uniqueness of everyone in a sense, or like the how to hold that uniqueness that we maybe feel. And um, how does that not then get, you know, subsumed too much into the, um uh feel, being participants again with each other i can i can i answer this quickly just like my perspective on it is like this is actually the core of the latest philosophy portal anthology logic for the global brain because it's trying to bring together the concept of singular universality so like what you're trying to say here is in my from my point of view tell me if i'm wrong but we've moved from a universality of the world to the singularity of the individual and how do we bring the singularity of the individual back to the universality of the world? And I think that this requires confronting a very interesting paradox of technology, which is that technology, especially like what's going on right now, is that it brings this hyper closeness on the level of being disembodied, but it brings this incredible distance on the level of the embodied. Like we're super close right now, but we're all disembodied. And like, and, and necessarily so. And like, there's something magical about that. Like, cause this couldn't have happened whenever in the past, but at the same time, technology creates a situation where we don't technically don't even need to have embodied relations anymore. And that's what's happening to young people is that there's, there's this increasing sexlessness. There's this increasing disinterest with the world. There's this increasing disinterest with actually engaging on the level of the body. And so I think it has to do with uh, singular universality is can we go into that sing can we go into our singularity and then create a new universality out of that and that could be even richer so but i think that's a long-term process and it, it's going to have to contend with this paradox of technology 
Yeah, and relatedly, a kind of reduction to signs because we're not in, interacting with, you know, people talk about touch grass. It's really about textualism and an overfocus on first words and now images, the signs as a stand-in. Uh, but uh, relatedly on this point, I think that one of the things that it's important to bear in mind is that this individualism, uh, you know, that the ability of individuals to be different is always predicated on some level of collective organization in a context where you have, say, war violence and uh, regular, regular warfare. Everybody is having to do what's necessary to survive all of the time. And when everyone has to do what's necessary to survive, everybody's life becomes very similar in a way which ultimately makes everybody very similar in terms of character and behavior. To be competitive in a very warlike, primitive kind of context, you have to get very big muscles and you have to be a manly man who can fight with a spear and fight with a sword because you may have to. And it forces and compels a particular kind of, of what we would now call traditional masculinity uh, because it's a stultifying competitive logic that limits the various forms of, of uh, being uh, that, that could otherwise come about. I think what a lot of people don't recognize is that capitalism and commercial society is also stultifying in an analogous way. That's not to say that we ought to go back to a militarized kind of society that's all about war violence, but we should recognize how our replacement for that uh, is incomplete. And it's incomplete in the sense that if you have to do whatever is necessary to earn a living, to avoid poverty, to avoid uh, social uh, dis, you know, social cancellation or social uh, uh, approbage, it very much limits what you can do. It very much does restrict your behavior and the ways that you can think about stuff. And so ultimately, what uh, I've been talking about is not a return to an antique situation where everybody has to be a Spartan warrior, right? But what uh, you know, in in talking about qualifying the commercial, it is not as if the only alternative to the commercial is militarized collectivism that we associate with antiquity, uh, and it's this thinking of it as just these two options which backs people into affirming an extremely coercive kind of commercial structure that is uh, just as restrictive for them spiritually as, well, maybe not just as, but very nearly just as restrictive as what came before it. Uh, certainly doesn't really give them the opportunity to develop their own view of what's good or true or beautiful and to act on that view without having to be concerned about, uh, is this compatible with getting a job? we are instruments and, and we are like reduced to labor power. Uh, Dave and I were just having a conversation the other day about prostitution and not because either one of us were thinking of patronizing a prostitute, but because it, 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 it came up um, and we were talking about uh, like the, the foreclosure of the field of possibilities for each and every one of us. We are reduced to our bodies and, and um, being a, a wage worker is a type of prostitution, if you will. And I, I, and that's a little bit sensational and it's intentionally sensational. Um, there's something, you know, especially perverse about selling your body in a sexual manner. Um, but it, it's like the same category of, of choice that you have to make when, when I have to choose to give up on what's up here in my brain in order to, feed myself and feed my children and, and protect my family because all I can do is work in a, in a factory or drive a truck uh, or dig a ditch or whatever. Um, it's, it's a type of spiritual prostitution, if you will. Uh, but more and more, that's all we can do. And not only are we doing that when we go to work, but we, we do that type of prostitution when we consume content because when we're consuming, we're actually producing for, uh, for Google and for Amazon um, and for Zoom and for Microsoft and, and for all these platforms. But at the same time, we hear... Yeah, go ahead, Kiddo. Well, well I finished your thought, but I, I, have, a, I have a question for, for Benjamin based on this, because I think it's really good what you're developing here. I just... Is but, that, you know, this... Yeah, finish your thought, though. Uh, just, the, we are in this... Um, vampiric relation to the platforms but we still are here trying to find a way to develop something more than just a scene um with these with these platforms um but also i mean to be honest like 
maybe we're all just huffing farts and, and maybe we're all just deluding ourselves. I think we're not. Like, I, I do think we're onto something um, with the amount of, like, thought that's gone into it and, and like, critical examination of what we're doing. So... I think the work we're do- I think the work we're doing. I so I I went I I did my doctorate at, at the VUB in Brussels, and and we have a really interesting social environment there. It was a weird little program called Clay. You can look it up if you're interested. But I think the level of intellectual discussion and exploration that's going on in our networks is miles better. Like it's, like I think it's really interesting what's going on here. I think it's I think it's superior in some ways to what's going on. And and I, but I don't think we need to create a, a zero sum antagonism here. I think the institutional work's necessary, and and this network stuff's interesting too. But based on what you're saying just now, I, my question to to Benjamin is: Do you have an opinion on the concept of techno feudalism? Like this idea? I don't know if you've read about it. Uh, it was proposed by Giannis Varoufakis. I could maybe read a blurb or a definition of it if if you haven't heard of it, but it, it's getting at what Nance is talking about about you know the Googles and the Amazons of the world being more like techno feudal like platforms than techno capitalism. The subtitle of his book is like "What Killed Capitalism." Do you think that's going too far? I I like a lot of the critique. I don't really like the analogy to feudalism. I think it okay in various ways. It, it relies on kind of stereotypes of feudalism and a lot of, of modern and postmodern ways of talking about antiquity rely on kind of tropes about it. So I, it's always been a distraction for me, the use of the concept of the feudal in relation to okay. it or the concept of the medieval. I think we can talk about, you know, Varifakis is very much in the, in the same kind of lane as Piketty. Yeah. And uh, Piketty and Varifakis, I, I see them very much as, a similar to me in terms of an emphasis on governing mobility and on finding new ways of governing it. They've struggled very much to organize effectively in their own national context to do this, uh, but they've all maintained uh, throughout their careers a commitment to finding a way to do this and an insistence that it's better than regressing into uh, nationalisms and regressing into uh, taking apart the mobility and trying to, to fight it out with, uh, with different you know, separated states. Uh, but, you know, I think I think the point that he's making is very similar to the Piketty point about how we had a period of mid-century leveling where gradually over time there was more social mobility and more possibility of class migration. And that that yeah. is in various ways for a variety of material reasons closing up. Uh, but I wouldn't and say I think that your this point... is to abandon capitalism. It's a return to the standard form of capitalism in the 19th century uh, in, in one sense. And in another sense, it's a development beyond that because it's now corporatized in a way that 19th century capitalism was not corporatized. And this is another thing I think in general people are neglecting. The degree to which our lives are shaped by organizations, but corporations. Nobody wants to talk about them because we don't identify with them. We hate the fact that we have to deal with them. The university is increasingly corporatized. A lot of the critiques lately that people make about the administrative state on the right, they're really about hating their jobs and hating corporate life. A lot of people hate corporate life because it is the thing which does most of the socializing and the structuring of what we're able to do. And this is true both for blue collar and white collar workers. It's the norms of corporate life that have the socializing role uh, today. Mm. I was just going to make the point that 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 you emphasized in your book, which is that this this mid-century leveling, you know, that 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 reduced the inequality. Uh, you 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 sort of emphasized that like that didn't come through liberal democratic reforms. That came through the world wars, and that like maybe what Piketty and um, Varoufakis are missing is that dimension of of war and 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 negativity and and thinking about political economy on that level. Yeah, to give Piketty credit, he does talk about the role that the war plays. Uh, but w- one thing I've noticed is a lot of people who recognize the role the war has played in the past, but then when their own contemporary politics seem to imply the need for a war, they will not take ownership of that. Uh, and in fairness to Piketty, Piketty frames the retreat into protectionism as uh, you know, certainly not the preferred option, as a second or third best option, but only if you can't do these things, a global wealth tax, a regional wealth tax that he prefers, right? The trouble is that nobody has been able to come up with a political strategy for pursuing those kinds of fiscal policies that's anything remotely like realistic. 
So what people end up doing is regressing into this uh, you know, 20th century 20th century strategies. And they frame it as trying to return to 19th century strategies in many cases. They'll say they want to go back to 1848 or you know, maybe 1917, you know, to, to stuff that's that's earlier on. But in practice, a lot of it is really focused around you know, waiting for capital mobility to come apart due to some kind of cataclysmic event, probably a war. And then looking to see if there's an opportunity once such an event happens to do something else or pick up the pieces. And I, I think that that is just not a sufficiently, that's not a sufficient position. I think it, it doesn't take seriously how awful the world wars were. I think it involves a forgetting of those events uh, and a trivializing of the sacrifices of the generations that went through all of that. Uh, and, and it's a running away from the actual political task of organizing and making the case for something which could govern capital mobility. And it's not a demand on the state. It's a demand for something else, for a different kind of polity. That's really the only kind of demand that could be made that I think would make any sense at this point, is to say that the nation state and the international system, which is predicated on member states that are nation states, that that's not adequate to this problem. What about another form of tragedy or, or or crisis on a global order like a, like coronavirus, which was a very strange thing in some ways because it affected us planetarily almost immediately and required some level of coordination. But there was also very different responses to it on the level of the nation state. Yeah, one of the really tragic things about something like COVID or the Iraq war or what's going on now in Ukraine or in uh, Israel or Gaza, is that these crises do not actually disrupt capital mobility in the way that the first and second world wars did. And so you can have very horrible events that are not adequate to that particular task, if that is the task that you want to assign to them. And so one of the things people do, because they don't want to pay the, the price of these events, is they try to convince themselves that much smaller events will have this function. But it really takes an enormous amount to actually meaningfully disrupt trade. You know, even if you, uh, the Houthis, for instance, have disrupted a certain amount of trade in the Red Sea, right? Or COVID for a while disrupted a certain amount of trade insofar as it caused some factories in China to stop producing for various periods of time and led to some shortages and some price increases, right? It's still the case that total trade volume in 2020 was higher as a percentage you know, than in 2016. Right, the United States imported more in total in 2020 than in 2016. You know, the peak year of COVID, right? And so there were some changes in the supply chains, and there were some price increases, some shortages. You know, but the thing I always come back to is, you know, the the degree to which people were angry about even small disruptions and even small price hikes. And that's not to trivialize the price hikes that have occurred and the effects that they have on people. It's it's quite significant in terms of what people are accustomed to and people's you know day to day lives. And I'm not trying to say it doesn't inflict pain, but when you talk about what was done to people during the world wars, and what people went through as a result of the rationing and famine and disruptions of the 20th century, the things we went through during COVID were very 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 small very small. And nonetheless, they caused people to go, the, the governments that were in power during COVID just about uniformly lost any elections that they fought, regardless of their party or their ideology. If they stood for re-election in 2020, 2021, or if they were in power in 2020 or 2021 and had an election in 2022 or 2023, they almost uniformly lost by significant margins, no matter what they did too, whether they were tough on COVID, soft on COVID, whether they, they flipped policies, it didn't matter because th that level of disruption was for people too much to bear politically. So we're not gonna be able to solve the problems that we're having through nation states that have to stand elections every four or five years where people will vote out a government which presides over any significant period of disruption elected officials will not undertake disrupting the system to strengthen it or make it better in a long-term way if they operate under the assumption they'll lose elections if there is 5% inflation for six months.
so when I talk to my friends, some of my friends, um, they scold me because I, I am pretty, I don't know, blackpilled when it comes to like existing political movements and, um, you know, my family, some of them are going to vote for Trump. Some of them are going to vote for Kamala. And when I say I'm not going to vote for anybody or, or when I float the idea of maybe voting for RFK, um, but that was months ago, um, they, they, they scold me um, and they say, well, if we could just get money out of politics, then we could get back on the, on the right track. Um, and I wish that were the case. Like, I, I, I wish it were true that all is not lost. Um, but it does seem to be the case that, I, I guess going back to the techno-feudalism, uh, I also think feudalism is a silly, overcomplicated metaphor, but it, it says enough about what's being said. Like, um, like you, I think it's interesting in that it's like signifying a type of regression. Yeah. Or like it's not like a movement. It's like, like when I was growing up, I had this naive notion of democratic socialism as like a good forward direction. And like, it was achievable. <sighs> Yeah, so so the the directional metaphor, like using that language to like communicate the fact that things are getting better over time. Uh the notion of history, right? History is progressing. So in that sense, it is, I guess, useful to to highlight the But it's linking it to like techno, which is like future oriented, but it's at the same time a socioeconomic regression. Yeah. Um but I don't know. Maybe it's not. And I, I agree with what Benjamin's saying that, like, maybe it's not not the right connotation. It's not like actually feudalism. Yeah, I I think maybe it's less a regression and, and more just a transformation. Like we're moving into a new a new relation to power. Uh, power doesn't lie with Kamala Harris or Donald Trump uh, or my senator or whatever. Power really does lie. I, I mean, I would say it lies just in capital as this disembodied. Um, all powerful nothing, um, but that all powerful nothing is kind of represented by Jeff Bezos and Warren Buffett uh, and Bill Gates and and stuff like that. I think the techno feudalism has more to say about like like the total like the nature of power and the fact that I am being e economically productive by sitting on my ass and consuming. Um, we, we're turning into Wally people where the, uh, cognitariat, it's a beautiful word that I recently, I think I heard it on tour. Someone said cognitariat. Yeah. Yeah. No, he was someone we met at Cinziana's place in Paris. Yeah. Um, but, but it is like, like not only is it our, our physical labor power, but it actually is like our processing power, uh, our, the, the neurons and the synapses in our brains, the energy transformation that's, that's happening in our brain is now economically productive. And in a sense, it always has been. Um, I, I don't know. But it, it does seem to be the case that finding new relations, like embodied or, or physical, like real relations is one course of action that everybody can take going outside um yeah work does all the socializing for you um and, and that's true like when, as a truck driver when i worked 70 hour weeks like i would i would get all my socializing done at work and through work and all my friends were truck drivers i didn't i didn't talk to anybody who wasn't a truck driver um but i don't know like taking up my my own agency and finding, finding new ways to come in relation in new relations with, with others, actual, like concrete others, not this, the internet, the left as such, the right as such, um, but like singular others feels like a political project to me. Uh, and it feels like the only, to me it is, it's like going to me, it's going from big other to little others. Yeah like concrete little others and just the mess of that. I don't know what you think about that, Benjamin. On the, uh, but like, when, I felt, about... when I felt disempowered with politics, that's sort of like the way, that's like the only way 
like that that i felt like there was power i guess not power in like a obviously like a domination sense but like power in the sense of like i can make my life a little bit better agency yeah it depends a lot on on energy right because some people they come home from work and they don't have the energy to go socialize with people who are not work people right and that's where the screens come in the screens are the thing you can do for amusement and that's where you can get your time where you recharge and you prepare to go back to work the screens very much are an amusement factor yeah you know, using the aristotelian term for his alternative to leisure leisure for him is time that you can actually use to develop and improve amusement is time that you just spend getting ready to go back to work right it's just about recharging and getting ready to serve the boss again and i think that uh, a lot of the time we often on the internet we tend to kind of moralize a bit about screen time when really the reason people are on a screen is that they are caught in amusement because they don't have the energy to engage in a leisure activity like going out and forming new social relations new organizations with with people so i think that's one of the constraints we face i i did want to pick up the this point vance made about political money that i thought was really sharp you know a lot of people they only see political money if it's literal donations to a candidate or a party and so they have a hard time explaining, you know, why is it that in countries that have tight campaign finance laws, the government still constantly does whatever it is that capital needs it to do. And that's because it's still the case at the level of the state that the state has to do something to attract international flows of money and investment. It's still the case that a state like Sweden or a state like Denmark needs people to buy government bonds, needs people to invest in domestic companies. Uh, it needs these things to occur. And therefore, money affects the politics of these states, even if nobody donates to campaigns, even if the campaigns are entirely publicly funded. That doesn't mean that money is out of politics. When capital mobility is in play, you can't get money out of politics because the state is in a completely financialized environment. Of, of global capitalism. That's the condition which financializes politics. But a lot of people, it, for them, it has to be concrete. And I think one of the things that we struggle with is that for a lot of people, if it's not concrete in the straightforward sense of rich guy gives money to party or candidate, it becomes invisible and it becomes impossible to confront. Wukash, please. Do you think that paradoxically, maybe some people would react to like Varoufakis' techno feudalism, like this word, even signifier, positive in this situation where like the link between community and family is broken, family and individual is broken. Uh, and it's a mess basically like feudalism in the sun in a in one way is like it's not freedom so people people don't want that it's like oppression but in the other sense it's like uh it's a type of contract like i do what they tell me to and then i'm good like they provide me with something like and in this sense it's not like techno feudalism it would be maybe more like techno despotism because we can't revoke facebook or like amazon like if they don't prov like if they provide me with a faulty service i can't do anything about it but in, in another way maybe this like uh, perspective of like the social situation developing into more like mm, if i do x then i'm fine and i don't have to become stultified in this way that i transform myself into perfect the perfect labor power I I just do those few things and then I'm good and like everybody and I know what to do. Finally, I know what to do <laughs> because right now it's like nobody tells you what to do other than, than those vague suggestions that you have to get skilled, you have to do this, but everyone knows that this is basically not the way to go. Like it doesn't work. Even if you manage to get your career, you are dissatisfied. So that's that was that's why this thought popped into my head that like maybe someone would actually enjoy the perspective of getting getting in a more like stable even if it's an oppressive relationship it's a sort of a more stable relationship social relationship. 
Yeah, there are a lot of aspects to feudalism that don't tend to get talked about or are talked about in the wrong kind of way, and it makes it hard, right? I think that we can talk about how the system is changing and developing, and we can describe it without getting caught up so much in the history. As much as I love it, you know, I love medieval history, and I love talking about old institutions and structures. I do think it tends to get us bogged down. And oftentimes, if you start talking about feudalism too much, and you get too into the weeds about it, I mean, one of the things that you'll catch on uh, to real quick is that in the Middle Ages, feudalism does not describe most of the ec economic activity that's taking place. In many cases, you have these burger merchants in these cities uh, that are doing a lot of the trade. Uh, you have, uh, you know, also uh, you have this personalized character to everything, right? You're talking about vassalage. So you're talking about people swearing oaths to particular people, you know, chains of personal relationships, personal ties, not corporatized in the same kind of way. You know, you don't have corporate persons to anything like the same degree. Corporate personage was very much invented in the Middle Ages in part to explain how monasteries could uh, use things that they didn't own, right? So the, uh, the monastery as a corporate person is able to have things without any of the particular monks owning any of the things that the monastery has, right? So the monastery has for, for the use of these monks, you know, food, but the monks don't own the food. So they're not violating their vow of poverty by using the food, right? And then you get into these debates about, well, if the monks are using something that a poor person wouldn't be able to use, is that itself a violation of their vow of poverty, even if they don't own it because their ownership has been occluded through this corporatizing process? And so you got this debate within the Franciscan movement between the spiritual Franciscans who insisted that you should only be able to use things that the poor can use, what they called in Latin, usus pauper, and the community-oriented Franciscans who uh, viewed it as not a problem because they're not the ones who own the stuff. It's uh, the corporate personage of the, of the monastery or the, uh, uh, the branch of, of, the, uh, of the order that has the stuff and they just happen to be using it. So it's no problem. Yeah, these kinds of questions don't really come up in something like techno-feudalism because techno-feudalism is really not about those kinds of uh, personal ties. You still have very much a huge amount of corporate corporate relation in the kind of society that Varoufakis is actually describing. And I think this is something I've noticed, just a lot of people don't want to engage with the corporatism of the contemporary moment because it ruins a lot of their historical analogies, right? Like especially their liberals who or, or kind of uh, kind of uh, lib uh, libertarian socialists who are really drawn to 19th century metaphors right now, uh, and who like the idea that there's a kind of vacuum of uh, social organizations. You know, to use maybe an example, I hate using examples because I don't like to to give people a hard time. But like Anton Yeager in Hyperpolitics argues that there's kind of a vacuum of social organizations, except for the digital, except for the internet, and so there's a lot of low value political activity going on online. I think that's true on one level, but also it misses the role corporations play both in structuring the internet and in structuring much of the rest of our time. It's not like we're truly atomized individuals who have no relation to each other. It's that we hate the actual relations we're in so much because they're corporatized that we totally disidentify with those relations to such a degree that we hate thinking about it so much that when it's time for us to do social theory, we refuse to acknowledge the role that the bureaucratic corporate structures play in making us who we are. We don't want to acknowledge that we have anything at all to do with them because we hate them so thoroughly. And the most effective kind of sort of dissident politics today is just anti-bureaucracy because that's really the thing that's in people's day-to-day -day lives and you know, lived experience that they hate. This was kind of like the direction of, of David Graeber's thinking, I thought, with like the, the book, The Stupid Joys of, of Bureaucracy or something like that. A lot of people react to this by going, let's get primitive and just get rid of corporations and go back to personal ties. And, you know, but that's the thing that we, we aren't able to do. The corporation is, is this unleashed thing that it's very difficult to get to. Uh, 
to get out from under. You know, that this it's a you know, invention of the Middle Ages and and perhaps an invention of Hobbes, depending on how you like to think about it in terms of the history of thought. But I remember uh, my supervisor at Cambridge, David Runciman, had, working on this really interesting project in which he argued that artificial intelligence uh, already has existed for about 500 years. And it exists at the level of the corporation because corporations make decisions that are not reducible to their members. And so are in an important sense, artificial decisions. So that corporations make decisions through a kind of artificial intelligence that is already not human in the relevant sense. And that really, when we talk about computers making decisions, this is just a different version of that because it's already the case that you have a kind of procedure that you've set up. In the case of computers, it's with coding. In the case of corporate persons, it's with various kinds of institutional rules and bureaucratic rules. But which, whichever language you're using to set up the rules, what you are effectively getting is decisions that are not human decisions in the original sense of that term, such that when you talk about democracy, you don't mean rule of the people or rule of the one or the many. We don't you know, talk about monarchy or oligarchy as literally rule of people. We're really talking about rule by rules, rule by constitutions, rule of law. These are not people making decisions. These are networks of procedures. And really, when we start talking about artificial intelligence, we're just talking about a different way of doing that. And part of why we are willing to entertain AI in the technological sense is that we already on some level have conceded the possibility that corporations may make better decisions than us by abandoning the personal ties of the old institutions, right? And not just by abandoning them, they were physically outcompeted by modern states, which worked through these impersonal procedural schemes. The modern state was more competitive and smashed and destroyed personal ties based antique systems. So you can't just go back to them in the way that many anarchists would like to. They were, they were defective systems that were not able to perform when subjected to competition by modern states. Um, I, I wanted to kind of bring up, um, Jacques Ellul and the technological society, because some, I, uh, I most, I read most of it, <laughs> didn't, didn't quite finish it, but, uh, um, I wanted to, you know, come back to it at some point. Um, but something I was noticing that Ellul was talking about with, how he, he uses the word, um, well, really, he's talking about a method, technique. Um, and he's, he even kind of describes like, well, in his view, he's saying whether whether we're in a, a capitalist um, a system or a communist system, there's still something like technique that is part of it. Now that's you know that's part of his definition of what those two kinds of modes have as part of it, and I guess what's interesting is that he, when he talks about technique, um, how he was he explains it as almost like this this force of its own that kind of that the human kind of interplays with it's not something that the human has necessarily but it's almost something that the human has to be a participant in at some point and um to kind of bring this uh with the case of ai how you know maybe there is there is already a kind of intelligence to technique itself um and he uses different words like efficiency or even progress, I think he uses sometimes it, as synonyms for technique. And so it's kind of interesting to think of if um, if we do, as humans, we do enjoy something like efficiency. Um, it's interesting how we've gotten to a point of being very efficient with efficiency, but how maybe that has over time uh done something to our humanness you know like we got so efficient with efficiency but humans are not fully efficient and so um how that can how that is now affecting uh a political project or political space for us to do things um 
it it's it's uh I don't know. That's just the interesting question. And yeah, as as you were saying, Benjamin, with AI, um, uh, maybe that's just the trend at the moment. But um, it is, and and as Cadell, as you were mentioning, maybe there does need to be like a, um, a, a radical approach to what technology can do in our lives. But like maybe how to then have a, again a human aspect to technology it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to parse i think uh i want both you guys to respond to that but i i think real quick like responding to that i think uh like a politics of positivity is kind of where we're at when we're focused on efficiency and and we're focused on function um and uh and we need a politics that can at least incorporate the negativity inherent to all us soft squishy human beings um yeah yeah i think one of the the difficulties is that we we get stuck between either affirming the existing and personal structure or demanding total personalization, right? We don't trust ourselves enough to revise the values for which the impersonal structure operates, which requires personalizing it while still recognizing why we impersonalize. That, that's a difficult thing dialectically to swing. People are reacting to the weaknesses of the impersonal system by demanding repersonalizing, and then against that, some people are going, what are you crazy? If you tear apart the impersonal system, everything will go to hell. Uh, but we, we don't have people who trust themselves and each other to change the, the rules while still having impersonal structures. This idea that human beings have to be able to change the rules without getting rid of the whole thing, and that there should be some moderate way of interacting with uh, corporate structures, uh, that's gotten lost in our debate to the point where, you know, if I raise this problem, somebody goes, oh, are you a reactionary? You know, if you raise problems with the impersonal systems or you raise any kind of doubt that we can just keep following the, the impersonal logic without some kind of human intervention, people go, oh, are you just trying to go back to, you know, the past? Uh, there's no space here for human beings taking an active role and occasionally re-giving the rules. Yeah, in, in uh, modernity, you know, you have Rousseau with the legislator who uh, periodically, you know, re-gives the constitution, re-gives the, the city structure. You have this legislator figure in uh, a lot of ancient thought. It's a moment where the system becomes very personal so that new rules can be created so that the city can function without that level of personal virtue. You know, it's a moment in which people display qualities so that they don't have to display them to the same degree immediately after the fact of that. Uh, but if we operate from the premise that human beings are never able to display such superlative qualities, even for brief moments, uh, such that people can never be trusted to reform systems or change rules or procedures, you know, then we are just bound up with a set of rules that people from the past picked that we have just decided to defer to out of cowardice. And a lot of people who throw around the accusation of, of reactionary or trad just kind of have that position. They have the view that any attempt to change anything is uh, you know, necessarily, you know, any attempt to make anything subject to human values is necessarily an attempt to go back. I just want to say like the relevance of not only like Mikey Downs teaching Nick Land right now, because I think a lot of these themes overlap with, with Nick Land, you know, thinking like the corporation was like the the AI, like the, the genesis of AI, and now, now it's taking over. And, and any type of holding back against this force is a type of infantilism uh, or some sort of outdated traditional social managerialism. Uh, so I, I, I think like one of the things that, that might be interesting, I don't know if this is going to be relevant or not, but like, you know, basically in the philosophy of right, Hegel's saying the state is God. And, 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 you know, with that idea, he's not saying like any specific state is God, like the German nation or something like that, but like the idea of the state in that historical moment. And I think that now it's like, it's definitely capital. 
You know, I, I've, I've said that previously, like capital is, is basically God, like meaning it's absolute. And, and, you know, so it's like that, that historical transformation has, has taken place. And I think one of the things that's coming up for me in terms of what Benjamin was saying about, you know, the history of AI in this context is like thinking about, we're, we're not used to thinking about human history as human divine history. You know, like we're like, it's not just human history. You know, like it's human divine history. It's like the, the the intersection between the human and the divine. Like we we think it's just human history. You know, but it, but maybe it's not just human history. <laughs> yeah, we we bracket out. We we exclude. Um, I don't know. We we exclude this interloper, this divine third, um, and we kind of pretend. That it's all rational. Well, and, and then, you know, we go back to like the march of history and progress and the arrow of history and this and that. I, uh, one thing I, I want to bring up monastery, religion, while they're important and while I think I already am convinced, I do want to advocate for the younger me who was a brash, uh, firebrand atheist and so anytime anyone mentioned religion anytime anyone mentioned um the things that <clears throat> that have been talked about were kind of incorporating this uh divine holy spirit cadell uh the way you use it you and i kind of talked about our atheism and <laughs> i'll allow your usage of it but no there is a version of me who i, I would immediately stop listening the moment yeah. divinity, Holy Spirit, monastery, any of these things were mentioned. Uh, and I know that's a stupid reactionary position to have, but I, I know that there are young, passionate leftists or, or anyone who cares about emancipation, but they also are so small-minded and averse to these things. I've just been doing... In building the Christian atheism course, I've just been doing, I've just been building out the class for, for next month on the relationship between Hegel and Marx. And it's like, it's impossible to really understand Marx, I think, without understanding that he was hugely influenced by basically Christian philosophers. I mean, like Hegel was a super Christian philosopher. <laughs> and like, like, whether or not like Marx turned him upside down or whatever, like the spirit of Christianity and the relationship to Marxism is like hugely understudied. And like hugely under acknowledged by leftists. And I just wanted to make one more other point is like in relationship to what Benjamin was saying about the impersonal structure and the personal values. I would go so far as to say like what we're experimenting here with Theory Underground and other sort of organizations is kind of an experiment in that because, you know, like that is kind of part of it is like, like we're creating impersonal structures and we're imbuing them with values. Right. And we're creating those values and we're trying to uphold something. And, and there are people who make fun of us for doing things like that. You know, like it's it's not ironic enough or it's, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, it's not empty enough. Like we're take, taking a stand on something. Yeah, we we can't uh, we can't earnestly engage in it because, uh, well, because here we are at the at the end of history. Nothing is real anymore. Look at those fools deluding themselves, thinking that anything matters. Uh, but it does matter. We need rigor. We need standards. Um, we need, I don't know, something, something that we don't have anymore um, here on, on the outs. Uh, so we need to kind of pilfer the institutions and, and uh, bring that back, bring care, bring you know, hope and love and joy and faith and, and all these things. And friendship. Oh, yeah. Like friendship is just like, yeah, it's like pretty good. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> yeah, but have you considered being friend? No, but it is. Um, and, and we all have to like perform this, uh, this ironic cynicism where we're, we're cool. I don't love you. I'm too cool to love you. I don't care about that. I'm too cool to care about that. Uh, but I think that's just a disavowal of, you know, of conditions. Like I, I feel powerless. Black. Yeah. Um, which kind of brings it all back around to like building these outstitutions, building frameworks, building structures to, to kind of support this collective journey that we're all on. 
um, to build. Like, we're constructing. Um, yeah. Like, basically, like, I don't know if this is going to go on YouTube or whatever, but, like, I, again, I was listening to uh, the a Plastic Pills podcast uh, with JREG. And it's just, like, he just thinks, like, I wanted to stay by myself and not construct anything and like deterritorialize everything and like no positing. And, and it's kind of like, I think the next generation, like the feeling I got from it is like the next generation is like, no, mm. like let's, let's try and posit something. Mm. Let's not just deterritorialize everything. And like, like nothing's possible and stuff like that. Well, and it, it like that, <sighs> But like Maybe. it's confusing to know where to start. I think largely because of I think like the types of things that that Benjamin's work is pointing at is like like it's hard to know where to start. Like how how do you start? You know, and where do you start? How do you know you're not wasting your time? Like what level do you work at? Mm. You know, and like I think for most people, I don't know if Benjamin, you fall in this category, but like for I think for a lot of people, they just don't have the time for like the pol the the political would just drive them insane in the end. Yeah, and I think if you don't have the time or the resources to engage with something, there's a tendency to try to come up with a reason why you were better off never engaging with it. And a lot of people are living lives that don't give them space to do lots of different kinds of activity, to have real friendships, to have real relationships. And so we're getting a lot of this, well, you know, that isn't any good anyway. Didn't all of that originate in some reactionary hell past? You know, what's what's the point of all of that? Um, and I do think it, there is a tendency to, to insist that you've just got to affirm the flows because there's nothing that can be done about them. It's not obvious what we could do about them if there is anything we could do. So you've got to affirm the flows and the alternative to affirming the flows is, is to go into the past in some way. Uh, and while I, I am critical of people who get stuck in, in various kinds of quixotic projects, uh, I think if we frame every alternative as necessarily always already reactionary, that prevents us from coming up with something that would be a real response. And I do think we have to look for a real response, even if it is difficult to find, even if we may not be able to, to do it ourselves, if we can at least point to the need for it and point to some of the things that are in the way, we we create a discussion that others might, you know, who might be better place than us for various reasons might be able to do more with. Uh, you know, just because we don't immediately have a solution doesn't mean that we're not talking about something important that matters. And some people are, for various reasons to do it the way that they're living, not able to tolerate that kind of uncertainty and ambiguity. Uh, and it's, it's just, it's not anybody's fault. But I think sometimes, you know, we hear a lot of the criticism from people and then we get focused on addressing it. And that that isn't always helpful because sometimes the criticism is coming from bad conditions. And so it, to, to spend our time addressing it sometimes means getting dragged into ourselves, into the bad conditions. And this is you know, some of the, I've had some, some conversations at this point about kind of barbarization. You know, trends, social trends, economic trends that have a kind of, of deteriorating effect. They kind of, of di disrupt and destroy social relations, sociality. They have this kind of, uh, they make us feel more like we're in a Habesian multitude where we have to be scared of people. You know, give us the kind of feeling of, you know, maybe if you've seen the film, Bo is afraid, you know, just a kind of paranoid attitude to other people and what other people are up to. And therefore, a desire to not identify with anything or anybody, lest we get caught up in something, somebody's you know, gaslighting or somebody's narcissism or somebody's crazy psychological problems. And uh, you know, this, this is a kind of very fear-motivated behavior that I think a lot of people are in because they are in conditions that do, I think, subject people to fear and, and do terrify them in many very real ways. Uh, but if we have managed in our lives to get any level of protection from fear and any level of ability to think on the basis of anything else other than what do I need to do to make sure I get a job? What do I need to do to make sure I don't get fired? What do I need to do to make sure I can pay my bills, right? If you get any level of that, you don't want to get caught up in a political discourse that comes from that place 
because it can acidify, you know, it, it's like an acid that just eats, eats at uh, our ability to think. And, and I think that there's just so, so much of that. And a lot of the time when people see that you are, that you have some time and you have been able to do this kind of thing, their impulse is to destroy it or to say that it's no good or it's of no use because they don't have access to it, uh, which is you know, one of the things we have to deal with. We have to give people we, as much as we can, as many people as possible, more access. And it's got to be clear that that is an objective because when it's not, uh, you know, I think people very understandably can go, how dare you spend your time doing this kind of, of faffy, fun, intellectual stuff while I'm stuck doing this shitty job? And how dare you act like it makes you better than me or that you have access to something that's better than what I have access to? You know, it's a critique that has to be answered. And if it's not answered in our own theory and practice, it will often be answered with the, you know, an attack by the people who don't have the time on us. You know, it's why Oxford and Cambridge are, are forts. You know, the colleges are castles. They are military installations to protect the academics from the peasants and the townspeople who at any given point might go, fuck you bastards. How dare you sit in these towers and think and read while we are out here doing real work? You know, and there is something to that. But at the same time, I think we have to recognize it for what it is and not become uh, afraid or unwilling to do what we're there to do. I feel like Noam Chomsky brought this a lot up in his work is like the point of the intellectual, like, and that the intellectual holds a lot of responsibility in these sort of political contexts. And that like a lot of intellectuals actually like that, that, that the way a lot of intellectuals behave in these ivory towers, these castles do sort of justify the logic that you just went down of like, sort of like that, that attitude of how dare you, you know? And, and so like, there, like you're saying, there's a point to that. And I think that that puts an extra level of burden of responsibility on us when what we're doing to, to be sort of um, uh, kind of aware that intellectual work does serve a very important place, but a lot of it depends on the subjective engagement of that intellectual. I think that's what's left out sometimes of the ivory tower scholars that they protect themselves from the type of deep radical ontological commitment that can come out of this more experimental work, which does engage with these questions of or overcome these questions in, in my experience of you know where am I going to get in my next job where does my next bill come from you know overcoming these types of you know blocks inside of us that are basically fear fear-based and and you know we have to love what we're doing to do this yeah and a lot of of people in these settings are too focused on moving up in institutions and on being competitive in various kinds of institutional schemes and people can see that if they do see it and it's part of why those those institutions operate so much in private and behind paywalls because if people do see it they don't like what they see and it is part of the value i think and and this is one of the great things about theory underground of thinking in public because there is an opportunity for someone to make a demand uh, but yes, we have to be thoughtful about how we respond to the demand. Because I do think sometimes I've seen some intellectuals who become so consumed with the fear that they're not living up to this outsider's critique that they start to fetishize the perspective of the person who never has any time to do any of this. And they'll act as if there's a kind of subaltern working class figure who has just you know all of the right impulses, of course, because they work for a living. And, and this can be a kind of fetishizing, a, a sort of orientalizing of the worker that certain intellectuals will do in part out of a sense of guilt. So there's a, a need to resist that temptation, but also, of course, to resist the temptation of dismissing the critique of, you know, really, why, why do we get to do this? What's the point of it? Why should somebody work so that we can do this? Uh, we should have our answer to that. And we, should, we, we can't be sure we'll persuade someone who actually raises the point uh, but we should have an answer that we at least think is a good answer. Yeah, I've I've been curious um, whenever I've heard Dave or Mikey talk about uh, let's base our politics in time energy for everyone. Because um, uh, it's like, OK, that's that would be an interesting um, platform to use, right? Uh, if you were to play like a an experiment of what what would a campaign if we made a campaign for Dave, and uh, you know what kinds of things would we like 
um, stories would we share with people to like get them on board with this? And it's a little bit tricky though, because I think something about Dave's point is we don't even know yet what the what a politics could look like if people had time energy cuz i think it would have to fundamentally change them in some way of uh like you were mentioning benjamin if they weren't worried about am i going to get fired from my job um you know just like a lot of these these things that kind of like keep us um uh complacent in a lot of ways in order to maintain uh a lot of what we have um and and so yeah i don't know i i i've i've thought about like oh yeah that's that's funny to think of time energy as like a um uh if it, it how how many people could you get to get on board with that what would the what would the road to that look like? Um, these are all kind of like hard things to to think about, but um, pr I think probably worthwhile things to think about um, in terms of uh, it seems like it, it is intuitive to a lot of anecdotes that people have shared about talking about time energy to other people in their lives and how it seems receptive. Um but you know it's i think it's just like uh um i don't know th thinking about that how how it how it could change people the ones who do have time energy versus no time energy i think on on that specifically like uh political time energyism if you will um a big big uh conversation is and Gores, Andre Gores serves as like this metonym for time energy uh, politic or, or uh, political time energy reductionism. I don't know, but Andre Gores, um, and it's interesting. And, and he is thinking about a politics designed to uh, nourish the human and honor the human rather than just strictly instrumentalize them. Um, I think it resists this workerism that, yeah, the, the worker becomes the noble savage, or maybe that's offensive, but like it becomes like the noble proletarian. Um, and that, be, like, that could easily turn into like folk politics and, and I like folk in the bad way. Um, but there's also this thing of like just reflecting personally like since i've been cognizant of my the way i use my agency when it comes to like how am i going to use my uh my leisure time um like it it turns us into better people um and we can then become better political subjects me when I am just a dumbass truck driver and I chew tobacco and I drink and I, you know, I neglect my, my family and I'm, and I'm an asshole. I don't want that guy to be free. I want that guy to have to learn lessons, but he's never going to learn lessons if he never has time energy. So having, having time energy and having systems and structures that allow people to grow and develop, um, into, better versions of of who they are um that's political time energyism um but yeah how do we get there and 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 i go back to uh some kind of like syndicalism some kind of anarchism like whenever the question of like political programs and and all that stuff comes up cuz it would it would look like something hard to articulate like we we don't have the equipment, we don't have the language, we don't have the symbolic um to talk about what we want right now, which is why I think the best thing any of us can do is learn and and grow and develop and and try to nurture um nurture our spirits or our souls, whatever language you want to use um but again, I think I always. 
I always go back to maybe we're wrong. Um, maybe, I don't fucking know. Maybe Mussolini was right. Maybe we're fucking all a bunch of stupid idiots and we're, we're, uh, we're deluding ourselves. I think that's wrong. Like, I don't think that's the case at all, but it, I mean, it could be the case. Um, which is why it's important that we have spaces to learn and spaces to read and spaces to like critically examine, um, you know, th mistakes that people have, have made in the past. So maybe we don't make the same mistakes in the future. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think time energy is a much more tractable concept than freedom because it's concrete and material in a way that freedom is not. So I, I, I've had that view for a while. I think that time energy is a much better way of talking about this than freedom because freedom has been turned into an empty signifier. Uh, I, I think I probably could say what it is that I want. I just wouldn't be at all convinced that I have a a straightforward path from here to there. You know, what I really want is a big supranational entity that sits above states that says, uh, these are the minimum tax rates that states have to collect. You know, these are the you know, minimum wages that states have to have. Uh, these are the minimum labor standards that states have to have. And states that don't have these things will not be permitted to trade with states that do. States that don't have, uh, you know, that don't tax, that don't take care of their workers, uh, you know, should not be part of the global trade system. And that supranational entity should directly connect with the population. It shouldn't be mediated through the member states and the member state governments like you see in the European Union, because that is a vector for uh, an enormous corruption of the structure and the total exclusion of people's values from it. Uh, so, you know, I could articulate something that I think would work if we were to build it. But then my question is, how would we build it? And what would we make that would enable us eventually to build it? Because I think it's not something that we could simply vote for, right? If we elected a government that wanted to do this, it would struggle to have the credibility to negotiate for it, especially in the United States with the kind of democratic institutions that we have, the three branches of government, the checks and balances, the Senate has to ratify the treaties. Every time you elect a new president, they potentially rip up old agreements. You know, we don't have credibility to negotiate something like this. So even if I could elect a government immediately that would be interested in changing the supranational system and you're know, replacing the UN with a real structure that can actually enforce human rights law and make real human rights law and expand and, and create human rights law. Um, you know, the, the actual ability to do that, I think would require changing the system of government in at least the United States as a prerequisite for doing that. It would require some kind of revolution in the United States, which could then spread through this kind of structure. Uh, that is not something that is easy to you know, just say, oh, here's your 10 point, you know, your step plan for how you do that. Uh, but I think I could say what it is that I think would work. If someone were to just ask me, how would you fix capital mobility? I could, I could give you a, you know, a what do you do from a, a policy standpoint, or even from a final set of, maybe not final, but uh, intermediary next set of institutions. Because really, you know, we're always reinventing our politics for new situations. You know, we would have to do it again, I'm sure at some later point, it wouldn't be a final set of institutions. But, uh, you know, I could do that. The issue is to say, okay, what should we go do now in society to get to a point where we are able to make that thing? Because people don't believe in it. When I, I could describe something like this, but people wouldn't believe in it in the way that they'd need to believe in it to organize in such a way that we could make it. And that's where I, I start talking about the imaginarium in my work of the, this kind of restricted imagination, right? We're just not able to believe that we actually could make the thing that would, would deal with capital mobility. What we really need is a new kind of polity which overcomes the dominion of the commercial logic by bracketing it with a political logic that to some degree competes with it and can put the brakes on it. I think uh, one, one thing that you talk about Benjamin as non-reformist reforms and that is 
something that I don't think gets talked about enough. And I think that that can be a lifeline for someone who is kind of struggling with the overwhelming doom of there's nothing that can be done and, and we're fucked in this and that. Um, but, but then kind of coming back and, and saying, well, there actually, actually there is something that can be done. And while it may not be what you want, um, it's still something. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's important. Yeah, I, I would go to the wall with, say, uh, the Platts or, you know, some of the people from Sublation about Medicare for All. I would absolutely fight them about this. I think that Medicare for All was absolutely a non-reformist reform and that it was an absolutely and remains an absolutely pivotal thing to do to just reduce the degree to which people are are afraid in their day to day lives so that they have more space to think about how we can do better. Uh, and less dependence on their employers for, for health care. I think it absolutely would have made an, an enormous difference, especially if we had thought about it in a realistic way. You know, this is a sector that's 17% of GDP. In most rich states, the sector is 9 to 12%, which means that there is at least a trillion dollars that is spent on health care in the United States that doesn't need to be spent on health care. And of course, if you were to just cut that spending, you would unemploy a lot of people. So you would have to intelligently reallocate that money and you would have to you know, make a real effort to help the people who are currently employed in healthcare jobs that are not good jobs, that are not productive or efficient or necessary, find somewhere else to be. But we've reached a point where we have a sector that has so much structural power that it is making our entire economy less efficient. It's burdening our entire state structure and whatever it is that you might value, you know, conservative, left, liberal, whatever, the healthcare system is an enormous burden and an enormous problem. Uh, and the healthcare system is not something that capital mobility prevents us from reforming because you can't treat patients who live in the United States from a foreign state. You can't just set up a healthcare system in a different country to treat American patients. So it is in principle reformable by us if we have the courage to do it. And also, if we were to do it, it would demonstrate to us that we can do things as people with our people, peopleness. You know, it would show us that we are not just prisoners of impersonal flows. I think there are just so many wonderful things that would have come out of Medicare for All. And one of the tragedies is that in, in recognizing the limitations of the millennial left and the Bernie movement and so on, so many people have abandoned that idea and abandoned the, what was really brilliant about that. The reason that it was worth it to try the whole stupid Democratic Party capture thing was that idea. That was the best idea that this whole generation of left-wing activists had. And many of them didn't even realize how good an idea it was. They only understood it in terms of you know, just giving people who don't have healthcare, healthcare. You know, the healthcare sector is, is like the Soviet heavy industry of the United States. It's like the Chinese housing market. It's a sector that is enormously corrupt and, and burdensome upon the whole system. It astounds me that anybody pretends like that didn't matter or would have been a banal thing to have done. Yeah, it, I, like I, 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 can, I can imagine um, using this uh talent tutelage time energy like using these um i don't know lenses like i i can imagine what would that do what would it do for the person who's struggling with that negative despair because they have uh a terminal condition or maybe not even a terminal condition maybe like a, a standard regular bullshit condition but because they're an american worker it becomes terminal um, and it's such a, a pressure that just weighs down so many people and, and like puts a big wet blanket, uh, and just keeps people locked in that negative despair. Um, and it, it makes it, and, and even if it's not you, even if it's your spouse or your kid, or even if you're just, you know, you're 50 and you're worried about what might happen to you in the next 10 or 20 years. It's incredible how much it limits. I do think this is the power of it, because if you consider that time energy is in itself a revolutionary thing to generate, then any reform which generates time energy 
is a non-reformist reform. And it becomes a clear standard you can use to distinguish between reforms that make a difference and reforms that don't. I think... Uh... Are you going to write the book, Benjamin? I think I think you should write I think you should write a book on your idea at least. On, like if you think uh, on, like if you think you can if you think you could come up with a propo a positive proposal to to stop the flows of capital mobility. So actually, I'm I'm doing something uh, in partnership with the Street Council, which is an organization that's focused on global federalism. I'm doing a little fellowship with them where I'm going to write a few blog posts about. Uh, a kind of supranational federal structure. I'm going to do a little something. I would love direction. that. I would love that. I would read it. Yeah, I've tended not to do this kind of thing because I go, well, what's the point of, of just saying what I'd like to see happen? You know, that the Imaginarium is restricted. Nobody will care. It won't make any difference. It's a waste of time. But I am going to do a little bit of this at least and see uh, if, if there's any kind of reaction to it. A little bit of it. And maybe more down the line as we go. I'm also... So I'm, I'm in talks with Paul Grave to do a kind of new, much cheaper version of The Way is Shut, but with uh, easier to read too, and just you know much less academic. And I'm I'm uh, one of the things I've included in the proposal for that, uh, which they seem pretty enthusiastic about. But let's see, uh, is having the final chapter of that book, adding a new section to that book that would be this idea. So that there is something at the end of the way is shut apart from the shutness. They said, well, you know, you can't sell sell people, ordinary people, a book that ends like the way the way is shut ends. You could sell that look to at what you Look at what you look at what you've attracted, Benjamin. You've attract you've attracted the the rabble on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, it's I think it, I think it would be a great project. I would I would definitely get into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I want to at least at least write something like that in my career. Sure. I, you know, whether it goes anywhere or not, I'd like to at least write something. Hmm. Even if I don't Maybe think it'll work. Further... Sometimes I think we have an obligation to pursue ideas we think are unlikely to work. Right. Because even if we think something probably won't work out. If we're not entirely certain. Sometimes we should still write it up just in case. You know, I last uh the last person uh i had in in thought lab is an old friend from my doctoral school his name's uh clement videl and he i was always blown away by his work because he dedicated his entire doctorate to this very obscure and unlikely to succeed hypothesis about the existence of aliens and it was just like such a crazy thing to dedicate like 10 years of your life to he thinks that there are these types of binary star systems that are actually alien intelligence because of the way they move. And of course, it's a bonkers idea. But I just think that any real change is going to come from that level of risk. You know, and being willing to take that intellectual risk. Well, and, and um, I think it's probably exceedingly rare that people take big risks. People can't take big risks. And not to do this, oh, yeah, they're they suck they're just academics but no like their livelihood depends on them not taking insane risks like that um which again goes back to like the need for alternative uh structures that that can really support like rigorous work being done like not just sitting around and, and like larping and role playing and like wouldn't it be cool if you know we had we had you know a cool future, but like actually really trying to take the ideas um, seriously and, and always maintaining some kind of directionality and, and, and some kind of movement. Um, it all just kind of, it's just another stellar case for what we're all trying to do when doing experiments with the medium and um, new types of networking and learning webs and and all this stuff. Um... Real, real quick, I want to interject and just say there's a line I love that is that about 
steps, putting your foot in your mouth, and that sometimes that's the best place for it because it's on the bottom of your foot that you find truth. And so, yeah, Benjamin, I want to see you put your foot in your mouth and maybe we'll find some truth there. <laughs> you can find... You've got the whole group support here. Yeah. Um, you can find a lot of people with feet in their mouths on the internet. Um... <laughs> no truth though no truth <laughs> um i think i think we're gonna wind up closing out soon i do want to give benjamin and cadell give you guys an opportunity to just do like a final closing um then we'll shut this down and then um i think mikey and catrone are almost done so is there anything either of you guys want to say in, in closing, final remarks, final reflections? I mean, I, 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 guess, I guess for me, all I'll say is that while I sort of have disengaged from the level of politics that Benjamin's sort of uh, taking on here, uh, I think that I, I try to bring to this space a sense of non-naive optimism that that things are possible. Like we can have a cool life, we can do cool things. And and maybe that's why sometimes when you and I speak, Nance, for a moment, you feel like you're not in a complete nihilism. Because I think it's I guess it's what it's what it's informed by is that in order to be positive, you have to tarry with the negative. It's it's as simple as that to be like because that's how you stop that's how you get out of the that what I would call a naive type of, of of optimism and for me I like starting with what's most close to me and so like in my life that's been more on the level of building the conditions of possibility to start my own family and then from there possibly build out the conditions of possibility for a real community. And will that in the end take me to the level of state politics? I don't know, but I'm very happy to be in the same space with someone like a, a Benjamin Studebaker. Yeah, this is a really cool new format. I really enjoyed this because, you know, we we get the the thing that we usually do with Dave, but then we also get this thing with Nance back here, which... Really, I think this is a revelation. I think this is a really cool new aspect to the Theory Underground experience. And to hang out with Cadell, you guys are very good at just figuring out what's the right combination of people and tech. And it's one of the things you're just really fabulous at, you know, organizationally. It's a, a tremendous strength that Theory Underground has. So I, I just, uh, I would emphasize that I really enjoyed this. And uh, I, I look forward to, to more or stuff like this proof that human history is not just human history because it was a revelation <laughs> <laughs> yes there we the, go. the divine <laughs> other um i'm i'm actually gonna stop the recording okay that was dope that was long that was a couple hours um and yeah it went far and wide um, and I actually, I didn't realize, or I didn't remember that I cut it off. I do know for a fact that, uh, Sasar and Wugash and I had some conversation after I, I stopped recording. And I, I remember the reason I stopped recording because it was going long and I knew Cadell, it was almost two in the morning for Cadell. I knew Benjamin had things to do too. And so I, I, I was like wondering, well, should I just let it go or, or should I like try to make it like a hard out? for them because i could tell they were enjoying being part of this conversation but i also i was like okay uh i can't keep people here all day um against their will i i digitally kidnapped these people um so i do remember stopping the recording and and then we kind of went on um and, but i thought i hit start recording again um so we missed out on on some and uh but hey it's okay because be there next time you know what i'm saying 
if you want to or whatever. Um, so in the next clip, Daniel Garner makes his return. And I do believe this is the final clip of, of the green room. Um, I think it actually ends with the green room rejoining the mainstream. Um, Terrence and I decided to call the mainstream, the red lodge. Thank you. Uh, David Lynch for giving us such a cool name for something, but you know, we're calling it the green room, whatever. And Terrence was like, we need to, we need to come up with something to call the main call, the live street, the live side. And, uh, I was like, oh, let's call it the red lodge. Cause you know, green and red are like opposing colors or whatever. Um, but I think that was in, that was during the part that was fried audio is unusable. I'm bummed, dude. That was like an hour and a half. Like <laughs> it sucks, man. But you know, lesson learned. Uh, and we're improving it. I'm sure if you're actually eyes on the screen watching this whole video, I'm sure you've seen some of the things that I also saw. And um, I'm like, damn, I don't want that to happen again. I got to remember this and that. And it just has to do with like basic, it's basically live switching, even though this is all recorded and I could go back and edit it. Um, and, you know, whatever, it, it, it's basically live switching. Um, and that's, you know, not that difficult, but again, it's something that you have to pay attention to. Um, and when I'm just kind of carried away in the moment or whatever, during these conversations, it's easy to forget that I'm also, <laughs> I'm, I'm supposed to be switching. Um, but it is what it is. Um, so yeah, I think this last little segment, Daniel makes his return. Cesar is there. I can't remember if Wukash left before we started recording again or not i don't know i can't remember um yeah i, I don't i don't know now, now i'm like drawing a blank on what even i was thinking um so this last segment i'm gonna go ahead and start it here very shortly um and before i do uh, I don't know. I, I feel like there's something I was going to do and then I forgot. Now I can't remember what it was, dude. Anyway, yeah. So I think I'll start the clip. Yep. Can you hear my dogs? No, I got the noise gate on. Dude, they're snoring. They're going to town, dude. They're snoring like crazy, dude. 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 Dude during the recording everything but that was a lot of fun i love what we spoke about and scissor it's good to see you today sir is everyone doing all right dude right. daniel i i was just doing fawning great. i was just fawning over the format and the the guests and the participation and kind of like just all we're doing here like it, it yeah i don't know it's awesome it's exciting the ability to the thing i like the most about the epic marathon streams is the meta conversation that develops mm. over the course of the day. Yeah. Um, the thing I hate about them is that the segments are so short. You would, you know, like you only get an hour to talk right when the conversation starts to get good. We're like we got to go, we'll see the next guest, but coming back here into the green room and kind of continuing the conversation, but also connecting it to the other threads of other conversations. Yeah. It's so good. I think it's a brilliant structure. I, I really do like it. And I like the idea that people come and go and interact in different things. And uh, I think it's a really smart structure that so that y'all uh, put together. So I, I really like it. I think I think it's innovative. And it does allow the ability like to record it and show the other part later. I think that's very smart. Um, and so I, I, I applaud it in, in many forms. So well done. Yeah, it's a uh... It's awesome. Yeah, when... this, is the most I've, this is the most on the internet that I've ever felt more like a coffee house where it's like people can walk in and walk out. I used to hang out in a coffee house for like six yes. hours at a time. And they, that's how you get the quality conversations. And it is, it really is like a meta conversation, right? And you can only do it in this kind it was, it, this is brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> no, I agree with you, Mandy. I, um, Michelle and I, golly, between 2008, 2014, ran an art gallery venue and performance place called Unoya. It was supposed to be a kind of call. We had open mics on Thursday. I was, it actually, I think that exact drum set 
that Dave was showing at the space <laughs> was at Inoya. And that ability of people to come and go, to enter, to have conversations and different things. Um, you, you really cannot overstate when we're talking about new emancipatory possibilities, new polis, you really can't overstate how much the design of spaces is part of that. Like the very kind of architect of how people interact and engage. Um, because, you know, there there's really is this question, like I was listening to the one dime and all these kind of notions of the kind of revolution or different changes. Well, a lot of what we have to think is new ways to socialize and socialize better, figure out how to come together with different ideas, different habits, different uh, ways of thinking. And that is um, either multiplied and enhanced or hindered by the design of spaces and the ways that people interact and also the various um you know skill sets that people have into in the interrelational so thinking the design i think is a really really big deal i mean uh you know we were we were talking about earlier how if you don't have a polis your politics is actually just law it's not really democracy it's not really a polis it's really just a judiciary and law and who can get the guys in power to write the laws it's not really democracy um, it's really just uh, winning an election to then have control over the laws. Well, in a similar way, you know, there's a lot of ideas of, you know, what is going to be our kind of the position or what is going to be kind of the the activity that one is going to take to overturn things. And we don't always necessarily think about the design of social spaces as actually central to the kind of way that people interact and how that will change them to act in different ways. So I think that design is really, really important. So I think thinking that is really, really cool. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so thank you all for doing that. And I agree with Mandy. It definitely feels like a coffee shop. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really cool to hear that. Cause that, uh, kind of simulating that, that kind of space, that's like a third space that kind of, uh, encourages the development of, you know, rapport of networks of community um is what theory underground like from from the beginning it, it was like that idea in a coffee shop is a very common analogy that we always went back to like we want a coffee shop we want a coffee shop um it's it's cool that this space has at least approached that in some ways um Dude, E is here now too? Yeah. yeah. Oh man, good to see you. And Michelle had a tremendous time speaking with you yesterday. I'm Michelle's husband. Good to yeah, see no, you. Yeah, I know. That's pretty good. It was fun. I'm taking a class right now, but this is much better. <laughs> the class is fucking terrible. <laughs> Ian's undercover. He's like in the back. He's got his book up. He's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, he's, he's making No, it it's online, so I just have like my camera off nice, like i'm on yeah. a different zoom meeting but... <laughs> <laughs> nice nice that's hilarious that is absolutely outstanding um well nance i would be curious what has really come up alive for you today between the stream and the green room i'd be curious like to ask you what are some of the things that your mind has been orbiting uh today so for me it, or, no. um interestingly uh would I didn't expect this like there we always before we do an epic marathon stream we always design an arc at least like Dave and I have an arc in mind we have an idea of the meta conversation that's going to develop uh and that you know it's about uh the media critical media theory what are we doing the situation blah 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 and so there's always that but there is always also surprises that kind of emerge and and one surprise today was uh the the critarchy and you actually just mentioned it like uh rule by like governance by rules like like rules are just kind of there and it kind of is what it is and there's no human in the mix uh in the decision making process or whatever and that's come up multiple times uh in multiple contexts kind of you know stemming from different conversations and that takes me back to uh like a like a technocracy without any technocrats like like um the ship is steering itself right like it's uh we're we're being we're not even being ruled by the the judges we're being ruled by their decrees 
Um, and that's that's interesting, right? Like the the notion that uh, our society is on autopilot, and we're all kind of aware of it, but no n- no one really knows where the where the switch is to go back to manual manual control. Um, it's interesting. I, I I didn't didn't expect that to pop up, and um, the the tension between politics and philosophy is another one that's come up in in multiple conversations and i i think i i maintain the the doomer nihilist black pill position but i do so conscientiously i think um and earlier when when jreg came on like his whole shtick is this kind of performative nihilism um and and then Tony, we had a good, great conversation with Tony back here in the green room. I think mostly about that tension of philosophy and politics and like what can be done. And then for the last two hours, we were just talking with uh, Benjamin and Cadell about things that might be able to be done. Um, Benjamin talks about non-reformist reforms. And I love that he talks about it because I think that is the antidote to hopelessness. Um, everybody acts like it's always a zero-sum game. You, you, you either have the answer or you're doomed to failure. Um, but Benjamin is like, no, there, there are things that we can do right now in the real world that would improve the world in a way that would open up new possibilities to make the world better. And it becomes a positive feedback loop of improvement on improvement on improvement. And I love that idea. I think we need more of that. Yeah. No, I, I think that's brilliant. Um, I think, you know, many, I, and maybe we've spoken about this before, very often people will say, oh, is it Orwell or is it Huxley that decides, well, but it's really a Kafka novel. Um, it's really like the trial. And in Kafka, the key is that everyone, even the judiciary and the system, is under this kind of zeitgeist of control that no one can really locate. And Kafka, there's this castle that no one has ever, like, no one can get to. And yet everyone's lives are kind of organized around it. And there's something, it's um, the movie, there was a movie about Kafka that unfortunately I think conflated his vision with Orwell. But really what it more so is for Kafka, like with Joseph K, it is the very way that the human mind structures reality toward us that leads to our own oppression. That is a result of a feedback loop between ourselves as individual, the collective in the system, and eventually nobody has control. The thing has a kind of life of its own. And really one of the reasons why I do think thinking sociology and learning how to think sociologically is very important is because for me, when that field is done right, it is an orbiting of those kind of zeitgeists or fetishes or things that have a life of their own beyond the human being that then no one can say what exactly it is. Um, I think that's quite important. Um, You could also put, I like to think of um, Thomas Pitchin, who wrote The Crying Lot of 49, Gravity's Rainbow, as another example of the kind of zeitgeist that we were under. I want to read Gravity's Rainbow so bad. That book looks amazing, but it's fucking huge. It is huge. Um, I would say I really do like Harold Bloom's essay collection on Time is Pitchin that I would actually suggest reading before going in because it really helps situate it. It doesn't ruin it at all, but it gives you a good, especially there's also a section in his book on how to read and write on the crying of Lock 49. That really is a wonderful guide. Um, And I really do like the essay that Bloom wrote on the section in Gravity's Rainbow about Byron the Bulb, which I think is a beautiful example. And let's put it this way. Um, A way to think about Thomas Pitchin and Gravity's Rainbow is truly a masterpiece, is if we take the phrase, everything is connected, isn't that beautiful and romantic and lovely? Oh, it's also a recipe for paranoia and madness. Everything is connected. The very ontological condition where the whole world is connected together is, is it, there you go, is simultaneously <laughs> the language he uses is one and zero for like computer coding. It is simultaneously the ultimate romance that is inseparable from the state of the ultimate paranoia and madness. And there's a Kabbalistic streak in Thomas Pitchin and the way that the city is described for Odifia in the crying of Lot 49, and Odithia is based on it from Sophocles, you can see everything. 
the city is a circuit board is how it's described. Everyone is in this network, which means everything is connected. And the question is, is that a, does that mean we're all in love or does that mean we're all crazy? And basically the right reason I put it together with Kafka is because if we can't learn to control this thing that seems to control us, that nobody can control, then we're going to end up in madness, not being able to bring it into an everything is connected in a way that brings together social capital and different things. So it kind of poses the question. I really do like what Benjamin is saying. Um, for me, it's actually really important to be a doomer about the things you shouldn't waste your time on. There is actually a beneficial certain fatalism. The question is simply choosing what to be fatalistic about, right? Like choosing well those things and choosing the things that you can change that actually could make a difference. And like, so for me, just as an example, something I'm really hopeful for, I do think there would be ways to go about this is what if socially you generally had a replacement of the resume with the portfolio? Like right now, I think Theory Underground is one giant portfolio of people's capacity to think philosophy and teach, right? Screw the resume. Here's a portfolio. Portfolios are always superior to the resume. What would happen if you had a society that started accepting portfolios, YouTube channels, video content as qualifications, not merely resumes? The whole world changes instantaneously, right? Like the portfolio, like right now, one of the great problems is there's a monopoly on ways of being certified. You have to go to certain institutions, you have to know certain people, et cetera, so forth, right? Well, what if you, democ what if you democratized certification with a portfolio, right? Well, we have the technology to do it. We were also talking earlier about this being a new social coordination system to allow the democratization of the network effects, which have always been, historically speaking, what creates the greatest social change in different things over Randall Collins and so on and so forth. Used to be in order to get the network effects, you had to go to Princeton or universities. Well, now, lo and behold, I meet, I'm getting to meet with all of you fine people in Virginia who have just happened to, who have read some of the books that otherwise, the likelihood of me finding the people who have read the books or who are interested in the stuff like everyone in this conversation is in the random place I lived in, as opposed to, especially if I wasn't on a college campuses, was like zero. It was like freaking zero. Now I can coordinate the networking of people that share those interests in a very effective way. And it's also between um, dinner and putting the kids to bed when you have that little 20 minute gap. You know, before like you drive through a college or something, now because of the Zoom technology, your little 20 minute gaps that allows you to logistically connect instantaneously, which was not possible before, thus enabling network effects in a more effective way that basically until this technology, the only ones who could do that were the ones who had the time energy, who had the jobs, who happened to live in the geographical area where they know those people and who had the extra time. Well, now if you've got 20 minutes here, if you've got an hour there, you know, all of those things open up and I see it's closing in one minute. So that changes things. And then if you were to, in addition to that, democratize the certification structure to the portfolio from the resume, which this hooks up into, who knows what little things would do. And for me, what I'm not a doomer about are those little shifts, the change of the classroom from a trivia structure to an oral structure, the resume to the portfolio, ending the college monopoly on credentials. You know, you could keep going on these social coordination systems. Those things I think do offer opportunities. Um, and it's important to look at those things because otherwise you just get, you know, sad. Uh, and, you know, one does, uh, and, and then you just eat a lot of ice cream and you're unhealthy and it's not even ice cream night. You're just eating it all week. And then you just, you know, you're miserable. Yeah. And then your teeth fall out. No, I, I think they um, fall out. this has given us access to the, the, you know, the fecundity that does exist throughout our daily lives. Um, we just, we haven't had access to it because we're commuting uh, or we're geographically isolated um the these new technologies these new ways of using these technologies gives give us access to a fertility of our own mind our own spirit and that of our uh our fellow travelers that we that we were locked away from previously um yep. geographically economically ideologically even uh and it yeah dude it's it's amazing i love it i'm so excited about it i really genuinely am um and when i think this is going to close in a second, but we're, we're going to merge the rooms and we'll wind up in the room back with Dave. Um, but yeah, I just, I'm blown away. What we've, what we've done today um, went off so successfully, way more successfully than, than Dave and I thought 
before we actually did it. But we were like, well, there's only one way to find out and that's to do it. Yeah. So I love it. Do it or no ball. There we go. <laughs> well, <it's, laughs> put your money where your mouth is. Like I can yeah. sit around and I can be the miserable doomer, uh, you know, post-Marxist, you know, Oh, woe is me. The world is ending. Um, well, put up or shut up, dude. I don't want to be, I, I don't like that lazy, miserable, sad guy that I tend to be, you know, and I can't, I can't overcome him in isolation. I, I need social coordination. I need networks that will support my own growth. Um, and the fact that, that it happens in concert with the growth of others is, is amazing. It really is. Well, I mean, the other thing, not to jump, the other thing that's very important is you need to have the opportunity to learn how to socially interact. Like, I know that sounds basic, but, you know, Tony was talking about how democracy has always so far basically been a um, moderate, what was the term he used? It's a managed democracy, right? Well, yeah, democracy basically has to be managed if people can't get a freaking long or if people don't know how to talk with one another or if they're gonna tribalize, right? Like there's this notion, if you wanna have a democracy that isn't managed, then people have to be able to know how to interact. But here's the trick, this is what, and, and, and Studebaker was mentioning this last stream as well. If we're just interacting to go, so how's the weather? Small talk, kind of, well, that's not gonna do. It has to be an interaction about things that matter, right? Um, That's really hard. And, and if you don't regularly engage in this practice or see models of doing it, then when you have your meeting to talk about the new economy or political order, you're probably going to have a fight and your efforts are going to collapse. That's why all these like, you know, these different Marxist or communist or revolutionary or emancipatory movements, they tend to often fail because when you get the people together to form these new ways of interaction that isn't mediated by capital, well, if it's not mediated by capital, then it has to be face-to-face -face interaction. Well, if you suck at that and you're <laughs> angry, then it's going to fail and you're going to have to go back to some managing structure, right? You're going to have to go back to something to manage you. And that's what keeps happening. Well, one of the reasons too is because we haven't, um, and I had, I'll turn my camera off, like um, <laughs> is, is, uh, is one of the reasons that keeps happening is because if I read the instructions right, that keeps happening is because there isn't the infrastructure to train it to have the ability to learn it unless you just, you know, went to a college or something, right? Well, then who's those people? The elites, the ones who have accepted the zeitgeist and the paradigm. So then the only ones who are trained in, you could say, diplomacy or interacting with otherness or talking about, you know, moral differences or philosophies is an elite group of people who then tend to have benefits to keep the system going, right? Well, if you want to have an alternative to that, then you need to have the infrastructure for people to train those abilities. You know, you could put it like, if you know, like Alec, um, you know, more, what did uh, Hunter call it or McAllister, like um, conversations about first principles or having moral mm. discussions or being able to talk about first, I think they called it um, first principles, right? Um, a substantive democracy. That's what Hunter called it, right? Okay. If you want a substantive democracy, you're going to have to have people who know how to talk about the hardest things that matter the most to the, one another without killing one another. That is not natural. That is really hard. And where do you go to even learn those capacities? Um, well, you've gotta you gotta go to a place like this. Oh, so we're going, we're going. Oh boy. Let me uh do I turn my audio off? I can do that. I love you. <laughs> uh so I think when he close when while well, the room is gonna close in 40 seconds, I think we'll just be shunted back into the main room. Shunted. Um, oh, I love that word. Shunted. Yeah. Push, shove. Shunted. <laughs> like... uh, but I'm not sure, but I think that's the way it's going to work. Um, but oh, we should uh... all had instruments. I wish we'd all had instruments and just could go in like jamming Freebird or something like that. Maybe we actually should just go in in a dance party kind of thing. Like, yeah, that that might actually be the way. Um, but uh, but but yes, no, I definitely think like how many people are about to pop in here? There's Nance. We're not live right now, guys. We're not live. So okay, welcome. okay. Hey, Chris. <laughs> hey, Mikey.
Uh, How's it going? Dude, fantastic. I'm, I'm so pumped. Uh, it's been awesome. Daniel was in the, in the middle of making a symphony and it just cut him off. And then here we are, we show up in this room. Um, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. I gave uh, you guys lots of warnings. I don't know if you got them. Yeah, we did. We, we didn't care. We said, you know what? What were you guys okay. doing? <laughs> just having a, having a good conversation. Um, and then we started talking. Oh, wait, about, hold on. Hold on. Oh, okay. Hold on. We're about to, we're about to ask you that. Yeah. We're about okay. to ask you guys that question. For everybody real. take a sec. Everybody take a second. Take the link. If I tagged you on socials, like Chris, I did tag you, you know, go retweet it um, and say, Hey, we need a, a few more like uh, subscriptions. Just come subscribe to the channel to break 12,000. We're doing, cause I think we're like 30 away. We're like 30 subs away. So everyone go wow. share the link to this. Everyone go share the link. Tell tell your friends. Come even if even if people don't like theory, tell them oh, we don't care if you like theory or not. Just, just we don't do that here. Theory underground. We don't care. We don't yeah. care about what, what you like. It's not about that. It's about the numbers. It's only about the numbers. <laughs> um, just tell them that. Tell them that we sold out to the algorithm and it's okay. Uh, I'll share the link here in the chat. Um, and then we'll be okay. live in 20 seconds, it looks like. Nice Thanks in the chat for and uh we'll be oh we're back on right now three two one and all right that was dope um this video is about seven hours long um so the live stream yesterday was about 12 hours long um and we managed to have a a pretty dope um pretty you know cohesive pretty coherent conversation at least from my perspective i haven't watched this seven hour video back because i'm still creating it um this is the last piece that i'm about to upload damn uh or upload i'm about to add this to it and then uh and then render shouldn't take we'll see maybe i don't know 20 minutes. I don't know. I'm not doing anything. I'm not adding any graphics or anything. Um, yeah. You know, it's just a matter of uh, getting all the clips in here into one file. Then I'm going to upload that one file. And hopefully that also doesn't take super duper long. My internet does suck. Um... But I am expecting it it shouldn't take longer than 20 minutes or so to render with if even that long uh and then another half an hour or so to upload. So today is still uh whatever day I said it was when it when I began Thursday the 19th. Let me look. Yep, yep, Thursday the 19th. Um Thursday. Yep, that's right. Thursday the 19th cuz last Friday was Friday the 13th and we uh, watched that that movie, the 2009, I think, remake of Friday the 13th, Friday the 13th. And I didn't enjoy it. It sucked. And it's definitely, it sucked. Um, but yeah, so tomorrow's the 20th. So today's the 19th because it's Thursday still. Anyway, um, yeah, so probably like uh, I'll render, which won't take any time at all, hopefully. And I'll upload and that also hopefully won't take that long. So probably like, I'm expecting this to be uploaded to YouTube in like, you know, an hour. Um, so that'll be cool. And then I can get on to doing other things today. Uh, got other stuff to do. And I also think I'm, I'm going to post up. You know what I'm saying? Um, take a little nappy nap. Maybe I, I might play a video game. I might get crazy and play a video game. Probably won't. Um, you know, video games are cool and all, but they're just so time consuming. Here's what I'll do. I'll watch a video on YouTube. I'll watch a Baldur's Gate 3 video on YouTube instead of playing video games anymore. Cause I just don't have the time when I do find myself, um, having time and wanting to scratch that itch. I'll just watch, I'll just watch a video. Someone will play the game for me. It's weird like that 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 has become like a viable 
form of like labor maybe not viable but valid at least um and it is viable for you know there are streamers who make a living playing video games um but to think about it like that like you are playing this game for me so i don't actually have to do the work of playing the game um yeah just kind of, i guess thinking about it that way like as labor it's funny um but anyway everybody who watched this everybody who's here right now thank you guys all um if there's anyone who was part of the stream or part of the green room who's watching this thank you for joining thank you for being part of the conversation i had a fucking blast uh, i can't wait to do it again and uh and if for whatever reason there's like a random person who doesn't know what any of this is um but you're seeing this what the fuck are you doing dude how'd you get here thank you everybody we will see you on the next one peace out guys say i glass no it's kind of who you so we eat up your man who you can hurry you stop do you know we do your up a thou send me to your ma this is